mobile and smart speaker. This is Love Sport News. From the Sky News Centre at three, all 39 people found dead in a lorry container at an industrial estate in Essex are Chinese. The victims, 31 men and eight women, were discovered in greys early yesterday morning. Police have been given another 24 hours to question the 25-year-old driver on suspicion of murder. Local unionist councillor Paul Berry says the family in County Amar, where the man's family live, are in complete shock. The community's thoughts and prayers are with the 39 families of those who have tragically lost their lives. And the people of Laurel Vale and the surrounding area are obviously devastated. But they're also uh, stunned and shocked that someone local has been arrested. The government's not planning on holding any Brexit debate in Parliament next week, despite the UK currently scheduled to leave the EU on Thursday. Boris Johnson's meeting his cabinet now to discuss the deadlock while the EU ponders a further extension. A man's being charged with the murder and rape of 21-year-old Hull University student Libby Squire, 25-year-old Pavel Relevich, who's a Polish national, is due to appear in court next week. Britain's biggest remaining payday lender is on the verge of collapse. It's understood. Cash Euro Net UK, which trades under the quick quid brand, and could be put into administration within days. NHS England has struck a long-awaited deal to get life-saving cystic fibrosis drugs available. Around 5,000 people will now have full access to or can be. Campaigner Gemma Weir, whose daughter has the condition, expressed her delight on Twitter. We've done it! Oh, so, so happy! It's my dad's birthday. He sent us a present from up there, guys. Oh... Look at the state of me. I'm just, I don't even care. And Little Mix fans have expressed disappointment on social media after the band announced they're cancelling their upcoming tour of Australia and New Zealand. The group says they need to focus on making new music. One fan posted to say, I love you girls, but this is unfair. That's the latest. I'm Will Rowe. Love Sport Radio. On digital radio, online, mobile and smart speaker. This is the Posh Boys on Love Sport Drive. Good afternoon, it's the Posh Boys on Love Sport Drive. That's me, Johnny Burrow, Guy Watts and special guest David Prutton. Your top stories this afternoon. George Ford has been brought back into the England team for Saturday's Rugby World Cup semi-final against the All Blacks. He replaces Henry Slade in England's only change from the quarter-final win against Australia. And Manchester United fans are urging the club to sign Erling Haaland. But Ole Gunnar Solskjaer sounds keen on Harry Kane. And Conor McGregor is returning to MMA in January. He has suggested he's going to run through the rest of the competitors like a chainsaw through butter, which to me sounds like the definition of overkill. David Prutton, how the devil are you? I'm slightly damp. But, yeah, we're all very but damp. Other than that, uh, I'm really well. How are you? I'm very well, slightly damp, otherwise unharmed. <laughs> no one, of course, dampening Chelsea spirits last night. A really strong performance, helped partly be by VAR. Yes, but this that's what was, it's there for. That is what it's there mm -hmm. for. It got it right mm -hmm. when it ruled that Quincy Promise strike out. And actually, this was a very mature performance from a very young team. It was. It was uh, a performance that Frank Lampard was quite rightly very, very proud of, each and every one of his players, the combination of not only the players that started, but obviously uh, substitutes changing the game. Uh, and then that lovely togetherness when the final whistle does go and there's that sense of team spirit, regardless of who ended up on the pitch at the very, uh, the very last whistle, and the collective of, of what a, a wonderful um, result and performance and experience for a, a team which is growing seemingly week on week, both in the Premier League and abroad. Frank Lampard said that this was the performance in which those youngsters came of age. Do you think that's right? It's a nice sentiment. It would only be backed up if they managed to carry on in this vein in Europe, if they managed to make sure that um, Premier League performances and results keep going their way. But you can tell he's really enjoying it. And why wouldn't he enjoy it? He's a, he's a complete legend at uh, Chelsea. He's, he's leading a group of players that quite obviously respect uh, idolise, follow in his, or want to follow in his footsteps. And I think we've spoken before on here about it being that wonderful 
kind of um, synchronicity, if you like, of of the the overall situation that they found themselves in. As we said, no transfer ban. Perhaps you've got a different manager. Perhaps you've got a different manager that's got money to spend that brings other European players in, which means again all these youngsters get found out to different clubs. But it, it seems to uh, have worked really well and in their favour. And at this moment in time, and again, I'm perhaps paraphrasing, I think, something that Gary Neville used a f- maybe a couple of months ago, a few weeks back, about them being a likeable club. Mm. not saying I ever disliked Chelsea. I thought the, the way they went about it, the swagger that Jose brought, I thought really endeared them to a certain bracket of people. But what Frank's got with the younger players that he's brought into the side and knows is that familial feel that really does reach out to every single football supporter. I'm really interested in this point as Chelsea is a likeable club because I'll be honest, I actively disliked Chelsea. (laughs) I really didn't like Chelsea Mm. under Jose. I didn't like it when Abramovich came in. Mm -hmm. I didn't like the way they played football. Didn't like anything about them. And I love this Chelsea Mm -hmm. team. I really, really do. Let's hear from manager Frank Lampard on the significance of the win last night. We're entitled to be excited tonight about how we played. And it's a bit of a blueprint for us. You know, in terms of, I say, we... The work of the midfield players was outstanding. The work of the wingers is outstanding. The work of the fullbacks getting out to people, top, top players, and stopping them making passes and easy decisions was absolutely outstanding. I could go through them all. I tell you what's refreshing about that. We look at games, we, we always say don't get carried away. We always say make sure that um, these teams looking towards the next fixture. But I think Frank Lampard's absolutely right in that instance. We enjoy it right now and it's the enjoyment quite obviously is different to what it was 15 years ago it's not right lads let, let's get ourselves out in Amsterdam and have a proper good knees up and then get <laughs> on the next day it's it's about collectively feeling the moment enjoying the moment taking the good bits out of it working on things that could be improved on but understanding that hard work is done for instances and situations such as that you enjoy it you go to the way and you hug each other you embrace everything that's to do with it and then you get back to work and for me that is what is so good about Frank Lampard. It seems like he's a really intelligent man manager because Mm. he does praise his players when they deserve it. But he always says, particularly when he's talking about those youngsters, he needs to keep working hard. There's lots more for him to do. And he did that last night. It's six wins in a row now for Mm. Chelsea in all competitions. But Lampard was still urging his players not to get carried away. I said to the players before the game, five wins in a row is really dangerous. It's really dangerous because it can make you sloppy, it can make you switch off and think everything's fine. Six wins is even more dangerous. So that's the message of Burnley. Former Arsenal and England defender Matt Upson said a similar thing about Frank Lampard's man management style. Frank Lampard, for me, is getting far more out of this group of players than than, than what Mauricio Sarri did. And also that the young players coming into this group, it, it invigorates the rest of the team. It challenges all the other players that might be resting a little bit back on their success or more experience. It actually ha- forces them to raise their game. And Chelsea look like that group of players at the moment. That's Matthew Upson speaking on BT Sport last night. I understand the sentiment there, but I think you've also got to... Each manager takes care or, or care takes of, uh, around Chelsea in their own way, don't they? Conte went in, they were happy with him that they managed to win something, that then they were exhausted. That constant turnover of managers. Mauricio Sarri came into a position where lauded in Italy, came over to here, he, he managed to walk away with a trophy, with his head held high, with a lot of speculation about his future. Um, question marks perhaps about the way that he managed certain players, about the way that they responded to his methods, i.e. Uh, lots of meetings, lots of structural, tactical stuff. I mean, God forbid a footballer has to actually walk through tactical stuff in the lead-up to a game. That must be so excruciatingly boring for them. It's part of the professional side of being a footballer. So they're saying that Frank Lampard was always going to bring something different because of the dynamism of the man, because of the experience and the history and the tradition that he knows of Chelsea. But Sarri, he, he, they made min- mincemeat of Arsenal in the Europa League final. Yeah, And the, the look on his face as he beamed down at the, at the medal that he had around his neck was, a lo- was, was a, such a lovely moment because top-level managerial uh, positions, um, it's ruthless up there. And he managed to move on with little fuss um, and then kind of open the doors to Frank to come in and, and be able to facilitate these young players doing so well. And I, I, I absolutely understand what Matt's saying, uh, and I agree with it to a certain extent, but you've got to look at the situation, the surroundings of, of a manager being in, a, in charge of a certain club in a certain period of time, which sometimes sets it up for the next manager to come through the door. 
I think that's a really good point, and I'm with you absolutely that Sarri was criminally underrated, underloved by Chelsea and the Chelsea fans. But one phrase you use there is a manager at a specific point in time. Mm. Now, that is both about who the manager was before, Mm -hmm. but also about the context in which the club finds itself. Absolutely. And even though Sarri, for my money, was great last season, genuinely really good, he would not be able to do what Lampard is doing right now. For me, Frank Lampard so far this season has done the, within reason, the best conceivable job anyone could have done with this Chelsea team. It's because he gets it. It's because he's got Jody Morris there and he knows how to get the best out of young English players. But it does because of these specific young English players. Jody's known her for a very, very long time, been mm. very successful with the, the junior teams uh, within the Chelsea setup. Frank had, obviously, Mason Mount and Tamori with him at Derby last season, so knew what they were capable of in real time in English football. Yes, the Premier League's a step up from the Championship, but knowing the club inside and out... And it, I mean, it, it's such a hypothetical conversation. If Frank Lampard was a young manager that had nothing to do with Chelsea, would we be expecting the same results that he's got so far? Would he have the same um, breadth of patience and depth of, of respect from the Chelsea um faithful to, to know that yes let's stick with Frank Frank's in a tricky situation with regards to the financial side of the football club but he's got these players at his disposal let's see what he can do with them I don't think if if, if it's someone else other than Frank Lampard if it's Steven Gerrard if it's a, another player of that ilk that didn't play for Chelsea I think it would be a slightly different framework that he's working under but again that's a hypothetical debate but right here right now what he's getting out of these players is phenomenal I think you're right on everything there, frankly. And one of the words he used when he was talking about that performance last night was blueprint, which, you know, is a word talking about plans. It's kind of architecture, building forward, building something that takes time. Is he going to be able to convince that club to stick with these youngsters, even when they are able to go out and start buying stars again? Well, out of all the managers that would take charge, you get the feeling that, he would be the one of the only it'd be in a select few that could sit there and talk about building as we said Conte was always going to be two three seasons max Sarri was always going to be two three seasons max I mean and they end up being less than that so the lifespan of a modern manager especially a foreign modern manager Pep's been here a fairly long time Klopp's been here what five years is it now four years um but other than that there's a there's a tradition there's a tendency to have three years going hell for leather then moving on I mean within three years I think in football yes you can build foundations yes you can set a blueprint but I think nights like last night uh, serve to facilitate what Frank wants to do it's nice when everything in the garden's rosy and you're talking about blueprints the minute results don't start going your way and everyone's talking about the future as Jose said at the weekend I'd love to have a job like Ollie's got talking always about the future project. so catty Very, well, so of course it was catty. but did you expect anything else <laughs> no I didn't of course you didn't when we're talking about the future when we're talking about wonder kids it's not just Chelsea youngsters lighting up the Champions League Erling Haaland the 19 year old Red Bull Salzburg striker leads the scoring points the charts at the halfway point in the group stage Manchester United fans are starting to take a shine to him they've certainly taken notice they're liking the idea of some Norwegian synergy with Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. They've worked together at Mulder. Erling Haaland was actually born in Leeds, whisper it. <laughs> Could you see him at Manchester United? The efficiency and the proficiency of what we've seen from him in front of goal is, is admirable when you talk about what a young player can produce, when you talk about the possibilities of him playing for a big uh, sizeable uh, European outlet as we say, Manchester United would be. That's a completely different challenge. I think if he's got a working relationship with Ole, that's that's a step in the right direction. Uh, Grand pronouncements early on about players or managers signing contracts from people involved in Manchester United. That, in recent weeks, (laughs) hasn't borne out too well, has it? So I wouldn't go uh, uh, steaming straight in for him, but they they are still bereft of strikers up front. They still need strength and depth. Is he the man, uh, the player that they're crying out for? They want a big. Yes, they're they're, they're looking at a, a young, new kid on the block, such as, as as Haaland in this instance. But they want a big, swaggering name of a striker to come in and lead the line, don't they? Surely. 
Ibrahimovic is, of course, available if they want swagger. On the Haaland front, he's clearly very good already. Yes. He is scoring goals yes. in volume. He's scoring different kinds of goals and he's scoring them with confidence and aplomb. But he is 19. And you, I know, were heavily involved with the England under 21s yes. when you were breaking Long through. Time ago, yeah. There are players who are brilliant at 18, 19, <laughs> and that is a taste of things to come. Mm. And they go on and become Neymar or Messi mm. or whoever. There are others who have developed a bit early and are as good as they're going to be, roughly, as teenagers. Is there a worry if you go and spend 40 million quid on Erling Haaland that actually you've signed a quite good striker who doesn't have potential necessarily. But that's always the gamble with any form of transfer. We, we could have... We've spoken in the past, Johnny, about Deli Alley. It's, 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 it's a slightly different comparison, but if you're looking at a player that's floundering at this moment in time but really peaked, uh, or appeared to have an early peak and he's got to get back to that, if Haaland falls into that category, then, like you say, £40 million pounds is a gamble that doesn't necessarily pay off. What I always found with Scandinavian players coming into English football, and this is uh, ha having had the benefit of, of playing with several of them over the course of my career, they settled really well in England. There's a lot of similarities between um, how they would approach their uh, football and profession as, as the kind of natives do, uh, and understood daft little things like the weather, the, the sense of humour, the, 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 the fact that having been born in Leeds, you'll know exactly what 10 months of the year is like playing in English football, it's windy, wet. <laughs> it's You're sludgy. saying that with a glint in your <laughs> but eyes, that, David. That's, that's the thing that we, we all knew and love about playing football in this country. So from that point of view, you, you think uh, the peripheral stuff, after that it's about whether he can get on the on the training pitch with a, a manager such as Ollie, who could teach him even more than he has done already. But it's one. it would be one hell of a step up. It certainly would. Well, talking of steps up, England are in a first Rugby World Cup semi-final for over a decade. There's a couple of big calls from Eddie Jones for that semi-final against New Zealand on Saturday morning. We're going to have reaction to his team selection and some breaking news about a Wales player's fitness next. This is Love Sport. You alright, mate? Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah? Mm, really? It's just, there's a massive grizzly bear sitting on you. You sure you're okay? Well, now that you mention it, Sometimes we say we're fine when we're not, but with one in four experiencing a mental health problem, if your mate says he's fine, he might not be. Being your mate's gone ask twice. Time to change. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> Let's face it. When your kids are ill, you do anything to help them feel better. But remember, antibiotics aren't always needed. You might not realise it, but taking antibiotics when you don't need them puts you and your family at risk of a longer and more severe illness. Help keep your family well. Always take your doctor's advice on antibiotics. Search NHS Antibiotics. <laughs> All better. Full of skill. Full of flair. Full of desire. Fulham FC is full of fire. Oh, what a goal! Be there at Craven Cottage as Fulham continue their search towards the top of the Skybet Championship. Watch the unmissable action live in SW6, home of London's original football club. Absolutely brilliant. Grab your tickets now at FulhamFC.com. Get ready for Brexit on the 31st of October. Brexit will bring changes that affect businesses in many ways particularly if you buy from EU suppliers, sell to EU customers, provide services to EU clients, and receive customer data from other businesses in the EU. Businesses need to prepare. Find out how at gov.uk slash Brexit. Get ready for Brexit on the 31st of October. I like Putin. He gets me. I like Trump. I've got him. Love sports. Sweet love, sweet chariot. Coming for to carry me on, sweet love. The pace and intensity of the game get you, and I think if you've experienced that before, you understand what you've got to prepare yourself for. And you know, most of our squad have been involved in those games, so they've got great experience. They know what the New Zealand's going to bring to the game. 
Eddie Jones really is a world-class wind-up merchant. David Prutton, can I tell you a secret? You can't, just between me and you. Just between okay, you and me and yes. everyone listening yeah. to us talking into our microphones. It's coming home. <laughs> I've been keeping that very quiet it's for a long on. time. But I'm getting close to genuinely believing we've got a World Cup winning side on our hands, Guy. Do the Welsh. There's a bit of bad news for them. There is. Just quickly, you reminded me of Kevin Keegan there with the I've kept really quiet. But I'll tell you something. <laughs> I will love it. I will love it if we beat them. Love it. No, I, I'm, oh, I'm so excited. Yeah, there is. And uh, a bit of bad news for Wales. That makes me even more excited. Oh, no, sorry. I'm impartial. Wales full about Liam Williams, of course, one of their best players really is doubtful for that semi-final against South Africa on Sunday morning after injuring an ankle in training. Of course, Wales haven't named their team yet. They've got an extra 24 hours to do so naming theirs tomorrow morning. South Africa have gone early though and named theirs and there is an interesting call in that too. Cheslin Colby the really, really exciting winger, the guy that's been compared to Jason Robinson by the Wales defence coach Sean Edwards is missing out. He's got an injury so it means he won't make the uh, semi-final which is a bit of a shame for the neutral, certainly a bonus for Wales but if Liam Williams were to miss out that would be kind of offset I think but yeah we'll start I guess with England with Eddie Jones and the calls he's made he was talking a little bit about it there as we heard he's gone for George Ford at number 10 as you mentioned at the top of the show Johnny and I think you know by the time we'd had a chance to wake up and read what the newspapers and the reporters out there were saying it wasn't a big surprise but I think if you told people a couple of days ago that George Ford was going to start I think it would have come as a little bit of a surprise remember he didn't start in the quarterfinal and we were outstanding you know make no mistake with a few exceptions of a few passages of play against what is still one of the top five or six rugby teams in the world, we were really, really impressive. And I'm a big George Ford fan, but I wouldn't have complained had he not been picked for this game. I think it's an interesting call, though, and I'm quite pleased to see that Eddie Jones has gone back to it because it clearly means he's got a slightly different plan for this game. There was a, that's, I think that's the key part about what you just said there, guys. There's a great article in one of the papers today about almost Eddie Jones upsetting what the uh, the kind of common approach to a World Cup is grinding out your best 15 making sure they stay fit, making sure they stay together then getting them through the tournament mm. he seems to be quite happy with literally horses for courses which doesn't make sense but in the sense of this game requires this bunch of people yeah. this game requires that bunch of people and everyone it seemed, in football they'd be kicking and screaming saying oh I want to be playing every game but because of that team ethos it seems they're quite happy to know that if they're part of a collective that gets to the World Cup final, then that reflects well on the squad as a whole, doesn't it? 100%. And you remember his comments before and after the quarterfinal when it was put to him that he dropped George Ford. I didn't drop him, mate. I've changed his role. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's he changed his new yeah. role is on the, the pitch. pitch. <laughs> exactly, not in the starting 15. That, Eddie, to you, me, and well, certainly to me and the rest of the world, is dropping, but mm. not to Eddie Jones. And I think the point is he genuinely believe that mm. and therefore he at least had a very good chance of convincing George Ford and anyone else he was doing that to of the same thing worth noting that is the only change by the way a lot of people expected George Cruz to come in in the second row for Courtney Laws I'm a bit torn on this one because I, I think like everyone feels that Courtney Laws brings so much more in the loose he's a better tackler he's a better carrier than George Cruz but George Cruz is one of the very best line out operators in the world and I think we've been reminded with New Zealand selection that that's going to be a key area of this game they've brought in Scott Barrett of course brother of Bowden and Geordie who are both also in the match day 23 proud parents I imagine they'll be on Saturday morning uh, or Saturday evening I suppose Tokyo time you imagine they've probably made the effort to go to Japan for that one mm. if all three of their kids are involved be a nice touch wouldn't it yeah <laughs> doing anything It'd else. It'd be quite cool if they didn't. <laughs> All three of the kids yeah. playing, now we've got a barbecue. We've yeah. got the New Sorry, Zealand Lance. X Factor final or something <laughs> like that. No, I'm sure they're probably there, but they've gone with Scott Barrett, who's never started a test match in the back row, in the back row, and it's an interesting call. It tells me, and it tells all of us, that they're going to make a big deal out of the line-out, which they used so successfully against us uh, in the Autumn International last year, where they edged us out by a single point. And I think they are going to give up something in the loose. You know, Sam Kane is, at his best, a top-class flanker, an expert operator over the ball at the breakdown. And with Tom Curry and Sam Underhill playing so well, I think for a very rare occasion, New Zealand might find that uh, they're actually kind of coming second in the contest at the breakdown which would be unusual for them and it'll be a big big challenge for them to see whether they can overcome that I'm not saying that they haven't got other good breakdown operators there but for such a key area of the game I think it's a big call it's a bold call from Steve Hansen but as a guy who's won so many test matches New Zealand coach I don't think we can really question him but it'll be interesting to see how that one plays out but yeah the week's been dominated really hasn't it by Eddie Jones in his mind games and we were yeah I mentioned the Kevin Keegan sort of 
uh, breakdown, if you like, a moment ago. But that's the sort of thing we were talking about yesterday. The Sir Alex Ferguson of rugby, some have called Eddie Jones. And he did manage to induce those sort of meltdowns. Not so much with Steve Hansen and Eddie Jones, but you feel like he's probably got under his skin a little bit. I think he will have done. He's been trying every single trick in the book. He said, they're under pressure, but we can win. Everyone expects them to do it but we can do it. He's got his team training in Disneyland, which I think has to be a wind-up <laughs> in and of itself. He's just messing with them at this point, and I absolutely love to see it. It's good to see. I mean, from the point of view of we're used to, and again, it's um, it's it's when you talk about rugby union, you talk about football, and the, you're naturally drawn to a comparison between the two. The statesman-like political uh, approach of Gareth Southgate, batting mm-hmm. questions off, straight batting things as they yeah. come... Uh, very inherently English, very inherently British. This is how we deal with it. Eddie Jones just sat there. Here's a little bomb for you. Here's yeah. another one. Right, I think my work's done, lads. We'll see you at the game. Which, I, I've, from our point of view, of being sometimes feeling a, a tad downtrodden at times when it comes to national sport. <laughs> I think it's great that he's just gone. This is what I think, and this is how I'm going to approach it. Isn't it unusual to see the coaches of the nation's two foremost team sports so different? Mm. And yet, I think certainly latterly now with Eddie Jones. I think doing a really good job. I think we could lose to New Zealand on Saturday and he could still, you know, remain in the role with credit, leave the role with credit, depending on exactly the nature of the defeat. What but would you want him to do if, if it was I, that one? I would probably want him to stay on, okay. to be honest, because I don't know who is out there that is a better coach at international rugby level. And there's a reason we went and got him after the debacle four years ago. And there's a reason we pay him more than any other international rugby coach. And yes, a defeat to New Zealand would be really disappointing, but I don't think it would be disastrous. Mm. It would be nothing like what we had four years ago, nothing like eight years ago even. So I would say stick with him. But look, that's a hypothetical. Let's cross that bridge Mm. when we come to it. And what I was going to say was we've got two such contrasting, we could not have a bigger contrast Mm. between Gareth Southgate and Eddie Jones. And yet I feel like we love them both in different ways. And it's really nice. I would quite like to see more of the Jones from Southgate though, because (laughs) I don't think the two are mutually exclusive. I love that Gareth Southgate is clearly just a delightful man. Mm. And I love how polite and mild-mannered he is and that the most annoyed he ever seems to get is twiddling with the top button on his waistcoat. Mm. But if we find ourselves in a World Cup semi-final again under him, I would not have a problem with him going through the gears frankly because i don't think that makes you a bad person i don't think it does it's part of the job isn't and, it and the, and the thing now th- what would always get leveled at in a footballing sense of anyone showing any kind of levity or, or or any or any kind of i'm not saying eddie jones has been light-hearted when he talks like this but if it looks slightly mischievous mm. it's almost always oh, not taking it seriously Lowering enough. the tone a little exactly bit, yeah. like come on we're better than that we need this is the most important thing right now after brexit that we need to talk about and it's this it's that but uh, be, Eddie, yes, a master tactician. Yes, uh, the drive and, and the desire to be a winner at the highest level of, of of rugby, but understands the mental side of it. Which and you push buttons in different ways. Mm. You can go. You can be aggressive. You can be passive aggressive. You can be dismissive, or you can kind of drop stuff like this in. Which I think it's tougher for the opposite number to, to maintain that cool, calm exterior because. You can think that you can sense that there's part of him wanting to go back at him. And everyone watching, whether they're in the media because they want to write the story, or if you're just a fan mm. and a neutral observing it, you want to see it because it's good drama. Absolutely. And remember, Eddie Jones and Steve Hansen know each other really well. There's mm-hmm. a lot of mutual respect there. Make no mistake, this is not, you know, turning into a sort of Eddie Jones versus Michael Checker, who I'm not sure are as quite good friends as, as they were a few years ago when they were teammates for Randwick together. This is, I think, a, a relationship of mutual respect. So if anyone knows how to push Steve Hansen's buttons, it is Eddie Jones. But it'll be interesting to see whether it's had any effect come Saturday. Would, would, there, would there be a chance where, I mean, are, are they close enough to think that, yes, he's read it in, in the in the press and, and he's done it in his in his press conference and he's got out and he's got his phone out and he's texted, he's going, come on, mate, are you, come on. <laughs> uh, like, uh, uh, what's happening, him saying, Steve, you, you're winding me up now, Steve Hansen said that they have been texting. <laughs> and well, he, that's, well, in that case, he would have definitely alluded to that in those texts. And don't forget the spying thing. Absolutely. As well. yeah. he, he made no reference. He said, ah, someone's been filming our training. He didn't say it was the, he didn't say it was New Zealand, but it makes everyone go, oh, he thinks they're filming their training oh my god New Zealand having to resort to that he didn't have to say that at all all he's done is literally sort of dropped it in there walked away and seen it all blow up back pages and yesterday that, and look how it's dealt with in the rugby world I mean in um, football that was the cardinal sin wasn't it mm. it was throw them out of English football yeah, yeah, it was yeah. a disgrace to our traditions and our history and our heritage he kind of shrugged his shoulders and just went yeah well someone's oh, I'm not too worried <laughs> about it um, 
lastly, we mentioned Wales a few moments ago. It is a massive game for them too, and we will be discussing that Huge, later in yeah. the show because yeah, I think that's a really interesting game. I don't think on pa- on paper it doesn't match up to be as I think uh, good to watch a game. I think it'll be more a clash of sort of a couple of powerful teams than teams of the skill level, if you like, of England and uh, New Zealand. But maybe that's a little bit harsh. But either way, it's going to get the people of Wales. Going to bring Wales to a standstill. We don't know anyone who's going to be in Wales on <laughs> Sunday, do we? We don't know anyone who's going to be around really a lot of. I was thinking about that. Sports fans. <laughs> <laughs> is there anyone who's going to be in Wales at around lunchtime on a Sunday where what you've got is a World Cup semi-final in the morning, mm. so we're going to have a few sports fans in the pub. That's the only big sporting event, though, in Wales that day, well, no? You'd say that. That would be the normal expectation. It turns out, and I didn't <laughs> know this guy, it turns out there's actually the biggest game in Welsh football kicking off at 12 o'clock. So you're going to have everyone streaming out of the pubs to go and watch Cardiff versus Swansea. Oh, I thought you meant Liverpool Wrexham. <laughs> and uh, I cannot imagine what that's going to be like. David, you it's got any gonna idea? It's going to be absolutely bonkers. So we'll be sat ready to go <laughs> at half past 11, kickoffs at 12 in Swansea. And you're going to be there, I yeah, believe. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think we've we've taken the executive decision to come away from standing by the pitch. Good call. To maybe a bunker somewhere in the valleys <laughs> and do it remotely from there. But yeah, bulletproof glass cage I or mean, something. Even without the actual game going on in the morning, uh, it was still going to be pretty feisty. I, I'm, I'm always uh, whatever time a football match kicks off I'm always um, intrigued at how there can still be a section of the crowd that can actually yep. that can turn up absolutely leathered no matter I mean if you had a game at 9 o'clock on a Sunday morning uh, a football <laughs> they match it. they'd still manage to come in and, and be like that but the, the the kind of slingshot effect of Welsh rugby fans watching that I mean God forbid they actually win. <laughs> <laughs> could be worse could if they lose. Yeah, yeah, I think it'd be worse if, if they lose. Very, yeah, they'll still be battered and they'll be in a terrible... <laughs> well, they will be and they'll be in a terrible mood. And some regional rugby rivalries could come into it as well. You know, the hardcore oh, rugby fans will say, he's an Ospreys fan or he's a Scarlet's fan or whatever it might be. It could be completely away from the football. I mean, all these factions could break up. We're thinking, well, hang on. Does Cardiff fans not happy with each other? The Swansea just, fans you, just you be nice to bizarre, everyone, yes. David. Smile Hopefully a lot. Hopefully football would be the real winner. <laughs> or Wales the real winner. You so. could just imagine the broadcasters, the schedulers, patting themselves on the back. <laughs> right, we can get it at midday. Brilliant. Should be minimal problems. I can't remember, for example, last time Celtic Rangers kicked off late in the midday. Yes. This should be absolutely... Oh, for goodness yeah. sake. They're Wales doing really well. So far. They won't get through. Oh, no, they've got through. <laughs> How, what's the time difference in Japan? Oh, it finishes half an hour before <laughs> this game starts. Oh, all, for God's sake. All credit to them because they do an unbelievable job, but there is no money on earth you could pay me to be a Welsh police officer this weekend (laughs) there is genuinely nothing you could offer me on that point of some people in the stadium always finding a way to be drunk even if there's an early kickoff I was speaking to a member of the Love Sport team earlier who shall remain nameless it wasn't Guy uh, who said he doesn't look the kind no No. well who who said and I quote I think Saturday is going to be one of the drunkest I've ever been I said oh why are you going to start drinking at nine o'clock i.e. when the semi-final kicks off no 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 I'm going to start not drinking it's 705 when my train leaves Paddington. So where there's a will, there's a way. This is Love Sport. You alright, mate? Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah? Mm, really? It's just there's a massive grizzly bear sitting on you. You sure you're okay? Well, now that you mention it, sometimes we say we're fine when we're not. But with one in four experiencing a mental health problem, if your mate says he's fine, he might not be. Be in your mate's corner and ask twice. Time to change. It's cancer, they said. My first thought, let's just say it wasn't money, but time off work for treatment and trips to the hospital, paying the rent and, and, and. The cost of living doesn't go away just because you're living with cancer, and Macmillan can help with that too. My advice? Take their advice, soon as I did. Macmillan, right there with you. Call 0808 808 0000 now. Are you paying way too much for your energy bills? A spokesman said could help you save big money. With electricity costs continuing to rise, you could save hundreds of pounds by shopping around. Just go to a spokesmansaid.com and look for the very best value energy deal on the market. Don't waste your hard-earned cash. You could be on a much cheaper deal. Go to a spokesmansaid.com. Fighting for you, saving you money. Get ready for Brexit on the 31st of October. This means that travelling to the EU will change. You'll need to check online if your passport is valid for travel to Europe. If you're planning on driving, you'll need to check if you have the right documents to drive. 
and make sure your travel insurance covers all your healthcare needs. To keep your trip on track, check what you need to do at gov.uk slash Brexit. Get ready for Brexit on the 31st of October. I love sports. It's the holy grail for all football fans, David. You get to see your team playing in Europe's premier competition, the Champions League. When the fixtures come out months in advance, you plan every detail incredibly carefully. You go, right, we'll fly from there to there. At this time, we're going to stay in that hotel, a short walk to the stadium. We can go to that pub, that pub and that pub on the way. We can grab a burger there. It is a military operation that requires a detailed dossier to get over the line. It is worth checking, though, that you've um, <laughs> flown to the right city, which is advice that would have been quite helpful for two Liverpool fans who attempted to attend their side's win over Genk last night, but instead travelled to another Belgian city, Ghent. They realised <laughs> they were in the wrong one half an wow. hour before kickoff. You think at the point where it's. 45 minutes before kickoff and you are walking around this city it's and there dead. are no other <laughs> Liverpool fans and you've got Belgians looking at you like are you in the right place would you not question it I think at some stage you would you would be looking at your mate um, because as we know they travel en masse in full voice in mm. great volume it reminds me of um, I think it was in the early stages of when Roman Abram- Abramovich took over at Chelsea and relatives had, had flown over and there were uh, they were either asking the driver to take them to Stamford Bridge or programmed it into the car to take them to Stamford Bridge, which took them to Stamford Bridge in Yorkshire. <laughs> so a couple of hundred miles up the road. This this is not West London, is it? And suddenly it's hit a completely different place. But I love the um, uh, the what they've been offered <laughs> to make up for it, yeah. which doesn't make any sense at all. No, but this is quality, <laughs> right? So they're there and they're heartbroken. They've missed the Liverpool game. They realised with half an hour till kickoff, it's a two-hour drive. It's a two-hour train. It wasn't happening. So they're there in Belgium. They've wasted the holiday. Well, Belgian league rivals of Ghent, KAA Ghent, have tweeted, if anybody knows these two Liverpool fans or has their contact details, tell them they're invited for our game against VFL Wolfsburg tonight. We'll give them some lessons on Belgian geography <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> Do you reckon they'll go? I think, well, it's a freebie out for now. Uh, they'll, if, if, it's, if it's gratis, I think they would be. It's a nice cultural exchange, isn't it? They'll, they'll remember the, the time that they went to um, Ghent twice. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> just... <laughs> fabulously stupid and the thing that is baffling about this is if you've done it it would be very easy to not end up in every paper in the country you know what i mean you could stay very very quiet this was rob from london and lee from leicester and what i love most is they've taken a photo the sort of classic angry man in local newspaper yes as if they have been in some way wrong yeah, pointing at some damp in a hotel yeah you you exactly <laughs> you haven't been wronged lads you uh, you're can't just, you're just wrong <laughs> yeah, I, I have no sympathy if either of these guys are listening by the way or if you know them give What's us a Ghent ring like? <laughs> yeah yeah if you are currently in ghent <laughs> tuning into love sport drive that number 0208 70 20 558 we would love to hear from you and even if you're not in Ghent have you ever got the destination wrong when you were going to a football match let us know I've never got it wrong when I was going to a football match but I remember very clearly when I was about 12 years old we mm. just moved house and I'd been staying at my granny's and bless her she was going to drive me and my brother back to my parents new place for the first time mm. for context she was driving from Surrey to Oxford that's quite straightforward mm. we ended up in Swansea wow that's and you just think you have to go such a long way towards Wales. There's an element of thinking that this this is t- taking such a longer time than it necessarily would. Uh, when when uh, having the pleasure of, of travelling to football grounds up and down in the country when we're working with them, there, there is always that split second. You know, that, almost you, when you get that little jolt, as in you think you've you've remembered something, where you kind of go. I am going to the right ground here, aren't I? Am I going to turn up thinking that we're going to um, cover a game from this particular so ground? So you never got it wrong? Never, no. Touch word, no. But the, the, but you always kind of preempt thinking, well, what would happen if I got it completely wrong, if I was stood in the wrong place? I mean, obviously, the world wouldn't stop turning. A lot of people would probably be quite happy on the crew going, thank God he's not here today, which is <laughs> oh, great. I don't believe but that. But there, there is always that split second where you go, what if I turn up at an empty stadium? And then you then you obviously recheck the 27 emails that you get in the, in the interim. But it's, it's always there in the back of your mind. It's the worst nightmare, isn't it? I have it if I do a really early show. I will always wake up at one in the morning. 
in a cold sweat thinking I've missed my alarm. No, you haven't. You don't need to get up for another four hours. You're just terrified of missing it. Of course, Rob from London and Lee from Leicester did miss the Liverpool game last night. And what a game they missed. Liverpool, before this, had only won one of their last 10 Champions League group games that were away from home. They seemed to put that ghost to rest somewhat. They did. It's strange that we're looking at that type of record with the current reigning Champions League winners. Um, uh, I mean, the way that they did it was very classy. Uh, fantastic goal by the Orcs, wasn't it? Um, and I think uh, when we're looking at, we we kind of pat Chelsea on the back, this young team coming in of age, as Frank Lampard put it. It's a different expectation level now from Jurgen Klopp and, and the players that he's got. Doing really well in the Premier League, obviously just dropped points for the first time against Manchester United. And the expectation levels there, I'm not saying that that's something that they can't handle. I think it's something that Jurgen Klopp actively worked himself into a position where it fits his billing as a superstar manager. This is when his team really does start delivering for him after winning that first trophy. So I th- from from their point of view, it's, um, it's nice to come away with that as they make sure that the addressing of their away form in that particular tournament is, is seen to. But I mean, if they do falter away from home and they end up with it back in the trophy cabinet in May then I mean who are we to argue with his approach well quite and great to see Alex Oxlade Chamberlain back Mm. in the side with two lovely goals as well it wasn't a complete performance but it was a very very Mm. good one if he is at his best can he start regularly for Liverpool because it feels to me that if he can he offers England something different he does I mean there's a real muscular presence to the Ox You've got to feel for him for missing so much football, especially when Liverpool have really been in the ascendancy. They've been mm. absolutely fantastic. So it's tough enough if your team's bang average and you're sat out not being involved in it. When when the team's scaling unbelievable heights and you've got to sit back and watch that happen, then I think it's a testament to his professionalism, his approach to his game. The, that carrot of being part of this squad, of this team, getting him back to full fitness. I think he's, he's taken up that challenge extremely well. And I think, yeah, I, I think for Liverpool and for England, he offers something slightly different to what is actually out there at this moment in time. I think he does indeed. We're going to have more on the Ox, more on Liverpool throughout the show. Coming up, we're going to be having a chat with English football's ultimate journeyman, and he's got quite a story to tell us. His name's Jamie Curitan. Love Sport Radio, the station giving fans a voice. Get ready for Brexit on the 31st of October. Brexit will bring changes that affect businesses in many ways, particularly if you buy from EU suppliers, sell to EU customers, provide services to EU clients, and receive customer data from other businesses in the EU. Businesses need to prepare. Find out how at gov.uk slash Brexit. Get ready for Brexit on the 31st of October. Don't get caught out in the great energy price hike as large firms look to charge you more. If you want to save money on your energy bills, it's not too late to see what's on the market. With rising gas and electricity bills, don't get caught out wasting your money on expensive tariffs. A spokesman said we'll show you the very best value deals available. Check out aspokesmansaid.com and you could be using your savings to put towards a well-earned holiday. With a spokesman said.com. Fighting for you, saving you money. You alright, mate? Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah? Mm, really? It's just there's a massive grizzly bear sitting on you. You sure you're okay? Well, now that you mention it. Sometimes we say we're fine when we're not. But with one in four experiencing a mental health problem, if your mate says he's fine, he might not be. Be in your mate's corner and ask twice. Time to change. Before you set off on a long journey, remember to check your vehicle. Are your tyres correctly inflated? And are the treads deep enough? Have you got enough fuel? Is your oil level right? Checking your vehicle doesn't take long, but can prevent a breakdown or accident. And save you money. So, before you set off on a long journey, check your tyres, fuel and oil. Highways England, connecting the country. One thing I've learned is never judge a book by its movie. I'm joking, I never read This is Love Sport. 
Call me old-fashioned, but I reckon that scoring in any tier of English professional or semi-professional football is a pretty good achievement, let alone scoring in every single one of the top nine. That is what a certain Mr. Jamie Curiton pulled off last night. He scored in the Premier League all the way down to now representing Enfield. It is quite the story, quite the man, and he joins us on the line now. It's the ultimate journeyman. Jamie Curiton, how have you done this? It's you're 44 and you're still scoring goals. Um, I'm not sure. Um, I suppose just looking after myself and, and still thoroughly enjoying playing football. Um, I think that's the, the, the key thing to it. Um, even last night, thoroughly enjoyed the game. Um, and I think that that's just it, really. I just keep pushing myself because I, I still want to play football for as long as possible. Jamie, I think that's the most important thing, isn't it? Because a professional at certain stages of the of the career, yeah, and it's it's hard to try and explain this to someone that would want to be in professional football that just sees it as that ultimate pastime because sometimes it does feel like a job. Sometimes there's a professional aspect of it where you've just got to get on with what's in front of you, with the games coming up, with the players that you end up playing with. And that that kind of counterbalances the real joy and euphoria that you feel. But it sounds, doing what you've done and playing for, for such a long time, that kernel of enjoyment, that real love of the game, you've never lost it, have you? No, and I think you're right. I've probably had times in my career where I've, I've not enjoyed it and um, you know, had down times and, and bad spells. Um, but I think I've just always tried to keep the, the, just the, the pure joy of playing football. Um, I, I've done it from the age of probably seven. And I've just, I suppose being a goal scorer as well has maybe helped, um, you know, the thrill of scoring and, and having the opportunity every time I walk on the pitch to score goals. Um, and I think that's been the ultimate drive, um, just literally enjoying it that much that if I can still do it, then I will. Um, you know, I've spoke to a lot of friends that have retired and have asked me, am I not bored yet? Um, and I'm not, you know, like I say, I really enjoy it, you know, the buzz of, of, of turning up on a game day and running out um, and having the opportunity to score and, and win football matches and, and, and that's it you know I don't play for, for money or anything like that nowadays it's really just for the, the pure love of um, you know football Which period of your career which club really does stand out for, for you I mean is the one is there a couple um, I've got a few um, I would say probably my early stage at, um, at Norwich breaking in as a kid um, playing in the Premier League was, was, was very good um, obviously opened my eyes um, to being a professional, um, I had a really good spell at Bristol Rovers. Um, went back home where I was from and had four good years there. And um, Reading was probably my my best three years, as in consistently scoring and achieving stuff, um, promotions and, and playoffs and, and whatnot. Um, but I've had good times at them all. Um, Exeter is my last club. Dagenham, um, my last professional club, to had really good times. It's been the odd club where it's not worked, mm. um, but in general they they've all. You know, I've had good spells in all of them, really, and, and, and enjoyed working for all, all different teams and, you know, representing different clubs and meeting new people. Um, but there's probably three or four clubs where, where I've probably really done, you know, my, played my best football and, and really enjoyed it, um, you know, throughout the whole time I was there. So just over a quarter of a century playing football, what... <laughs> um, I mean, have you seen different trends come and go? The big thing now when you hear ex-pros of a certain age and, and when I speak to managers that I had the pleasure of playing with that have gone into the management side of it is it, there's that element it's almost that kind of bored cliched millennial um, uh, moan of players can't take certain aspects of the game nowadays the approach to it is different what for you is is, is the one thing that's really kind of categorically changed from your point of view having been in the game for so long I think the biggest thing is, is how you manage them mm. um, when I come through as a kid at Norwich um, it was just one way and that was it how you were spoken to the same as everyone else there was no he needs different treatment mm. to him it was literally this is what we are this is what we do you like it or lump it and everyone was spoken to exactly the same and I think nowadays as I've gone through so many different phases of football um, even now managing at non-league you know I've got certain players that I have to put my arm around and, and, and speak to to get the best from um, and I think that's what's changed probably the most mm. um, whereas before you were sort of called weak you know, uh, not strong enough, you know, mentally weak, whatever it was, if you couldn't deal with it, where I think nowadays you, you have to really be careful of how you how you speak to people. Um, and my job, what I've sort of learned is, you know, you have to get the best out of each individual. And if that means speaking to someone differently to, to someone else, um, I think that's what you have to do. And I think probably back in the day that, that wasn't the case. And maybe older managers now still 
try and wrap their heads around that. But, you know, there are a lot of precious players out there nowadays and you have to treat them different to, to get the best from them. Jamie, you've played for a host of clubs, obviously, but who's mm. the best player you ever lined up alongside? Um, I've been asked it a few times. I would probably say Ian Crook at um, Norwich. It was in my, my early stages as a young kid playing the Premier League. Um, he was outstanding midfielder. Um, could put a ball on a, on a sixpence, right, left foot. Had everything. Um, and I played with a lot of good players along the, along the way, but he's always stood out. Um, I was only a kid breaking in and... Um, you know, to see him firsthand. Um, and then he coached me in my, my second spell at Norwich. Um, and he was a, a wonderful player. He'd come from Tottenham. Um, and I, I'd imagine most Norwich fans would, would agree with me. He was a, was a top, top player. Jamie, great to speak to you. And I've got to thank you as well. It's a bit of a funny one. But back in 2012, <laughs> I stuck six goals past my best mate on FIFA with you playing for Exeter City. <laughs> Love and Love I me. still don't let him forget it. You were world class in that game. You ruined Brilliant. him. So thank you for that memory. Uh, not a problem. Thank you. Thank you for your time as well. Jamie Curriton there. He's played over a thousand games. He scored in the top nine tiers of English football. And David Prutton, he's six years older than you are. <laughs> so where are your boots, mate? <laughs> it's staggering, really, isn't it? It's, it's um, incredible. I think I'd say the one glaring difference would be um, he mentioned himself as a goal scorer. Goal scorers were all, always, always highly get, get sought in early, after. Mate. Absolutely. You've, uh, they always seem to, and I always found that to be the case when you'd see strikers pitch up at certain places and sometimes it'd be a bit of a head scratcher, but then you go, oh, we have a chairman, an owner, a manager, looks at a player and there's that perception of he's a goal scorer. And, and Jamie quite obviously fell into that. And I think it, it sounds like he's actively kept on top of his career, i.e. when you feel the time is right perhaps to move on, when there is an opportunity, then you go. I mean, there's sometimes centre, sentiment comes into decisions that are made where you think, I'll just stick out here. I'll just, I mean, give it another month. I want to try and get back into the team. Sometimes that can go too long, which means you run cold if you like to the to the to the outside world so credit to him 44 years old to maintain the love the passion the drive to get up get out get wet get down and dirty uh and, and crack on with his career it's it's a wonderful wonderful example is there an element of engine as well and the requirement of that being different for a striker than a central midfielder because someone like you where your game was about dynamism and getting up and down that is going to get harder yeah, if you yeah. were like jamie 44 whereas as a striker he actually is still very energetic. But if your movement's mm. very good, you don't necessarily need great legs. No, and the clever element of what uh, a striker such as Jamie is, is, as I say, that, that first jab being in your head, doing your work in your head, getting ahead of the game, That's it's because of the positional differences between midfield and a striker, that's slightly different. Uh, maybe a striker in the very top level of Premier League football, that's different because their numbers are as high as uh, the uh, other members of, of, the, of the team on the pitch. But... The, the, where we're talking with Jamie and the traditional way of setup of of a, of a striker leading the line being in a one or, or or in a pair, then yes, you can be economical with your output. Whereas if your game's built on terrace and around, <laughs> the minute you can't do that, or the minute you suddenly come up against a kid who's a decade younger than you, that makes it look so utterly, utterly effortless. Which I've been at both ends of that when you first crack on the scene <laughs> and you're running past these, these older fellas, shall we say, not breaking a sweat finish the game, can we play again tomorrow? And they're looking at you going, God, I wish I could wring your neck. And then when you get into position where you are, that's slightly older pro, and you're thinking, oh, I was a bit of a wally when I was younger. The man who accidentally retired, speaking there, David <laughs> Patton, who <laughs> came... Accidental at, retiree. Uh, ran out of contract. Uh, <laughs> was it Swindon Town? brutal! But so, so um, right. <laughs> <laughs> we it? discovered that's a what few the book weeks will ago. be called that's what the book will be called the accidental retirement yeah. all right i'd like i'll have three percent definitely all right there we go sounds well, like a sort of alan bennett we, we realized <laughs> we realized it was one of the shows you weren't here johnny there uh, really good one wasn't it guy it was yeah. very, I've heard those are, <laughs> j joking aside i've heard those are the best so. <laughs> no don't be silly Prutton's agent was actually darren lamb from extras <laughs> <laughs> and so Stephen Merchant's character when he ran out of his contract he'd completely forgotten that it was coming up for a new he'd forgotten to put any calls in and so a couple of months later David Pratt had to what degree of fanfare do you want me to say very much to some degree not at all fanfare very little I'd very say. little did fanfare. you sack your agent 
Did I? He just we just stopped hanging out. You, and act, you <laughs> accidentally stopped working together. Don't, don't agents live off a percentage of contract? I mean, if you don't have contracts anymore, if you anymore, got a percentage of nothing, then yeah, no exactly. wonder the phone <laughs> stops ringing. But if you're like a Mino Raiola, and I assume with respect you weren't working with Mino Raiola, <laughs> although no. you could have been, no. do they carry on taking? charge of a player's media duties or is, well, is they, that there's it? all sorts of things aren't there there's the commercial the image rights and things now aren't there so i imagine that the, for the players now that if you've got them during your career they're not going to sort of finish like that are they when you finish playing and i imagine that mina raiola doesn't sort of say oh, all right you've stopped playing i'll mm. i'll just back away now yeah, yeah exactly I, if, I don't want any more money off you now <laughs> if, if what we read about him is at all true then i suspect he is taking every penny he can get for as long as he can um i just want to move on quickly we're talking about this more with a german football expert before five but these rumors around Jose Mourinho and Borussia Dortmund they're not quite going away the sporting director at Dortmund is saying it's not going to happen but I'm sure Dortmund's 2-0 defeat to Inter Milan in the Champions League last night didn't particularly help Lucien Favre and Mm. it's an interesting one Jose Mourinho to Dortmund because on the one hand you've got big manager big club possibly arguably underperforming big club in Mm. Europe linked together it looks right it maybe looks like more of a match than Spurs or Everton which are the two clubs we've maybe heard more about him being linked to and then on the other Dortmund fame for their promoting of youth fame for not spending huge amounts of money you know actually getting a lot more money in from the players they sell and using it to keep themselves a very sustainable club is that one you can see happening in theory whether or not Lucien Favre is under pressure or not it feels a bit like the antithesis of what Dortmund would claim to be as a football mm. club, even even though he's he's long walked out the door, Jurgen Klopp. You, you still your your shortcut to a, an opinion on Dortmund is the big beam in smile of Klopp mm. and, it, and and the way that they energetically went about the Bundesliga with a young team. And I, Mourinho's not not famed for being able to to generate or push youth on. Uh, there was, again, there was a report I was reading in the paper today that was saying about him being yesterday's man. It was where well, he's not won a trophy since 2017. It's only 2019. Yeah, exactly. uh, he's not. He's not won a league since 2015. That's not that long ago. So, yeah, I, I think there's a there's a there's a snobbery and a dismissive tone to Jose because of everyone looking at the way he sets up his teams. You've got to play with the players that you've got. Yes, I understand that he plays in a pragmatic way that isn't as sexy as Klopp's or as Guardiola's but it's effective it's and it's then it boils down to how you class successful football whether you're entertained or whether you're successful sometimes it's I mean it's not necessarily mutually exclusive but it's nice if there's a combination but that's very very minute in the in the broad scheme of, of what football clubs can achieve I think it'd be intriguing to see him in German football. Really intriguing. I, I bet that is one of the things that appeals to Jose, right? He's won league titles in England, Portugal, and That's Spain, where the ego and Italy. Yeah. And he thinks, wow, if I could do five, you know, well, okay, he be... hasn't got France at the moment, but who's to say he couldn't get a quick stint in as PSG when <laughs> even in a one-horse race? Win the league race. by February. Exactly. <laughs> and he's got six. That's got yeah. to appeal to him. He is a man with an It'd unashamed ego. It would be unprecedented, wouldn't it? It would be a tremendous CV. I mean, it's already a tremendous CV it's now. Bad, serial, it, wouldn't it? it? It's, yeah. it's, it's... Learning German, apparently. So there you go. Yeah. And it, I was always really impressed by it. Impressed. impressed. <laughs> <You're learning Dutch>. <laughs> <laughs> Steve <laughs> McLaren joins us I'll in the studio. I'll Steve, see, how see are you? See you later, guys. See, <laughs> see you later. Go watch. Watching, Get out of the studio. To watch Ajax. Yeah, <laughs> see you later. I think, well, German, not the hardest language. Jose, of really? course. Really? In the scale of them, r- relatively doable. Go on, then. Uh, give, give me your top three uh, European languages to learn from an In terms ease. of ease. Yes. German, mm. Italian. Spanish, Italian being the easiest. I'd go Spanish, French, German, Italian. Can I tell you a secret? In German, yes. Mein linker blinker ist kaputt, and that means my left indicator light is broken. This is Love Sport. Full of skill, full of flair, full of desire. Fulham FC is full of fire. Oh, what a goal! Be there at Craven Cottage as Fulham continue their surge towards the top of the Skybet Championship. Watch the unmissable action live in SW6, home of London's original football club. Absolutely brilliant. Grab your tickets now at FulhamFC.com. Don't get caught out by rising energy bills this year. Leading price comparison site, a spokesman said, can help you save money in just minutes. Plus, sign up to a spokesman said to get the latest super cheap collective energy deals. These offers are such great value, they aren't even available direct from the energy companies. Savvy customers have saved over £10 million from collective energy deals. Go to a spokesmansaid.com and you could be saving big money on your bills. With a spokesmansaid.com. 
Fighting for you, saving you money. Get ready for Brexit on the 31st of October. This means that travelling to the EU will change. You'll need to check online if your passport is valid for travel to Europe. If you're planning on driving, you'll need to check if you have the right documents to drive and make sure your travel insurance covers all your healthcare needs. To keep your trip on track, check what you need to do at gov.uk slash Brexit. Get ready for Brexit on the 31st of October. If you fall asleep at the wheel, you'll put your life in danger and the lives of others as well. Before you feel tired, pull off the road into a services or other safe area, drink some strong coffee, and take a quick nap while the caffeine kicks in. If you're having a nap, you've left your lights on, sir. All right, cheers. Think, don't drive tired. David Prutton has just gone three, two, <laughs> eins. He's funny. Stopped. He's funny, which is important because we've got another three hours in his company. The next hour Hi. is going to be top class. Michael Grant, Scottish football correspondent for the Times, giving his take on Celtic and Rangers ahead of their Europa League action tonight. Could Morelos be on his way out of Glasgow? We're talking rugby as well. Owen Farrell is the Roy Keane of this England team. He's going to start shouting. On digital radio, online, mobile and smart speaker. This is Love Sport News. From the Sky News Centre at four, Essex police have been given another 24 hours to question the driver of a lorry which was found with 39 people dead inside. The eight women and 31 men discovered in a container in Greys yesterday morning were Chinese. The 25-year-old suspect from Northern Ireland is being held on suspicion of murder. Clive Mills, who runs a fleet of lorries, says it can be hard to keep them secure. The majority of drivers do their job and they're caught up in this. Over the years, I've been, you know, been asked what can we put in place. So we put in uh, padlocks. We use TIR cord, which is like a wire cord that goes through the side of the lorry. Boris Johnson is currently chairing a meeting of his cabinet to discuss the Brexit deadlock. It's also emerged the government won't bring a debate on the deal back to Parliament next week. A man who trained to fight against Islamic State has been convicted of a terrorism offence. 28-year-old Aidan James from Merseyside went to Iraq to train with a Kurdish militia in 2017. The UK's biggest remaining payday lender is on the verge of collapse. It's understood Cash Euronet UK, which trades under the Quickquid brand, could be put into administration within days. A deal has been reached to provide life-saving cystic fibrosis drugs on the NHS in England. Around 5,000 patients will now have access to the medicines. And Coldplay have revealed their new album track listing in classified adverts in several local newspapers. The band announced the record in the North Wales Daily Post, where lead guitarist Johnny Buckland once worked. Its editor, Andrew Campbell, says they didn't expect it at all. We actually knew nothing about it until someone phoned up. Even if we had spotted it, there was nothing to say this is um, a world exclusive. It was you know, a very understated uh, advert with just a list of a, a few songs, and we would have probably just seen it as a Coldplay album advert. It also featured in the Exeters Express and Echo in a nod to the birthplace of frontman Chris Martin, as well as other international papers and in France and Australia. That's the latest. I'm Will Rowe. Love Sport Radio, on digital radio, online, mobile and smart speaker. This is the Posh Boys on Love Sport Drive. Good afternoon. You're listening to the Posh Boys on Love Sport Drive. That's me, Johnny Burrow, Guy Watts and Love Sport's very own David Prutton, former Nottingham Forest and Southampton midfielder. Your top stories this afternoon. George Ford has been brought back into the England team for Saturday's Rugby World Cup semi-final against New Zealand. He replaces... <laughs> stop laughing. He replaces Henry Slade in England's only change from the corner... <laughs> 
<laughs> quarterfinal win against Australia. Man United fans are urging the club to sign Erling Haaland, but Ole Gunnar Solskjaer sounds keen on Harry Kane, and Conor McGregor is returning to MMA in January, which I was very tempted to do just a moment ago when David <laughs> Pratton made me laugh live on the radio. We are, of course, talking rugby today, but we're talking Chelsea as well. A lot of talk about these youngsters coming of age last night against Ajax. Is that true? And if so, how far can they go this season? I don't think they can be too wary of, of their limitations. They've, there's that fearlessness of youth. There's no arrogance you feel with that side. They've got a manager who himself is um, not necessarily a novice at the managerial game, but very much a career in its infancy. So... That probably reflects onto the players. The players reflect onto him. They they energise each other. It's a perfect cycle at this moment in time. So I don't think they should put any form of, of barriers on where they need to end up or, or, or restrictions. Belief could get them into a position where, I'm not saying uh, perhaps Manchester City and, and Liverpool are the ones that they should be setting their sights on, but when you look at third, fourth place with the squad that they've got, I, I, I mean... Yes, it's young. Yes, it's relatively inexperienced at this level, but so what? At some stage, they've got to have that experience. They've got to be able to be in a position to actively reward the fans for uh, investing emotionally and, and physically in, in what these young players can do. And, and why not aim for as high at the league as possible? Yes, we can keep talking about the parameters that they're working in, i.e. the transfer restrictions, but use that to their aid, which is what they've done so far. They're fourth in the table at the moment, just behind Leicester City on goal difference. For me, they've got more depth mm. than Leicester City. They're two points ahead of Arsenal. They're definitely more consistent than Arsenal. They are five points ahead of Tottenham. Definitely more consistent than them. But when we're talking about these young players, these fresh players, we don't have a great deal of evidence to see what they're going to do across a whole season. With the likes of Tammy Abraham and Mason Mount, do they just happen to have started this year well? Are they in a good run of form that will subside or are they actually that good? Are we going to be looking at the end of the year at Tammy having 20 goals in the Premier League? Well, that's the test. We've seen him score a lot of goals in the Championship. We've seen him play a lot of games in the Championship. We've seen last season, tomorrow, we've seen Mount play a lot of games over the course of a season, which is hell for leather, as we know in the second tier. There's games every few days. You've got to be physically ready, mentally ready. Uh, and then you you dovetail that with, I don't know, the likes of Willie Allen, hudson Adoy, another player that we know um, has had a period out with injury, seems to be back chomping at the bit, new uh, contracts that's spurring him on. That's Pilaqueta, is it? And Alonso, I mean, they're nice, experienced players to, to kind of bookend uh, younger players in in the defence and with Georgina and Kovacic they've got uh, experience from abroad so uh, they, their their responsibility as young players is to energise the slightly older players the older players' responsibility is to cajole these younger players on and make sure that they achieve the heights and that they achieve the um, uh, the levels that they have come, can be become accustomed to I mean Mason Mount he's 20 years old that's not it's young in, in relative terms Tammy Abraham is 22. Why shouldn't we expect players of this age to go through a full season and play most games, obviously injury permitting? Every player is subject, uh, subjected to form and fitness, but uh, we're not talking about babies here. We're not talking about 16, 17 year olds. They're not, they're not callow young men that don't know uh, or don't have the street smarts within professional football. I think there's an element of realism that you've got to attach to the ideology of, of looking at these players and saying, oh, it'd be great if they end up at the end of the season achieving something really well together and dovetail that with they should they should they should look at this season and, and look at Tottenham maybe looking like they're coming to an end of a cycle Manchester United not knowing what on earth they're doing Arsenal still being perennially soft in the underbelly region why not aim along with Leicester for third and fourth spot yeah I think that has to be the ambition but they've got to keep it in check, haven't they? You'd think that Frank Lampard would have been in jubilant spirits after last night's win, but he had these words of warning for his squad after the Ajax game. I said to the players before the game, five wins in a row is really dangerous. It's really dangerous because it can make you sloppy, it can make you switch off and think everything's fine. Six wins is even more dangerous. So that's the message of Burnley. 
well, but that, that's that's the most important word in that whole sentence. Burnley, Burnley away coming up. How often have people said that? Exactly, that's the not most people that live in Burnley. Word in the sentence, Burnley. But that I mean, and that you go from the the glitz and the glamour of of Ajax and and a performance and a result there to the very <laughs> evidence of meat and drink of of what Premier League football can be away at Burnley because. Frank knows that if that team's not ready, if that team's got carried away with itself over the course of the last couple of days, they'll go to Burnley. They'll, they'll have an extremely tough time. It, it's to me, for Frank, for the message that he wants to send to the players, it's the perfect game off the back of a great victory in Europe. I think that is the only way of looking at it. But that Burnley game, we've seen it with the likes of Arsenal before. We almost saw it with Leicester at the weekend. They know how to test you. And if you're a young team, if you're a mentally or physically fragile team, they know how to bruise you, they know how to wind you up. Are the likes of Mason Mount going to be up to it? Should be. As I said, they've seen teams like that in the Championship. That's with the greatest respect to Burnley. I'm not saying that Burnley are a Championship team um, going toe-to-toe with Premier League sides. They're deservedly where they are in the top tier of English football. Sean may have this stereotypical personification of uh, the gruff English manager but there's there's no little technique no little nuance that goes into what he does yes he works his team hard yes his team works hard but he knows that with the sum total of the players that he's got prerequisite has got to be baseline of hard work uh, determination aggression but the silk involved in that side as well to be able to be in the Premier League to be able to mix it with these players uh, means that he's got the balance absolutely right. I think it's I think it's fantastic, isn't it? And it shows, as we well know, we talk about uh, teams playing to the strengths. Burnley absolutely do do that. They do. And I'm really, really excited in particular by Dwight McNeil. A great ball for Chris Wood at the weekend. Still 19, lovely left foot, English lad. Lots to be excited about in the youth ranks there as well. For now, time for a bit of rugby. England have made one change for the World Cup semi-final versus the All Blacks on Saturday. Guy, you can write New Zealand as much as you like. I'm going to keep saying All Blacks. (laughs) He's told me off. You're giving them too much respect. That's their name. We can use it. George Ford comes in at fly half for Eddie Jones's men. Henry Slade drops to the bench while Owen Farrell captains the side from inside centre. And before the game, Sir Clive Woodward has compared the England captain to Roy Keane. Let's hear what Farrell had to say ahead of the challenge of the All Blacks this weekend. These are the same players that threw Marino under the bus. And they will do exactly the same to Ollie. The Leopards don't change their spots. There's too many bluffers at this club to get United back to the very top. Uncanny. England captain Owen Farrell there giving his take Uncanny. of all of the All Blacks of New Zealand Look ahead at his of satisfied this game. smile there. He's so <laughs> pleased himself. <laughs> Stitch you up there, didn't I? I was like, what is going on? But I'll read it. T- I, I will trust you. Took you a couple of seconds and I was looking at your face and you were like, is that Owen Farrell? Oh, I I see what he's did you for one second think it was Owen Farrell? Well, I was thinking, it does happen. Colin where, Farrell? It does happen where you, where you can play the wrong clip. I did, I think, the worst production gaff I have ever heard about a year ago. Do you remember this? Where I was producing, I think, Love Sports weekend breakfast show. And it was in a headline like that. And it was the lovely Paul Mortimer who said, and let's hear what Jose Mourinho had to say before the game. And rather than playing Jose, I managed to play Shaggy's It Wasn't Me. (laughs) Wow. That is as bad as it gets. Where would that that even be in our system? Because you've got, because we were doing it for some other feature and you've got a play button at the top for one file and a play button at the bottom for another Mm -hmm. file. Press the wrong play button, didn't Ah. I? So I thought there might have been a mix up, but no, it was in fact a jape. The sort of uh, minor error that someone like Roy Keane or indeed Owen Farrell would have probably got very annoyed at if you'd made while playing in a team with one of them. What do we make of this comparison? Sir Clive Woodward, no less, of course, the man who coached England to the World Cup Mm. in 2003. He says Owen Farrell is England's Roy Keane, referencing as well the comments Roy Keane made. And I'd be interested to get your thoughts on this, David, about uh, Man United and Liverpool players hugging and kissing and having a laugh in the tunnel before that game at Old Trafford last weekend. Keane said he was disgusted. I mean, that's probably slightly overdone. 
doing it, even Very if strong, you agree with the sentiment. <laughs> but he said Owen Farrell wouldn't do that. He wouldn't stand for that, citing when he picked a bit of a, an issue with Scottish players in a pre-game warm-up because they were picking on George Ford, so he believed. And I thought there was something in that comparison. First, mm. do you see that? And B, what did you make of the hugging and kissing in the tunnel? I think it's an extreme comparison. The... The comparison that he means with regard to looking after his teammates, I can kind of see, which is it's it's that real lovely kind of dichotomy with King, wasn't it? Would stand up to his teammates, but every single teammate has felt the full wrath of his, yeah. <laughs> of his anger and his and his aggression, which goes to show that very much uh, a captain that looks after his players with a stick rather than a carrot. Mm-hmm. But they seem to all get on side and follow him into whichever battle he led them into. Yeah. I think what he said about. Um, you can't come away from the fact that, and I like what he's done so far, Roy Keane, with regard to sitting and giving his opinion. Mm. There's no way on earth that he doesn't understand how he comes across. There's no way mm. that he doesn't realise that people are sat there going, "Go on, Roy, go on, Roy, say something, say something." Oh, I said it. This is brilliant. <laughs> because exactly, I mean, you could. Just, I mean, it, it's the, it's the withering disdain on his. Oh, it's disgusting. Go on, get I mean, it's, Just it's get Keane. exactly. It's not. It's not. <laughs> he's, not, the one, he's on the one. Is up. it? Yeah, because it's not disgusting, is it? I mean, there's no. there's five, there's a there's a laundry list of things that are more disgusting than that. Culturally, <laughs> culturally, you look at the way players relate to each other. It's a different era. There's 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 a lot of friendliness, uh, but you, and you we always go back to what we saw in the tunnel between Arsenal and, um, and Manchester United with Keane looking after Gary Neville and 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 Vieira being the man in that that was trying to instigate a bit of something before the actual game kicked off which I, I watching it as well it's wonderful tv to see what yeah. it's like but he's he's very much he's very much king of the of the um imminently quotable uh couple of spaces in between the sentences which i think has been fantastic i think it's performance art uh <laughs> do you think he's, he's, he's playing a part do you it, think he is playing up to too much when actually you'd rather sometimes have his genuine analysis his genuine thoughts rather than playing to the galleries or whatever it might be you know be. what I, I don't think he's got that much to offer in terms of detailed tactical analysis he's there to play a part in a soap opera and he does that very very well it might surprise you both to hear that i am about as far from roy Keane no. as you can get and he really annoys me when he goes oh jesse lingard and paul pogba shouldn't be on instagram why because you weren't because it didn't exist oh players who are mates for the national team shouldn't say hello before a game of football grow up roy there's this kind of desperation to be so hyper masculine yeah, yeah that I you that. can't be a uh, functioning uh, human or that, have a life that's also i think without going too deep and psychoanalysis like on roy Keane, that that's born of uh, nature and nurture mixed together of where he's come from, how he views his how, relationship what, with his father. Exactly what his worldview is on on how he got to where he, he, he needed to get to. The ability to armor plate yourself in an industry that can be absolutely brutal. That's not mean to say that you've got to go at people that mm. are easy targets because on occasion he's done that, which has overstepped a mark. But as you quite rightly say, he sees things in black and white. What he says about Brian Clough saying before he gave him his debut at Anfield for Forest was, "You can pass, you can tackle." and you can run around, do those three things. And he actively says, doesn't he, that he made a career on doing those things. Mm -hmm. Yes, that oversimplifies it because he was an exceptional passer of the ball. His first touch was world-class. His drive, his determination, his ability to get more out of himself and the people around him was relatively unparalleled for a bracket of time in the Mm -hmm. Premier League. But look at what he did at international level, uh, dropping bombs left, right and centre because players that he didn't deem worthy of being in the same place it was all about standards. routinely torn to shreds. The coaching and the players and the drills and all the rest of it weren't up to it. And he never liked Harlan GT. One of the most revealing things I found about mm. reading his book, you know, Jack Charlton, mm-hmm. whatever success he'd had, quarterfinals of World Cups, he didn't like the setup because he felt it had been a false achievement, if mm. you like. It was based on a bit of luck rather than actual high standards. And I thought that was really revealing. Johnny, I know where you're coming from, and it is sort of Roy Keane playing to the gallery and all that kind of thing. But actually, Sir Clive would quote Willie John McBride, an absolute rugby legend, of course. He said that before a game, it is the most important thing in the world and afterwards it is the least important. And I think that sums it up quite nicely. I don't think it would hurt any of those players, whoever it might be, Firmino and Rojo, I don't know who it was exactly, but just wait till after the game. In an hour and a half's time, it'll be done and dusted. Say what you like in the bar afterwards, but focus for the next hour and a half. But the thing is, well, you've got to look at the cultural aspect of it as well. If you're, because we're, as as British and Irish citizens... And it all, I mean, this is a very broad brushstroke that I'm using to, to, to classify us in this mm. part of the world. We can be quite reserved. We can be quite reticent. There's, we're not as tactile and touchy-feely as perhaps other nations, other cultures. If you're looking at 
Central, Southern, South America, if you're looking at uh, broad uh, swathes of Europe. It's all, we were talking off air about it, the Italian language. It's all very expressive. It's all very emotive. There is a lot of touching and, and, and hugging and, and, and players coming together with shared past experiences. And I think it's a lovely thing to see, but I understand where it's coming from. I wouldn't specifically go out my way to make sure it was t- uh, classified as disgusting, but it's, it's what makes up the rich tapestry of what the Premier League is now. It's what we it, they opened the doors to the world coming into this game, which allowed players such as Roy and uh, of his ilk to earn vast amounts of money because it became a broad world product. And if the upshot of that is players hugging before the game, I mean, I'm all for that. Imagine trying to love Roy Keane. Though. Trying to give him a hug. Imagine trying to bring <laughs> him out of his shell. He gets home from work. Roy, how was your day? It was all right. Would, would you like a hug? Get away from me. Get away <laughs> from me. I'm a football player. Don't touch me. Coming up, we're talking Scotland. Love sports. You all right, mate? Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah? Mm, really? It's just there's a massive grizzly bear sitting on you. You sure you're okay? Well, now that you mention it, sometimes we say we're fine when we're not. But with one in four experiencing a mental health problem, if your mate says he's fine, he might not be. Be in your mate's corner and ask twice. Time to change. It's cancer, they said. My first thought? Let's just say it wasn't money. But time off work for treatment and trips to the hospital. Paying the mortgage. And, and, and. The cost of living doesn't go away just because you're living with cancer. And Macmillan can help with that too. My advice? Take their advice. Soon as I did. Macmillan, right there with you. Call 0808 808 0000 now. Are you paying way over the odds for your car insurance? The spiralling costs put people off driving full stop. But you're a careful driver, and realistically, you'll only need an insurance payout if some halfwit cuts you off on the M1. So you shouldn't be forced to pay massive car insurance premiums. And you don't have to. Go to price comparison site aspokesmansaid.com today and find out the best value car insurance deals on the market. Don't pay the price for not shopping around. TheSpokesmanSaid.com. Fighting for you, saving you money. Exercise. It doesn't have to mean Lycra or a fancy gym membership. All you need is 10 minutes and you. Because a regular 10-minute brisk walk is a great way to get more active. Whether that's walking to the shops or getting off the bus to stop early. Picking up the pace and getting your heart pumping can make a real difference to your health. So, to see how much brisk walking you're doing, and how you can fit more into your day, download the free Active 10 app, because there's only one you. I've heard that England does not have a kidney bank, but it does have a Liverpool. This is Love Sport. Is the balance of power finally shifting in the SPL? We've had years of Celtic dominance. Rangers looking like getting back into it, and both sides are in action in tonight's Europa League. Celtic face a tough game against Lazio while Rangers travel to Porto. We're joined on the line by Michael Grant, who's a Scottish football correspondent for The Times. Good afternoon, Michael. Big games for both clubs, but with the league table so finely poised, do either of the fans really care about Europe? Yeah, it's a good point, that, actually, because um, we we spoke to Neil Lennon yesterday and and one of the questions that was put to him was, have we lost, Michael? I think he would get him back in just a moment. It is a really delicate one, that. When you are dealing with, for example, a run to the playoffs or a challenge for the title, an FA Cup run or a Europa League run, does that kind of take a back seat? From the outside looking in of what you want a big club or two big clubs like that to achieve, then I think they've got to be professing to be taking each Uh, competition they're going very very seriously but you can't come away from the rivalry of what this season is about between Rangers and Celtic Celtic looking to go once again for the title and uh, be in a position where they can really I mean they do like lording it over each other in certain respects but to go for this one I mean Rangers really do need to upset the apple cart don't they make sure that come the end of the season it's them with the trophy in their hands over the course of the league season and it is Celtic it would be quite a nasty record for Celtic to get from a Rangers point of view Gerard could be the man to break that monopoly Michael Grant rejoins us now Michael you were saying are they more focused on the SPL than the Europa League yeah, yeah, they are. Um, I, I don't know how much you heard, but uh, Neil Lennon was asked yesterday about whether he would play a weekend, ever play a weekend team in Europe, with a view to kind of preserving resources for a league game, and, and he said no. 
but he did say that in his view the priority was winning the league and and I think that that is always the case at Celtic you know because in Scotland only the champions get that route to the Champions League the following season so it, it is worth potentially tens of millions to win the league if you can then get through to the group stage um, but yeah um, it is it's a it's a fascinating the element to the league race that both teams are in Europe as well. So they have these kind of Thursday night obligations in the Europa League and, and, and tests, and sometimes they're coming back from an away trip, which could be difficult going into the weekend games. So it, it, it's interesting that, that they are both in and competing at the same level in, in Europe. Michael, the approach of uh, English teams that we've seen in the Europa League in recent seasons, almost that kind of alluding to it being a, a slight hindrance. But when you look at Celtic, uh, and Rangers being able to perform in Europe, then it's still being able to perform domestically. Does that show a different, a, a more refreshing approach by these two sides to this particular tournament? Yeah, I mean, I think most most countries in Europe still regard the Europa League as as being significant and attractive. I know, I know that's not the case for all the English teams, but it, it is for um, for for the Scottish teams. I mean, Celtic Lazio tonight. You know, it, it it doesn't feel far away from a Champions League group game, although it isn't. But you know what I mean in terms of the the profile of the two clubs and the history of the two clubs and, and Rangers Porto. So, you know, you could argue you could argue that the, the the two Scottish teams tonight are playing, you know, traditionally strong European teams who would normally regard themselves as being Champions League level. I'm, I'm going to Parkhead. It'll be sixty thousand. The atmosphere will be pretty, uh, pretty electric as, as as usual in Glasgow, and you know it's going to be a good night. It it won't particularly feel like a kind of second tier competition, and uh, obviously Celtic are top of their section, so a win would ensure that they they remain leaders at the at the halfway point. We've seen a good few transfer rumours, particularly around Rangers recently, and certainly around Alfredo Morelos, the star Colombian striker. He's being linked with a potential move to Crystal Palace, potentially to Aston Villa as well. Is that kind of move likely? And actually, is Morelos ready for an even bigger move than that? Uh, there's a lot of um, conjecture about Morelos, not only about his future at Rangers, but also the level that he could play at. I mean, I think the big question mark that's been hanging over him until recently has been whether he has a temperament to handle you know, being exposed to kind of clever, streetwise defenders who will get under his skin. Well, that's the, Michael, that's a huge one, isn't it? I mean, di disciplinary-wise, is is a wonderful collector of red cards, which <laughs> is something as yeah. you as you're probably going to allude to. That has it maybe started to be addressed. Yeah, I mean, it, so far, so far, it's been good from him this season. Uh, He's up against Pepe tonight in the Porto site, so I mean he's gonna he's gonna have an experienced, uh, you know, cunning operator to put it mildly, uh, who will be trying his best to kind of definite red get under it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 basically, basically to, to uh, provoke him into doing something stupid. And and you know if if Porto have done their homework on on Rangers and Morelos, they'll know that that has been successful for teams in the past. Now. There's a kind of feeling that that Morelos is showing more maturity this season, and you know he will have to if he is to um, reach the potential that we know that he has. And and if, sell, if Rangers are eventually going to sell him for a big fee, there can't be this kind of huge question mark over his temperament. He he has to address that, and you know so far he has. But um, you know it's, it's big tests like these and future old firm games will be. Will be, um, you know, that will prove whether he has addressed his, uh, his his temperament. Could we potentially be looking at a January move for Morelos? But Gerard is really not going to want to lose him mid-season, is he? No, he isn't. I, I, you know, I think if if Rangers are in contention for the league, and it looks very much like it will be still pretty tight in January, uh, I would find it amazing if they would sanction a sale. I think it would have to be. Such a, a, a high bid that um, uh, and, you know, and Morelos himself would have to be kind of agitating and saying, "Yes, I want to go here." Um, otherwise, I, I'm pretty sure he'll see out the season, and, and maybe then the summer would be the time to move. But I mean, he is—he is certainly a prolific goal scorer in Scotland. I know that comes with a kind of caveat, and, and you know, can he do it at a higher level? Um, we, we have still to see that, but he certainly. He is a prolific finisher. There's no, um, there's no question about that at, at, at a certain level. So, Michael, for you, 
24th of October now. We look at where Celtic and Rangers are in the league uh, level. Pegging, how do you see it turning out? Lots of football to be played between now and then, but how are we seeing a Rangers side that at this moment in time can challenge the status quo? Well, I think they could. I mean, what are we, eight or nine games into the season? Mm. They, they are second only on goal difference. Um, I mean, I predicted Celtic at the start of the season. I don't particularly see a reason to go against that, but you know, at the moment, Celtic are operating with kind of one main striker, Odson Edward. Now, if he was to be injured, um, you would then say, right, OK, who's, who's leading the line for their attack? Um, you know, Rangers have got Defoe as well as Morelos. Um, Rangers at the weekend drop points at heart, so you think, is, is this a, a recurring issue they have that every time they get, they nudge slightly ahead of Celtic, they seem to they seem to get the jitters a little bit and, and, and they drop back in the second. But, but the other thing, Johnny, is that you know you, you've got a you've got a January window coming up here where Celtic have got a lot of money in the bank that uh, they could they could uh, use to strengthen the team if required. We, we don't know how much money Rangers have to spend, if any, um, although they have a good squad. So you know, it, at the moment, it looks like it's going to be pretty tight. They're, they're tending to kind of uh, plough through a lot of the opposition in Scotland, but it'll it'll come down to the odd game that they drop points. Rangers dropped points at the weekend. Celtic had dropped points at Livingston and against Hibs. So, you know, so far it's looking like a tight race that might go pretty close to the wire. It's going to be very exciting indeed. Michael, great to talk to you. Thank you for your time. Michael Grant there, Scottish football correspondent for The Times. David, you had a long and storied career across a number of clubs. Not as long as Jamie Kiriton. Nobody has had a career as long as Jamie, I don't think. Show off. Did you... <laughs> leave him be. <laughs> Did you ever play with an Alfredo Morelos? Were you an Alfredo Morelos? Uh, <laughs> I wasn't as highly strung as that. I was prone to a red card. I think, on average, it was probably at least one per season over the course of about 14 or 15 years. Quite strong. Thanks. Um, <laughs> but from a hot-headed point of view, I mean, having seen uh, and studied this league, and, and, and there's, there's a fellow that I work with quite a bit called Chris Boyd, who quite obviously knows Scottish football uh, to the uh, far end of the what's it, um, and great experience with it all. When you talk about this play, when you talk about what he brings to the team, undoubtedly skillful, undoubtedly um, a player that can really affect a game. But my word, can he get wound up? It's and unbelievable. Having no vested interest in either side, or particularly uh, watching it as a neutral, watching it as as a, as a footballing spectacle, as um, Scottish uh, the top level of Scottish football unfolds, to see how and and th- this is. Being able to look at a football match as uh, an objective party and saying, oh my God, I can see, and everyone in the crowd can see where this is going. In the moment when you've completely lost it, and afterwards you go, that was a bit daft. But uh, having seen it, it's almost like a, that slow motion train wreck of, he's got wound up, that he's going to go and kick the person that's kicked him. I mean, and with Morelos, it, it's that loose cannon element that both makes him entertaining and agonising to watch if you're a Rangers fan because you want him on the pitch because he's one of their best players but you also know that you get Scott Brown up against him who is another wind-up merchant an architect in chief of getting him off the pitch then you can see it coming that's the real test that's why teams will be looking at going yes he might be able to affect a football match if he's sent off three or four times a season we're going to miss him for at least a third of the games. He got sent off multiple times against just Aberdeen <laughs> last year. This is a guy... What's wrong with Aberdeen as he, well? <laughs> he, he is a world-class merchant of the red card. There was one last year. I can't remember who it was against. I'll dig it out. It's where he shoves the other guy over, stamps on him, and then dives. Mm. You think that is the best red card <laughs> I've ever seen. And when you mention Scott Brown... I feel like the SPL, and I'm not saying this in a disrespectful way, I'm not saying that the standard is low or any Mm. of those classic English cliches, but I think it is closer to what Roy Keane would like English football to still be. It was that moment last season in the old firm derby where Scott Brown was on the wind-up and just got chinned by Ryan Kent. Mm. And you think, what? What are you doing? You are grown men in the modern era staggering coming up we're gonna have some team news for you manchester united wolves and rangers will be in the next 15 minutes so stay tuned for that and we'll be talking championship with football league legend david prutton love sports it's cancer they said my first thought let's just say it wasn't money but time off work for treatment and trips to the hospital 
paying the rent, and, and, and. The cost of living doesn't go away just because you're living with cancer, and Macmillan can help with that too. My advice? Take their advice, soon as I did. Macmillan, right there with you. Call 0808 808 0000 now. Home insurance is vital. You don't want to end up paying through the nose when something goes wrong. But are you being charged way too much for your home cover? Are your insurance premiums simply too much to bear? It doesn't have to be that way. A spokesman said.com is a price comparison website that trawls the internet to find the best deal for you. Don't pay the price for not shopping around. Visit a spokesman said.com and start saving today. A spokesman said.com. Fighting for you, saving you money. You all right, mate? Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah? Mm, really? It's just, there's a massive grizzly bear sitting on you. You sure you're okay? Well, now that you mention it. Sometimes we say we're fine when we're not. But with one in four experiencing a mental health problem, if your mate says he's fine, he might not be. Be in your mate's corner and ask twice. Time to change. I love my brother. We do fun things like playing together. I like having hugs with Freddie. Freddie gives the best hugs. Freddie used to be very poorly. And the doctor said he might need a new liver. Then one day, a very nice person gave their liver to Freddie. It was amazing. We were so happy. Now he's around to give me more hugs than ever. Tell your family you want to save lives. To find out more, visit organdonation.nhs.uk. This is Love Sport. We're talking a bit of championship now. David Prutton, where were you last night? We were taking in Huddersfield and Middlesbrough in the delightful company of Tony Pulis, of course, the former borough manager, and Andy Hinchcliffe, one of our own. Very, very pleasant company, the both, which we needed for a game such as that. I think that is the mo- You have spent the most football league evening <laughs> anyone ever has had. Watching Huddersfield and Middlesbrough draw nil-nil in the company of Tony Pulis. I think if you could do kind of the epitome of championship football. If Carlsberg football, did. Yeah, if Carlsberg <laughs> did championship, it would be that. And we've established you've got a lively Sunday yes. coming up. The big Welsh derby on yes. the day of a Welsh World Cup rugby semi-final. The championship, mm. for want of a better word, is mental. Yep. It is a sensational league in terms of how close it is. We've got West Brom out in front Mm -hmm. but we can go all the way down to charlton in 10th charlton who lost 2-1 to bristol city last night five points separate the addicts and the baggies how can that be 10 places five points well at this moment in time there's no real team that's really strode out in front of the rest of the pack you mentioned west brom there they played barnsley on tuesday but barnsley were two nil ahead another game where west brom allowed their opponents to to get a, a steal a march on them early on in the game. It was an own goal that brought them back into the game. Then they scored in the last ten minutes to equalise. For Leeds United, again another game where they dominated possession, passes, the attempts, but attempts on target sadly lacking. They needed a very late goal from Eddie Nketiah, a, a player that, I mean, the dilemma there and the debate is raging uh, in West Yorkshire with regard to how you use Eddie Nketiah, averaging something like 17 minutes of action per game on loan from Arsenal, yet to start a league game, yet comes on, scores goals. Every um, time. Every time. So there's a debate there. Sheffield Wednesday is a nice little slow burner. Obviously, Wednesday and Leeds go up against each other on Saturday lunchtime. So uh, it, it's, I mean, like you say, you, these teams that perhaps we wouldn't perceive to be there, the likes of QPR, the likes of Preston, Fulham outside of the top six, but dominating in games again love to keep all of the ball and in Mitrovic they've got the top scorer in the whole of English league football at this moment in time so they've certainly got the goals to, to make sure that they're up there at the end of the season and Forrest is an intriguing one before the game on Sunday against Wigan uh, three points for them would have taken them to the top they've now lost consecutive games against Wigan who we know are really good at home and at home against Hull City who ended up with 10 men so from my point of view, I find it fascinating, not because, not just because we sit there covering it, but having played a, a, a big bulk of my career at that particular level, I think this season, the teams that we've got, I think the, the field the uh, the field that we've got of teams going for the promotion places is wider because, like I said, there's nobody that's strode out in front and gone, this is our division, you lot can fight out the rest of it between yourselves. And it just makes for wonderfully open games of football, which sometimes... 
when you sit there and watch it, say like last night, you, you look in and you're working out, right, we're going to talk about this at half time, we're going to talk about this at full time. And sometimes in games of football, chances, clear cut chances can be few and far between. So you've got to look at it in a slightly different way. But having played in enough games over the course of a football league career where you just think a point here would be decent, let's get on to the weekend. We know we can't dress it up as, yes, everyone that came to the stadium, we understand that within the realms of entertainment, that probably wouldn't fall into that bracket. But you appreciated the effort, the endeavour, the fact that there was a team there that turned up, that held on, or there's a team that was really pushing to get a result. And over the course of a, of a, of a 46 league game season, some perhaps are going to slip through the net with regard to the beautiful game, shall we say. Is it a better division than the Premier League? Let's be honest. In what sense? In the sense of as a league, as a, as, com- as a competitive competition. Um, I think you would have to say from a com- competition point of view possibly I think if you look at what we saw in recent years Leicester City actually winning the Premier League that was a real shot in the arm I thought that showed the world that this league that we say is the best is the brightest is, is the the funkiest thing on the planet uh, that is capable of throwing something up like that a 5,000 to 1 shot that then becomes Premier League champions so I, I, I think that the glitz and the glamour and, and the mystique of that remains, and I think it's untouchable. For uh, the Championship, what's on offer at the very end of the season, That the biggest game, if you look at the playoff game, with regards to the financial clout of the winner that goes up, I think that makes it so bitingly competitive that you look at these games, like I said, the, the West Brom-Barnsley game, Barnsley at the very foot of the division, going two up with just over half an hour to go against West Brom. They end up uh, uh, sharing the points. Stoke City, Huddersfield making up the bottom three. Huddersfield, not as surprising perhaps as the Stoke City, but Borough shouldn't really be down there. They're in a transitional period. Reading started off fantastically well, completely nosed. They have Wigan, uh, good at home, not so good away from home. That's them in a nutshell. And Luton fighting to, to consolidate, having got promoted. So I think you can go all the way up. You've got former Premier League winner there in 16th in Blackburn. That goes to show the very nature of what this division is. It's ruthless, it's cutthroat, and I think it's so quintessentially British that I I just love it. Yeah, and you're going to have a very lively Sunday (laughs) afternoon (laughs) as a result. Guy Watts has some Europa League team news. I do indeed, Johnny. And yeah, we're going to hear from Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and Matt Dotti in a moment as well. So first of all, Wolves, who of course are in uh, Slovakia to play Slovan Bratislava, a game that is in theory behind closed doors as a punishment for the team's previous racist chanting. It's not quite going to be, though, and we'll come on to that in a moment. But here's the Wolves team here first and foremost. Rui Patricio in goal, Willy Bolly, Connor Cody and Max Kilman in the back three. Uh, Matt Doherty at right wing back and Ruben Venega on the left. You've got Roman Saiz, João Moutinho and Morgan Gibbs-White, the youngster, of course, in midfield, and a front two of Patrick Cutroni and Raul Jimenez. Subs bench, you've got a strong-looking bench as well. Adama Traore, Ruben Neves, Johnny Otto, Leander Dendonka, Diogo Jota, John Ruddy and Perry are all on the bench. So it's a strong-looking Wolves team. It's not necessarily exactly full strength. You know, Ruben Neves not making the side. Adama Traore has been playing so well recently, not in the side either, but you can't deny that is a strong team. Man United, uh, probably not quite so much on paper. And they're against Partizan Belgrade tonight, remember, who are currently top of Man United's group. Here's the United team, Sergio Romero in goal. And significantly, it looks like Ole Gunnar Solskjaer are sticking with the back three system that worked pretty well against Liverpool on Sunday. Phil Jones gets a start. By my reckoning, that's his first of the season. Harry Maguire plays, as does Marcus Rojo. Aaron Wan-Bissaka at right wing back. It looks like Brandon Williams, the youngster, gets a start on the left. Scott McTominay, Juan Mata and Jesse Lingard in the midfield three uh, with James Garner and Anthony Martial pushing further forward. So it's an exciting looking United team. Seven changes I make from uh, the Liverpool game on Sunday in total. On the bench, you've got Lee Grant, Victor Lindelof, Fred, Pereira, Dan James, uh, uh, Mason Greenwood and Marcus Rashford. So uh, some good options there for Ole Gunnar Solskjaer if he needs them in Serbia. But it'll be a couple of tough trips for the English teams tonight, you'd have thought. No easy games in that part of Eastern Europe. Liverpool, of course, found that out about Red Star Belgrade last season, losing there in the group stage before going on to win the Champions League. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how those games go. They kick off at 5-6, to six, remember. So we'll have plenty of updates for you on those once they get underway. 
I wanted to talk just quickly about Man United and their striker options, though. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer has been asked about the rumours linking Man United to Harry Kane, how much they've come from Roy Keane, saying, just go and get Kane on Sunday or the <laughs> Sunday before. Ah, he loves that, doesn't he? I'm not sure. But this is what Ole Gunnar Solskjaer had to say about those rumours. you got the Lewandowski's and the Harry Kane's, like the Alan Shearer's, uh, Ruud van Nistelrooy, fantastic goal scorers. Ours are different types of players, but uh, I do have... Uh, I have to say I like uh, someone who can finish a, finish a, a half a chance and he does that. Manchester United need a striker. There's no two ways Fact. about that. Fact. Bang. And they're being linked with a few. One who's been kicking around for a while is Mario Mandzukic. Mm. We've heard in the last week or so that he is very generously willing offered, to slum it. <laughs> offered to <laughs> slash his wage demands in half from a measly 300 grand a week to an even more measly 150,000 pounds a week. Mario, my heart bleeds for you. Man of the people. Mandzukic of the people. Very good. He, he is one option and there's pedigree there. He has played for Juventus. He's played for Bayern Munich. He scored a bicycle kick from 20 yards in a Champions League final. He scored an own goal, much to my delight, in a World Cup final. This is a guy who has been there and done it all, but he is 33. And you just think, well, are you solving a problem there? There is another option. Roy Keane has mentioned him. Harry Kane. Come on, guy. We're not, we're not just waiting for you. We've got to hear it. You got you got to hear Roy Keane demanding the Man United. No, I don't want you okay. to play a clip, guy. All oh, right, I want your own brilliance. He was doing the crossword then, wasn't he? <laughs> Just go and get him. Hey, <laughs> there it is. Go and get Kane. What y'all staring for? Very good. <laughs> That's really good. Well worth the really wait. Good. Obviously, despite Guy Watts' brilliance. It's not that straightforward. No. It's not a case of just go and get him. Even if Tottenham would conscience selling their best player to a rival, which I don't think they will, you're surely looking at 200 million quid. There is then the question of whether Kane would even want to go. Mm. Would he be a good signing? And your third choice, who the fans are certainly keen mm. on, a certain Mr. Erling Haaland, who is setting the world alight in the Champions League. 19 years old. He's worked with Oli in the past. Are any of those three the answer to lead the line for United? I think Kane is the one that sticks out, definitely. Mandzukic, I can understand because of the name, because of the experience that he's got, and whether that would be a short-term fix, whether that would buy Oli time to be able to build or rebuild Manchester United how he wants to do it. If he suddenly came in and they then hurtled into the top four, then that would be deemed a success. You, you don't buy a player like Mandzukic at his age for a sell-on um, profit you look at him what can he do for us between now and the next within the next couple of years that's what you buy him for with Kane you would uh, invest in the England captain you would invest in someone that we know obviously scores goals in the Premier League over the course of several seasons has really come up to the standards that he's set and maybe just maybe needs a, a fresh tickle at a career that is in a place with Spurs where you, you sense a few of them may be going their separate ways in the not too uh, distant future but the, when you talk about the kind of player that they need it, it's great to, to talk about it philosophically it's great to talk about it in the sense of will they fit the United remit etc 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 if the United remit means that they finish in the bottom half of the Premier League because of um uh, because of how they're fed over the course of a season, then uh, that I mean it becomes a complete misnomer. Then you get someone in that scores goals. Kane scores goals. With respect to Manchester United, mm. is Harry Kane not a bit good for them? I think he is, but th there's what they need to keep hold of Manchester United. What they need to make sure that they don't come too far away from is the mystique of that club. The, there's a generation of of, of Younger football fans that look at it now and think, well, well, obviously since Sir Alex left, it was it's it's meandered and, it, and it's gone wherever. But you look at what that place has won in the past, what it's capable of when it gets ready, when it gets itself right. That's a club that would attract somebody like Harry Kane because as much as we laud Tottenham for coming forward and, and progressing and Maurizio Pochettino for what he's done and he's re and he really has built that club in his image. Th there's the silverware perhaps for the standard of players isn't there. And if he goes to Manchester United, that that's always the carrot with a player such as him, the challenge. Go to Manchester United, lead the line, get them back to the top of, the, of English football. That's when you sealed your legacy. I mean, the Tottenham fans may absolutely detest you for doing that. And as you say, I can't, why should I can't, they? How could they? But I can't see Levy going, 
Yeah, of course we'll sell him to Manchester United. Mm. He would drive, I mean, the hardest of hard bargains. Yeah, if oh, he, no, if that he, was he would take them for all that they are worth. Mm. But I think there's also, beyond the challenge, which you're right to point out, there's a compelling narrative there for Kane, which is what always gets thrown at Alan Shearer, mm. the great one-club man for the struggling, decent side, is what would have happened if you'd gone to United? Mm-hmm. What would you have scored? What would you have won? Harry Kane can be Alan Shearer mm. if Shearer had got that move. And I think that is going to be an exciting prospect for him. We've got lots to come right here on Posh Boys on Love Sport Drive. Coming up next, we're going to be talking to a German football expert. Could Jose be off to Dortmund? Giving your team a voice. Love Sport Radio. Full of skill. Full of flair. Full of desire. Fulham FC is full of fire. Oh, what a goal! Be there at Craven Cottage as Fulham continue their surge towards the top of the Skybet Championship. Watch the unmissable action live in SW6, home of London's original football club. Absolutely brilliant. Grab your tickets now at FulhamFC.com. You all right, mate? Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah? Mm, really? It's just there's a massive grizzly bear sitting on you. You sure you're OK? Well, now that you mention it. Sometimes we say we're fine when we're not. But with one in four experiencing a mental health problem, if your mate says he's fine, he might not be. Be in your mate's corner and ask twice. Time to change. Hi, I'm Barry. I'm a retired school bursar from Chingford. I thought I was paying too much for my energy and went on to a spokesman and found that uh, I could reduce my costs overall by £568 per annum and I'm very grateful for that help. With a spokesman said.com, fighting for you, saving you money. If you're driving on a motorway and you see a red X sign overhead, you need to change lanes safely. Driving in a red X lane is an offence. Red X's are there for a reason, to protect you and others from danger. The lane may be blocked by a broken down vehicle, or road workers, or the lane may be needed for the emergency services. So if you see a red X, change lanes safely. Highways England, connecting the country. I'm not a snob. I just don't want to be in the same car as my chauffeur. This is Love Sport. It's the Posh Boys on Love Sport Drive with potentially a real blockbuster of a managerial move. We're hearing Jose Mourinho to Borussia Dortmund is a possibility. It doesn't seem like a particularly Dortmund manoeuvre, but it's easy to see why it would appeal to a certain Mr Mourinho. Absolutely, and why it would appeal to... uh, If you're the powers that be and you get a CV dropped through into your inbox... And it shows a serial winner across Europe, a man that can put teams together to stifle, uh, to suppress the opposition, that can uh, churn out trophies, churn out results. Then you would, you'd, there'd be so many boxes that you go, yes, tick, 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 that's fantastic, that's fantastic. And then you'd look, oh, it's Jose, what's the perception of him now? Does it go against our youthful, effervescent, forward thinking approach? Does it entertain the fans? because they're very much the fans and the team and the club are very much one at Dortmund, aren't they? And that's probably where the question marks would come into it. I think I'm still very much a, a fan of Jose Mourinho, what he brings to uh, a football club when he's fit, firing at his charismatic self. But I understand why perhaps with uh, the quantum leap that we've seen in not only results, but also performance levels uh, from the likes of Manchester City, from uh, Liverpool, from teams, I mean, such as Ajax, uh, when you talk, when you dip your toe into Europe, that uh, there's it's no it's no accepted uh, form of of um, way of thinking that just because you're successful you should shut up. You need to be attractive as well at a certain level, and I think that's what that's the kind of grey area that we find Mourinho in at this very moment in time. Above all else, Jose is fueled by ego isn't he? Let's Mm. be honest. He wants to be the greatest. He is the man who came out with the iconic quote, I believe I am the special one. And then instantly backed it up. And then, well, yeah, I'm not not saying he Mm. isn't, but there will be an appeal for him of being the first manager to conquer England, to conquer Spain, to conquer Italy, 
and to conquer Germany, mm. then all he'd have to do is one kind of perfunctory year at Paris Saint-Germain <laughs> and he'd have done every top mm. five league in Europe. That Dortmund team, as you mentioned earlier, he doesn't traditionally work with youngsters. That's not what he's interested doesn't in seem doing. Doesn't have the patience, does he? No, he's not no. a manager who likes bringing kids through. But some of those Dortmund youngsters aren't really kids. Jaden Sancho doesn't fall into that no. category. He is 19, but he is also a ready-made performer. Mm. Jose Mourinho would surely look at the state of that team at the moment, recognise there is very definitely work to be done, and he would relish building the defence up to being more robust than a broken sieve. <laughs> but he also will think he can do it. He can do it within a couple of years. And with respect to the Bundesliga, if you can topple Bayern Munich, if you can keep Borussia Mönchengladbach at the moment down on their luck, you would have a chance, surely. Well, of course you would. And I think you look at the, the broad spectrum of what his career has been, where he's been, what he's won, the, the, the amount of time that he's managed to be um, in professional football as a manager... <laughs> right from the turn of the of the century at 56 years old can you i mean i'm sure that somewhere like dortmund would really kind of set the fire burning once again do you i mean yes we love watching him on tv yes he brings a real uh, charisma and, and gravity to what he says with regard to how football deconstructed into its minutiae of, of uh, from a tactical point of view we're, we're fascinated to hear but when we look at Klopp and, and when we look at him at Dortmund and how they fed off each other, the, the crowd and the manager. When we look at Mourinho when he first came into the scene, legging it down the touchline at Old Trafford, that was the very that was the very blueprint for a, a manager such as that. That charisma, that energy, the effervescence. Maybe going to somewhere like this, maybe looking at it as one of his last couple of jobs in professional management before he went off and did a, a national side. Maybe that is just a place that gives him the energy to rekindle the spark that we know he's got. I think that's absolutely right, and headlines do follow him everywhere. We're joined on the line now by Ronan Murphy, who's a German football expert. Good afternoon, Ronan. What would make the Dortmund job appealing from Mourinho's point of view? I think if they were called Bayern Munich, maybe it might be the, <laughs> the, the main thing to get him through the door, because uh, I think Mourinho seems to be the kind of guy that wants to win. And he wants to fight. He's taken this long out to look for maybe a team that are going to win. And I'm not sure Borussia Dortmund are a team that are going to end. They are the team that are going to end Bayern Munich's kind of hegemony in in the Bundesliga. So I think maybe the Bayern Munich job might be more suited to him. But I suppose the longer he's out of football, the more likely he is maybe to take a job. And Borussia Dortmund, they are a big European team. And they, if anyone's going to challenge Bayern, maybe it will be them. Is this where we look at? Uh, Ronan, from the point of view of it being a perception element, or we we talk nowadays about football, about the ways that um, managers are, are supposed to win football matches instead of them just winning football matches. Mourinho's answer to all of his critics will be ever be those won't it? Look at what I've won. These are the trophies that I've got. Ninety nine percent of coaches across world football would kill for that type of CV. Now, is he unfairly damned by the success that he's had in the past and the way that he's got gone about it? I think I think you could be right, uh, and I think maybe that particular style, the, the defensive approach, the, uh, the that mindset that he has, a pragmatic mindset to to win trophies and win at all costs, and it doesn't matter if we haven't had more possession or more attacks, we we got the result. I think maybe that is something that would fit with Borussia Dortmund at the moment, because there's a, been a lot of talk in the last few weeks of the, not having the right mentality to hold on to leads, because three weeks in a row they were winning two one and let that slip and ended up with two all draws maybe he's the, the man to come in and, and and change that kind of mindset that they have and improve their mentality and make them into a team of winners. Ronan, great to chat to you. Thank you for your time. Ronan Murphy there, German football expert, clearly enjoying himself. <laughs> there has been chat about Dortmund, not just from the point of view of Mourinho, but the point of view of Jadon Sancho, the current Dortmund assistant coach, has said Sancho shouldn't go back to Liverpool shouldn't go back to England at all, rather. Shouldn't go to Liverpool or Manchester United. He needs to stay and develop in Germany. Do you think that's true? Well, it's done him the world of good so far, hasn't it? Albeit um, his tardiness needs working on, which is ironic that um, when we talk about <laughs> the Teutonic approach to um, engineering, that uh, <laughs> timekeeping is not high on his agenda over there. 
Um, I can understand exactly what they're saying. You've got to be able to emphasise and advertise your brand as perhaps being the best one. We 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 can we can get a little bit um, stubborn about England and English football being the very best place for these players to be, but he's he's shown that he's he's got the ability, the cultural broad mindedness to go out there and, and achieve something for himself, and he's he's done pretty well so far. I hope he never comes back to England. <laughs> Genuinely, I hope he goes Dortmund. Bayern Munich, Real Madrid, never bothers with any of that Premier League rubbish. Lots still to come on Posh Boys on Drive. Love sports. You all right, mate? Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah? Mm, really? It's just, there's a massive grizzly bear sitting on you. You sure you're okay? Well, now that you mention it, sometimes we say we're fine when we're not. But with one in four experiencing a mental health problem, if your mate says he's fine, he might not be. Be in your mate's corner and ask twice. Time to change. Full of skill, full of flair, full of desire. Fulham FC is full of fire. Oh, what a goal! Be there at Craven Cottage as Fulham continue their surge towards the top of the Skybet Championship. Watch the unmissable action live in SW6, home of London's original football club. Absolutely brilliant. Grab your tickets now at FulhamFC.com. Hi. I'm Dean. I work for a successful shipping company in Suffolk. Ever since I heard about people's success with thespokesmansaid.com, I knew I had to investigate for myself. Every time I need to compare car insurance, home insurance and energy bills, I always contact thespokesmansaid.com. This year alone, I saved over £260 on my car insurance and also £585 on my energy bills. I saved big through thespokesmansaid.com. And you could too. With a spokesman said.com. Fighting for you, saving you money. My mum and dad say that I don't need lots of sugar. I'm sweet enough already. So we use the Change for Life Food Scanner app to find out how much sugar is in our food and drink. It's surprising how much we found. So I put my detective hat on to find the healthier choices. <coughs> Woohoo! Found one, Mum! You can be food smart too. Download the free Change for Life Food Scanner app today. We've got a top class hour coming for you here on Posh Boys on Love Sport Drive. Of course, we're talking England, a Rugby World Cup semi final coming up. We're going to be joined by former England hooker George Shooter to get his thoughts. Also, talking to a Norwegian football expert. Just how good is Erling Haaland and could he be off to Manchester United? First of all, it's time for all your latest headlines. On digital radio, online, mobile and smart speaker. This is Love Sport News. From the Sky News Centre at five, some breaking news. The Prime Minister is going to put a motion to MPs on Monday proposing to hold a general election. Boris Johnson's previously said that what he would do if the European Union grants the UK another Brexit extension. There are a couple of ways he can do it, but one means he'd need two-thirds of the Commons to back us going to the polls. Our political editor is Beth Rigby. So it's not nailed on, uh, and the reason it isn't is that Boris Johnson might want that election, but uh, Jeremy Corbyn has made it very clear uh, that he will not have that election. He will not hold it. He will not allow it until he's absolutely sure that any risk of no deal is ruled out. Police investigating the deaths of 39 people found in the back of a lorry in Essex have been given extra time to question the driver. A 25-year-old man from Northern Ireland has been arrested on suspicion of murder. The Chinese nationals were discovered in the vehicle in Greys yesterday. Lorry driver Graham Westmoreland says containers need better security checks at ports. When you're going through the scanners, they put a probe in to try and detect humans and they seem to just get through. The sealed at the point of loading, that seal's checked at various points. If it's still attached in good condition, don't raise any suspicions. A 25-year-old Polish man will appear in court on Wednesday after being charged with the rape and murder of Libby Squire. The disappearance of the Hull University student in February prompted a widespread search. 
The family of the teenager who was killed in a crash in Northamptonshire is taking legal action against the Foreign Office. The US woman involved claimed diplomatic immunity and fled the UK. The owner of the Rubik's Cube has lost the right to an EU trademark. It was given one for the shape of the classic multicoloured puzzle game in 1999, but it was then withdrawn in 2017. And in football, tonight's Europa League football gets underway later this hour. Manchester United are at Partizan Belgrade, Rangers take on Porto and Wolves play Slovan Bratislava. That's the latest. I'm Will Rowe. Love Sport Radio, on digital radio, online, mobile and smart speaker. This is the Posh Boys on Love Sport Drive. Good evening, you're listening to the Posh Boys on Love Sport Drive. That's me, Johnny Burrow, Guy Watts and our special guest, David Prutton, former Nottingham Forest and Southampton midfielder. Your top stories this evening. George Ford has been brought back into the England team for Saturday's Rugby World Cup semi-final against New Zealand. He replaces Henry Slade in England's only change from the quarter-final win against Australia. And Manchester United fans are urging the club to sign Erling Haaland. But Ole Gunnar Solskjaer sounds keen on Harry Kane. And Conor McGregor is returning to MMA in January. Oh, good. David Prutton, we are under 48 hours away from a World Cup semi-final in which England are taking on the All Blacks. How excited are you? I'm ecstatically excited. It should be a fantastic game, shouldn't it? It's a real... Coming together of, Eddie Jones called them the greatest team in the history of team sports, the All Blacks. Um, so it's one hell of a, of a kind of way to approach a game, big in the opposition up. Yes, he's piled all the pressure onto New Zealand with his quotes running up to the game. Yes, he's very much put England as underdogs. But I'm just fascinated to see the way tactically it pans out, the fact that he's got a squad that he's incredibly proud of, he's incredibly happy with, picks the perceived right team for the individual games and just intrigued to see that when it starts on Saturday whether the build up whether he's got it absolutely spot on and we'll know quite early on in the game won't we I think we can do the business we're joined on the line by George Shooter former England hooker who played in the 2007 World Cup final good evening George thanks for joining us just one change for England forward in for Slade are you surprised uh, you know what, I'm, I've sort of given up being surprised by Eddie Jones' selections now. Uh, I, I, I guess I was. I was expecting them to stick with the uh, quarterfinal team that played so well against Australia. But I guess uh, Eddie Jones sees it as uh, a bit of horses for courses and uh, he thinks George Ford will be a better bet than Farrell at 10. And, you know, uh, who, 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 who am I to argue with him at the moment? <laughs> what will that Ford-Farrell combination give us? Why is it that that Eddie Jones has gone for? I don't really know, to be honest. Um, it, it, it does baffle me. I think England tend to play the, the same way, regardless of who's at 10. Um, so there'll be a fair amount of kicking um, from hand and, and tactical kicking. Uh, I guess Owen Farrell is pretty much indispensable because of his goal kicker. Well, that way forward's a very good goal kicker. He's not quite at the same sort of level as Owen Farrell at the moment. So. Uh, I guess he, he has to play for that point of view. Uh, I guess it could be an element of Henry Slade not quite being fit, and you don't want to go into a game against New Zealand with with a, a sort of a, an injury doubt over someone in the team. So they, these, I mean, I'm speculating a bit here, but uh, I, I think we'll, we'll see England play fairly similar. They'll, they'll put pressure on the All Blacks. They'll pl- make them play from their own third. Uh, it will just be uh, George Ford kicking the ball rather than Owen Farrell. I think. George, are we looking at a team? And are we happy with the fact that uh, uh, there's a squad here that's happy that changes are going to be made for the sp- specific games with the greater good of the World Cup in mind? W- will the players individually be happy with that? Because collectively, that's how strong they're going to be, isn't it? Uh, sticking together. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's difficult for, for an old dinosaur like me to sort of get my head around it a bit. Um, the, the, the way the game is played now, Eddie, Eddie Jones famously on TV uh, the other week was uh, telling everyone to drag themselves in the 21st century and all that sort of stuff. It's a 23-man game. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, it is. There's no doubt about that. But 
I think you still got to start games well. It's it's very difficult to have these finishers on the bench if you start the game poorly because then you're you're probably asking them to do too much in the last 20 minutes, half an hour or so. So I'm still a believer that you've got to pick your your best team to start the game. Um, now, of course, I understand that as in some games that with the way the way it sort of ebbs and flows, you can always uh, it's always handy to have these guys on the bench as finishers to come on, but. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it's uh, it's a little bit of a gamble, I think, um, and um, yeah, I'm sure, or sure the players buy into it as part of the team ethos. You've got to, you've got to accept, okay, I'm not in the not in the starting fifteen, but I'm in the twenty three. I've got a role to play when I come on. Um, but yeah, it just it, it seems to me strange to say that when I mean, sometimes you, you see guys on the bench who don't get on until the last five minutes, and that will yeah, that, that's not that's not a finisher. That's just somebody who's not quite as good as a bloke starting, from my mind. New Zealand have sprung a bit of a surprise on us yeah. by dropping Sam Kane for Scott Barrett. That is obviously a decision taken with the line out in mind. Is ours going to be vulnerable like it was last year? And is that change going to work for the All Blacks? Yeah, I, actually, I think that's a bigger a bigger shock for me in, in a way than the, than the Farrell Ford uh, Slade sort of um, decision. I, I think Sam Kane's one of the best open sides in the world. He's, he's maybe not play to the very, very heights of his best game, but New Zealand traditionally do like to play with that out-and-out out seven at uh, seven in, in the mould of, uh, obviously, Richard McCaw or, or before him, Cronfeld and Michael Jones going back a few years now. Um, but, yeah, th- th- they've obviously targeted the line-out as either a weakness on their point or somewhere they can get stuck into England. I think it's probably Sam Kane is a slightly weaker line-out forward than certainly, certainly than Scott Barrett, but... Uh, I guess that's that's an area they've targeted. There's not going to be many areas where either team's going to have uh, any sort of dominance, really. So I guess it's, if it's a case of uh, that one or two percent extra from Scott Barrett that you wouldn't get from Sam Kane in the lineout could make a difference. Then then that sort of uh, that's, uh, that that would be the the reason, I'd guess. But interesting selection. I mean, Scott Barrett's a fantastic player. Don't get me wrong, and Ardi Sevilla is a uh, more than capable replacement at seven, but uh, that was a big surprise for me. Yeah, and George, not just the lineup, but the breakdown impact that's going to have yeah. with Curry and Underhill in the form they're in to pick one out and out flanker. I, I think you know Steve Hansen obviously knows a hell of a lot more about rugby than uh, yeah. than I do, but I, I look at that and I think that looks like a fairly obvious way that he's given us an upper hand and one mm. that Curry and Underhill and Eddie Jones as well are going to be looking at and sort of rubbing their hands with glee a little bit. Yeah, well, I, I would have thought so. I think having two sevens in our back row um, gives us a potentially gives us an edge in terms of getting to the breakdown first. And, and you know, I, I, I said Scott Barrett's a fantastic player, but I think over the ground he's probably not as quick as uh, either Curry or Underhill. So there is that element. I think whether England can capitalise on that or not, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> you have to bear in mind that most of the All Black three quarters can ruck pretty well. So they don't necessarily need a seven to be first to the ball. Um, the two centres, then a Brown and Goody and uh, all those sort of guys, that they're they're pretty they're pretty tough uh, tough around the breakdown as well. So maybe they're banking on that. Maybe they're banking on beating into the breakdown by just the nearest person doing the job of the the you know, sort of classic seven, and then you've got another bigger ball carrier coming around the corner in the shape of uh, uh, Barrett. Um, yeah, again, it's all speculation really, but I guess there's there's a, there's a grand plan there, as you say. Steve Hansen uh, has coached a lot of rugby and uh, has two World Cups in his locker that we don't have. So um, yeah, I, I guess I'll take it, I'll take his word for it. George, what's your take on Eddie's approach in the course and the build-up to the game? He's not exactly been a shrinking violet, has he? He's gone all guns blazing with regard to the mental side of the game. Has he played it just right, do you feel? Oh, yeah, I think so. I mean, he, he, does, he, he can be, get a bit carried away. I think when people like Michael Checker are, are, are on the other side of the uh, table, it, it sort of rolls him up even more. I think Steve Hansen and the Kiwi coaches are a bit more sort of savvy and a bit, probably actually a bit calmer, a bit cooler-headed than than someone like Checker. So perhaps uh, Eddie Jones doesn't get the same sort of rise out of them as he would have other people. But, yeah, it, it's a big part of his armoury. He, he, he loves it. I don't know I don't really know how the squad feel. I guess the squad just sort of take it as, as you know, that, that's what Eddie does. Um, but he does seem to he does seem to have praised the All Blacks and, and praised England with, with sort of equal equal amounts. So uh, I, guess, I guess we'll find out uh, Saturday evening whether he's got it right or not. George, David Prutton, who sits alongside me, has got a serious vested interest in the result of Wales versus South Africa because he's going to be at the Cardiff Swansea game at 12 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. So he's going to have a load of drunk Welsh fans, whatever <laughs> happens. He's just going to be hoping they're in a good yeah. mood. What do you think is going to happen in that game? Uh, yeah, I, I, I just think South Africa is slightly too good at the moment and certainly in attack. Uh, the Welsh are, Welsh are a fantastic team. They're, they've been scrapping hard, uh, well, for, for for 18 months or so. They really do play hard for each other, and uh, and they've they've dragged themselves out of some holes, none more so than last week with 
the help of the French second round. But I, I just think South Africa, uh, first year for South Africa, a lot better team than the French. And, uh, and France had uh, Wales in some problems early on. Uh, and secondly, I think the front fives don't match up very well for Wales. I think the front five South, South Africa has got, um, or potentially got, I've not seen the team actually, um, I don't think it's been announced yet, but I think the front five is just a key area where, where South, South Africa got a significant edge and potentially a little bit in the back row. Uh, you, you know, there's some, Tipperick is a, is a fantastic player. I think they'll look, the loss of Navidi will be quite significant. Um, but I, I just think South Africa across the park match up slightly better and uh, I, just, I just have a feeling that they're, that they're sort of going to click a bit more than, uh, than Wales. And Wales need to really, really put some uh, tack together, which we haven't seen too much of in the World Cup. Just finally, George, it's the biggest question of all. Who's going to be in the final? Who is going to win it? <laughs> uh, well, I would love to say England will be in the final, but I, I predicted about eight weeks ago, ten weeks ago, that it would be a South African-New Zealand final. Uh, so I'm going to stick by that, unfortunately. So sorry, sorry, England. Oh, good man. George, great to chat to you. Thank you for your time. George Shooter there, former England hooker who played in the 2007 World Cup final. We're hoping we can get into another one. And Eddie Jones will be critical to that hope. Let's hear from him now. Yeah, well, he was asked in his press conference earlier. He's done so many of these this week. I don't think a coach normally has to do this many. I think Eddie's chosen to do this many. He was asked, I believe, by Kiwi journalists about that accusation of spying that you may recall. He launched New Zealand's way a couple of days ago. Here's what he had to say. We definitely saw someone, and the, there was never an accusation that it was New Zealand. So it's not mind games? Uh, well, what do you define as mind games? Maybe this is sort of talk that we're having right now. Okay, then we're having mind games. <laughs> <laughs> what do you f- define as mind games is a question that is itself mind games. <laughs> it's superbly vague, isn't it? Yeah. You can't have probably a normal conversation with Eddie Jones, can you? He's probably the sort of bloke that's trying to do some sort of analysis on you just in the way you say good morning to him over the hotel buffet or something like that, isn't it? He? he just never stops. People talk about getting emails from him at four in the morning. He literally almost never sleeps. He's crazy. Imagine but trying to live with him, though. Like, what do you I'd want rather for, not. What, what do you want <laughs> wow. for your dinner, Eddie? I don't know, mate. <laughs> you, you tell me. <laughs> yeah, uh, what, what's dinner? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's it's a meal that is traditionally eaten between the hours of six and nine in the evening. Right, it's just a nightmare. Dinner, then. Yeah, well, they said well, dinner. We're yeah. having dinner. But the, the thing is, we mentioned this earlier. Yeah, he didn't even actually accuse New Zealand of doing the spying. He just said, someone's been spying. And, of course, that makes everyone think he's accusing New Zealand. New Zealand get defensive. The New Zealand media and maybe people in their own camp get defensive. Oh, no, we did, definitely didn't. You start to deny it and look defensive. And suddenly Eddie Jones has kind of created a fire without even really needing a spark. He's just thrown something in there and walked away and stood there laughing. And I think you've got to applaud someone. And he was described yesterday in one of the papers by uh, as being like the, uh, the Sir Alex Ferguson of rugby. And I think you can see that because although Steve Hansen hasn't come out and bitten every you know bit of bait that he's been thro- that he's had thrown this way he's nibbled a little bit and Michael Checker certainly did the week before and I don't think you could deny that played some part in England winning the quarter final I'd love to see it I know that rugby you don't typically associate with this but I think it makes a nice change and I like that England have the coaches doing it <laughs> we believe you guys fine <laughs> I think you're absolutely right it's you can you can hear him smiling when he talks that's the great thing about it Eddie Jones it's, it's fantastic and he, he's, he, he drops the little seed and, and he's willing everyone else around and the media love it they love sitting there yes we spoke earlier on about the comparisons with the uh, coach of the national side uh, from a footballing point of view Gareth Southgate and it all seems very kind of reverential and it's all very um, nice and, and, and there's nothing you can't with the greatest respect to him, you can't really think that the journalists are sat there on the edge of the seats waiting for the next thing to come out. Whereas they're, they're going in with Eddie Jones, going, "Come on, he's going to say something. He's going to say something." And, and they're more than willing to be active participants in the pantomime that is the mind games running up to the game. And sorry, just Johnny to give everyone a reminder of what that team is in full for the game on Saturday morning. It is just one change. So Elliot Daly at fullback, Johnny May past fit to play and Anthony Watson on the wings, Manu Tuolangi and Owen Farrell captaining the side in the centres and George Ford at 10, Ben Youngs at scrum half, Maka Vunapola, Jamie George and Carl Sinclair make up the front row, Maro Itoje and Courtney Laws in the second row. Some expected George Cruz to start, but Laws keeps his place. And then Tom Curry and Sam Underhill, the kamikaze kids are on the flanks and Billy Vunapola, of course, at number eight. There's no place on the bench. I think this is a little bit significant for Jack Knoll, who we think wasn't quite fit enough 
to make the bench, which is a real shame, not just because he's a brilliant player, but also because it leaves Slade and Joseph being forced to cover the back three positions, which is not their natural position. And especially with that little bit of an injury doubt over Johnny May, I just hope that that doesn't flare up, that we don't need to play someone slightly out of position for any large chunk of the match against, realistically, the best team in the world. But the best team in the world has sprung a selection surprise of their own, as George was talking about just then. Uh, Scott Barrett coming into the back row at the expense of Sam Kane, which I have to say caught a lot of us by surprise. It's a big call. It could pay off. It could backfire. But it will be definitely worth watching on Saturday morning. It's coming home. I've told you before. I will tell you again. It is coming home. And coming up, we're talking the Ox. Believe me. He who laughs last thinks slowest. Ha ha ha, see that was a laugh because I'm clever enough. This is Love Sport. You alright mate? Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah? Mm, really? It's just, there's a massive grizzly bear sitting on you. You sure you're okay? Well, now that you mention it. Sometimes we say we're fine when we're not. But with one in four experiencing a mental health problem, if your mate says he's fine, he might not be. Be in your mate's corner and ask twice. Time to change. Full of skill. Full of flair. Full of desire. Fulham FC is full of fire. Oh, what a goal! Be there at Craven Cottage as Fulham continue their surge towards the top of the Skybet Championship. Watch the unmissable action live in SW6, home of London's original football club. Absolutely brilliant. Grab your tickets now at FulhamFC.com. Hi, my name's Bob. I'm a retired civil servant from Durham. I used the advice that a spokesman said gave me to haggle with Sky to reduce my monthly payments from £86 per month to £43 per month, which was a saving of £774 over the 18-month contract. A nice little result, if I say so myself, but it was only due to a spokesman said on his brilliant advice that I was able to do a deal for the new contract. With a spokesman said.com, fighting for you, saving you money. Making small changes to your lifestyle could improve your chances of staying healthier longer. Start now by taking our free How Are You quiz. Just search One You. Driving too close to the car in front gives you less time to react. You may not realize that you're tailgating. Leave a two second gap between you and the vehicle in front. When it's wet, leave a four second gap. By staying back, you give yourself time to react. Stay safe. Stay back. Highways England, connecting the country. Love sports. We've got some big breaking political news. Prime Minister Boris Johnson has tabled a motion for the House of Commons to vote on whether to hold a general election before Christmas. They'll vote on Monday. That proposed date is the 12th of December. It comes because we're expecting the EU to grant an extension to his 31st of October deadline. You were never going to pull that one off, Sunshine, even though he, and I quote, really did not want one. He's been asked whether under his latest proposals, MP would have long enough to scrutinise the new Brexit deal. This is what he had to say. We're going to give them uh, all the time they want between now and the dissolution of Parliament uh, to do that scrutiny. And that's much more than I think that, that some of them have been asking for. I mean, that's more, I think, than, uh, than Philip uh, Hamm was asking for. This is a, a, a big chunk of time. And it's interesting, actually, in the debate on Tuesday about Brexit, everybody said we need more time to study this, this deal. Actually, uh, the Labour Party couldn't even find enough speakers. They ran out of speakers, let alone uh, new ideas to bring to the table. We've had three and a half years to discuss this. We're being very, very reasonable. We're saying, uh, if you genuinely mo want more time, you can have it. Here it is. But the, the condition for that is that we all agree to go uh, for a general election on December the 12th. And the reason for having that, that deadline is because otherwise... I don't think the people of this country are going to believe that Parliament is really going to do it by that deadline. Because they spent three and a half years failing to do it. So let's get it done and let's come out of the EU. John, are you shaking your head? Yeah, I am shaking my head. Why are you surprised? I'm not. I just... Give me some more context. Well, I'll give you some context. Boris Johnson... When he he's unelected, remember, and when he came and took over as prime minister, the whole premise of his premiership was that he was going to get us out 
on or by the 31st of October. That was the point. He's now not going to do it. He's already tried to call an early general election twice. Jeremy Corbyn and the Labour Party aren't nibbling. I think they've got to this time. Jeremy Corbyn has spent quite literally years going, let's have a general election. Give me a general election. Mm. Give me a chance to compete. He's been offered that opportunity twice and he has basically cowered away from it, probably sensibly from a political point of view, because there is no point agreeing to a general election he doesn't believe he can win. But the interesting question will be how the Tory party, how Boris Johnson are viewed if they miss that 31st of October deadline, because he has tried every trick in the book to get that across the line. He's tried the prorogation of Parliament. He's tried redressing, tarting up Theresa May's deal. Every single thing he could have gone for, he has given it a go. And his staunch supporters, staunch believers, have always said Boris Johnson is a man of action. Boris Johnson gets things done and he's going to get this through and get us out of the European Union. I'm sorry, if he doesn't do that, I don't see how we can have faith in him as the leader who's going to do it. But equally, it's a sticky situation for the country because I don't personally believe that a Jeremy Corbyn prime ministership is quite what we need either. I don't think he is the man to get us out of the European Union. And if you elect elect Joe Swinson and the Lib Dems, they won't take us out of the European Union at all. And then all of those people who voted to leave, partly because they felt disenfranchised, not listened to in the first place, are going to feel even more that they're being ignored by the powers that be. It's a sticky situation. That's a good one. You've strode in here with purpose. I have, yeah, mainly because I want to move on, but I did just want to. <laughs> I think I had a shut huge, him up. Shut him up. Huge opinion on this. No, I, I did just want to give Johnny credit for that hilarious joke he just made. It, it, quite subtle, I admit. It would have taken a real political aficionado to get it, but what he said was if you elect Joe Swinson and the Lib Dems, <laughs> yeah, because, you know, like they're not actually ever going to get elected. It's not impossible. No, it's not physically impossible. I mean, they're on the ballot paper. The Monster Ravy Looney Party could be elected. You would be genuinely surprised how many traditional Labour voters will defect to the Lib Dems in the face of a general election because the Lib Dems are the only party who are openly saying we do not want Brexit to happen. And that's going to polarise. You're going to get a lot of people hating them. You're going to get a lot of people who are broadly left-wing going, hang on a minute. That is the party for me for now. That's true, yeah. Just in the same way that they stood up to abolishing tuition fees and all that kind of thing. They are a party of their word. Should we talk <laughs> about football? Please. Okay, there Far are a uh, Europa League games starting in around about half an hour's time. And, of course, there are a few British teams in action in those early kickoffs. Not least Manchester United and Wolverhampton Wanderers, who are both, it's fair to say, delicately poised within their Europa League groups. Not necessarily doing badly, but by no means running away with it. Arsenal, of course, rather better poised. They're six points from two games. They kick off at eight o'clock against Victoria Guimaraes. We'll have team news from that one later in the show. But I can bring you team news from Wolves and Man United's games just to remind you of what those teams are. A a pair of similar looking formations, I'd say, based on what I've seen so far. Man United sticking with three at the back after that game against Liverpool at the weekend. Romero in goal. Phil Jones gets a run out, a rare run out, it must be said. Harry Maguire and Marcus Rojo make up the back three. Aaron Wan-Bissaka and Brandon Williams, the youngster, are the wing backs. Scott McTominay, Juan Mata and James Garner, another youngster, look set to play in midfield. A great opportunity for James Garner, of course. And Lingard and Martial are going to be deployed in the role that Dan James and Marcus Rashford were on Sunday, it looks like. Young Jesse Lingard. Young Jesse Lingard, <laughs> indeed. Yeah, I mean, he, he can't be a day under 29 now, can he? <laughs> That, having that baby face really helps, doesn't it? It does. It well, does. The, what, the, what they need to do is the goodwill that they got from the game at the weekend. That's, I think, the baseline of what they need to carry on with regard to moving forward. Yes, it was a much improved performance. Yes, perhaps Liverpool didn't really reach the heights that we've become accustomed to over the course of this season. But going into a game this evening, it's it's got to be... It's got to be performance, it's got to be result, it's got to be Manchester United coming away from there with something um, tangible, really. And uh, would, would another nil-nil draw do that trick like they got <laughs> against AZ Alkmaar last time out away from home? Well, that, I mean, that was a funny one, though, wasn't it? Because it, it was... it was A good performance, said Oli. Yeah, it, and I, I mean, and good can be uh, taken in so many different ways. Um <laughs> Well, when you describe that game, as it, I think it redefined the world a little it bit. It did indeed. And But then it, it, it's any result, any performance, any kind of reflection on, on what he's seen has got to be parked very firmly in, in the in the 
uh, bracket marks PR exercise. You've got mm. to accentuate the positives. You've got to make sure that you come away with that with um, the belief, as they got from the Liverpool game, that they can compete not only in the Premier League but in Europe as well. And if you look at the team, it's reflective of who they've got at the disposal mm. at this very moment in time. So a good performance would, would a good result would be a point obviously anything above that would be fantastic Pass and Belgrade currently top the group of course only on goal difference but both teams with four points from two games from a United fans point of view good to see Brandon Williams get mm-hmm. another start James Garner as well he's not had too many to be 18 years old and be playing in the centre of midfield is a big big show Huge, of faith yeah. from the manager on the bench you've got of course the likes of Dan James Mason Greenwood Marcus Rashford all still youngsters Andreas Pereira not exactly old either Lindelof Fred and Lee Grant the other substitutes the Wolves team as well looks pretty strong to me Rui Patricio, Willie Bolly, and Max Kilman in the back three. Matt Doherty and Ruben Venegra are the wing backs. Roman Sice, Jean Moutinho, Morgan Gibbs White in midfield with Patrick Cutroni and Raul Jimenez up front. So that's five changes for them, seven changes for Man United, by the way. So I guess it's a reminder that Wolves have built a strong looking squad. It's not just a first team now in the way that maybe it was last season. He had yeah, 11 slash 14 players mm-hmm. that he would use near in week, near week in, week out. He did that for two seasons. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and it worked well. And you could argue that. You know, that change this season has made things a little bit more difficult but they've had more games to play with as well haven't they and that yeah. always makes things difficult and that's the test of the squad depth it's the test of what the manager can get out of uh, a slightly bigger group of players and, and maintain results and also performance obviously the the broader context of, of how that game is being played in the ground uh, they've kind of circumvented that empty stadium what do you make of that? it's bizarre isn't it because to, to, and so they've specifically given tickets to under 14s yeah. which they've sold about 200,000 well they've given them away <laughs> I believe but they've given away that many that suddenly it's now and um, well, they're smaller new, people aren't they you can get more of them in <laughs> but there's a really interesting definition here of a stadium ban yes. and of what a, what a person is what a spectator is if you're not an adult male you're not a spectator. What are you on about? You're not banned from the dads being there. <laughs> you're banned from anyone being in the stadium. Mm. If we're doing these bans, if we're taking it seriously, it makes them look ridiculous. Uh, and just a reminder, if you haven't seen the detail, the reason that Bratislava are facing a stadium ban is, surprise, surprise, for racist chance. So mm. if you're getting a stadium ban, as we know from UEFA, it normally takes not a first or necessarily even a second, but sometimes a third offence. So here they are having committed multiple offences that breach, you know, discriminatory staggering. rules. Absolutely and it, staggering. they're still going to have not quite necessarily a full fan base full of ultras or whatever, but they're, they're going to have people cheering them on, which entirely defeats the point of well, trying to play I behind t- closed t- doors. i tell you what will be really depressing is if we have a stadium full of under-14s and we still get racist chanting. And I'm only, half, I'm only half joking mm. here. If we think of racism as something which is environmental, and that you pick up from mm. those around you. If you are a big Sloven fan and your dad is a Sloven fan, I'm not saying mm. by any stretch of the imagination that they are all racist or they are all taking part in racist chanting. But if we have the kids there and we still get monkey noises, at that point, kick them out of Absolutely. the competition. Yeah. No, Absolutely. I think you're right, Johnny. But, you know, then again, well, I, I think it's right to criticise both UEFA for yet another, if you like, slightly lily-livered attempt at punishing a team or a player or whatever it might be, in this case a team, over racist matters. I think when you see the story that came out of that Liverpool game last night, of course, great news about Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain, but I think in some ways the story was that Divock Origi banner that had to be removed before kickoff. And, you know, I thought it was quite personal, given that article that I know both of us read, Johnny, for a Lyle Taylor interview in The Guardian the other day, where he was talking about racism and the plight it is on the game, the stain on the game as a whole. And, mm. you know, we can talk about Sofia, we can talk about Eastern Europe, and we should. But the idea that it is fine here is obviously, as anyone who you know is aware of other things that go on, is complete rubbish. And he said, I guarantee you, before the weekend is out, talking about this coming weekend, there'll be another story of it. And mm. lo and behold, almost that day or the day after, we had a story of an English fan base doing something you know, along those lines. Not necessarily, you could argue, as bad, but ultimately but them saying it comes oh, it's under a joke. Yeah, oh, it's a joke, isn't it? But it, it, it opens a door to... And, and it is a... It is a it's not, it's not the straightest of lines between that banner and and what we're hearing around. Not for, I was going to say Europe, but on our own shores mm-hmm. as well. But it, idiots don't need much. No, that, that small crack in the door where that little shaft of bigoted light comes through. They don't need any more than that. Well, that, well, they've said it, so it's absolutely mm-hmm. fine. Yeah. It, it's not even, it's not even a justification because these morons don't need justification. They just think that way. But that backs up that 
in inverted commas, funny stereotype that then people like that think that that informs their decision to crack on doing what they do, which is disgusting. I think that, uh, uh, look, it's of such complex matter, but I think you say they're morons, and of course they are to have those views in a way, but I think to sort of assume that anyone who does this sort of abuse, who's guilty of it, is just completely thick and doesn't get it. I looked at those Bulgaria fans mm. last week, and I think you could see they get the it. enjoyment that they were getting out of deliberately flouting oh, rules. I'm, out do, of do it, I'm, not, do it, I'm not for one second saying it, it's it's from the point of view of an intelligence. I mean, I mean, maybe the, the definition definition of moron means that I'm using that word in the wrong context, but even whatever background it is, to a fully functioning human being that understands that the world is made up of, uh, of a rich kind of tapestry of different um def- different people those noises are made by morons regardless yeah. of whether they've got a background of of wherever or the the, the fellow that leaned over at um Stamford bridge screaming abuse at raheem sterling is a moron there's there's no two ways about that regardless of where well, he's done this and he's from this background no you're an idiot there's, there's no way around that i think we in this country have a particular problem with the specific banner or rather the specific line of argument shall we say behind the divakarigi mm. banner which if you haven't seen is related to a traditional stereotype about a part of black men's anatomy and the reason why we have a particular problem with that one is because i think a lot of men would like to have that stereotype or that rumor about them they see it and they go well, that's not racist. How can that be racist? If someone had a banner it's saying... Someone's high-fiving you. Come yeah, on. Like, yeah, ridiculous. I, yeah. I would love that. And mm. they don't get that it's not about you saying that that's racist. It's the stereotyping mm. that's racist. It's the dehumanising that's racist. Mm. And I think it's that little bit of nuance that we all sometimes struggle with in that particular instance. Coming up, we're talking Erling Braut Haaland and we're going to be joined by a Norwegian football expert. Is the youngster really all that? This is love sport have you had enough of extortionate energy bills a spokesman said could help you find the cheapest energy deals on the market don't take our word for it there's hundreds of spokesman said customers who've saved big brian from derbyshire saved 400 pounds on his energy bills and tony from northampton saved a massive 2800 pounds on his gas and electric a spokesman said.com the leading price comparison site where you can switch to the cheapest energy tariffs on the market in just minutes the spokesman said.com fighting for you saving you money get ready for brexit on the 31st of october brexit will bring changes that affect businesses in many ways particularly if you buy from eu suppliers sell to eu customers provide services to eu clients and receive customer data from other businesses in the eu businesses need to prepare find out how at gov.uk slash brexit Get ready for Brexit on the 31st of October. It's cancer, they said. My first thought, let's just say it wasn't money. But time off work for treatment and trips to the hospital. Paying the mortgage. And, and, and. The cost of living doesn't go away just because you're living with cancer. And Macmillan can help with that too. My advice? Take their advice. Soon as. I did. Macmillan. Right there with you. Call now or search Macmillan Money Worries. Get ready for Brexit on the 31st of October. Find out what you need to do to prepare at gov.uk slash Brexit. How are you? How are you really? Modern life can be busy and sometimes it's easier to look after others before looking after yourself. But there's only one you. And making small changes to your lifestyle now could improve your chances of staying healthier longer. So take the first step to a healthier you with our free How Are You quiz. See how you score and get personalised tips and support. From how to eat a little healthier to turning a 10-minute walk into exercise. Just search One You. I told Melania that she draws her eyebrows on far too high. She looked so surprised. This is Love Sport. You're listening to the Posh Boys on Love Sport Drive. That's me, Johnny Burrow, Guy Watts and David Prutton. And Guy Watts has all your latest sporting headlines and weather. So, uh, starting with some Rugby World Cup news, Johnny. Liam Williams is a doubt for Wales' Rugby Union World Cup semi-final against South Africa on Sunday. The Lions fullback suffered an ankle injury in training yesterday. Some outlets are reporting that he is definitely out of not just that game, but the whole World Cup should Wales reach the final. Uh, if not, if he's not fit, Lee Halfpenny would be likely to replace him. 
Tonight's Europa League football gets underway in around 20 minutes time. Three British clubs in the early fixtures are all on the road. Man United at Partizan Belgrade. Rangers taking on Portuguese Giants Porto and Wolves playing Slovan Bratislava. Later, Arsenal and St. Vittoria and Celtic welcome Lazio to Glasgow. Watford boss Kike Sanchez-Flores says Danny Welbeck will be out for months rather than weeks. The striker pulled up early in their Premier League game with Tottenham clutching the back of his leg. His career has, of course, been blighted by injury, missing plenty of games during his time, both at Manchester United and Arsenal. And in your weather tonight, we're looking at northern and western parts of the UK, having some showers with more persistent rain in the southwest, mainly dry and clear elsewhere. Windy in the far north, cold and frosty in the north as well. Lows of around six degrees or so, a chilly one for a lot of people. Tomorrow, persistent and heavy rain pushing north across a lot of England and Wales, possibly affecting parts of southern Scotland and Northern Ireland as well. Windy for some. That's the latest here for you on Love Sport Drive. Thanks, Guy. We're talking Manchester United this evening. We're talking their need for a centre forward. And we're asking you, is Erling Haaland the right man for the job? He got another two Champions League goals last night for RB Salzburg. Not against shabby opposition either. He got them against Napoli. Still 19, scoring goals for fun this season. I think 20 goals in 13 appearances in all competitions. Should he be United's prime target, David? Well, I'm just looking at the figures here. He's not played an immense amount of games, has he? 39 in a season at Mould, uh, 11 so far for uh, Red Bull Salzburg. Um, it would be a punt. I'd be intrigued to see what kind of price tag they'd slap on him. Uh, but it's certainly shown that for a player of his age, 19, uh, good old-fashioned northerner with a name like that as well, um, he would offer something, I think. And I think with any young player such as this, it's a gamble. With any transfer, with any outlay of money, it's a gamble. But you've got the potential there of a player that could develop at Manchester United, help elevate them back to where they believe they should be. Then after that, there's an element of being able to sell him on if he does fantastically well. If if it's not too big of an outlay, you could write it off. So, um, But I think for this moment in time, they need somebody. They need somebody pretty stellar in the interim to get them to out of this holding pattern that they find themselves in. And we, we spoke earlier, didn't we, about Mandzukic and Kane. Obviously, Kane's not something a player that you bring in just for a holding pattern, but Mandzukic perhaps would be a player that you could bring in for 18 months, two years, to get them to a place where younger players would be slightly easier to recruit. On the Haaland front, you'd have thought it's the resale value element of the deal that will really appeal to Ed Woodward. It would certainly fit in terms of the transfer business they've been doing more recently. Lars Sivitsen is a Norwegian football expert. He joins us on the line now. Good evening, Lars. How is Erling Haaland viewed in his native land? Has he been highly rated from the age of four? <laughs> from the age of four. Well, I mean, I, I grew up in, in the same sort of small town as he did, and my dad certainly was looking forward to, to Alfinger Holland's kids, uh, one of them at least coming through, e either one. No, I listen, I think no one were quite expecting that this would happen, that he would set these records in the Champions League and that he'd just sort of single-handedly sort of blow away the Austrian League the way he's doing domestically there. I don't think anyone were expecting him to make this sort of leap and uh, just now, but we, we have seen glimpses of it. You mentioned he played for Molde. He was a bit streaky for Molde, which is not, you know, not unnatural for a young man, but he did have certain games when he just looked completely unplayable. And he does, I'm sure what you but the first thing you notice with him is there's the combination of size and mobility that's very unusual. Like he's such a physical uh, specimen, but he can get around the pitch as well. And I think one of the things that's interesting is that he wasn't he was a late developer physically. So when he was learning the game, he didn't actually have a huge physical advantage. He used to he used to get battered quite a lot playing when he was younger. So he had to learn the game. He had to learn to rely on his movement, to rely on his touch, on this sort of thing. And when the physical development came later, that was almost like a bonus on top of it. So I think, I think he's an incredibly exciting prospect. Does that mean then, Lars, that perhaps when you talk about the te uh, technical along with the physicality, that you look at the Premier League and think maybe, just maybe, it would be a league that would suit him? He looks very, very well suited for the Premier League as well. I can hear you were talking about Man United. I mean, I guess my only concern now is that you don't want him to make too big a leap too soon. I mean, he seems to be, well, maybe he is ready for a bigger challenge right now. But, you know, talking about going somewhere like Man United, the thing I would worry about is I think he would command a very considerable transfer fee. 
uh, because he, while he is playing in Austria, he is playing for a club that has a has a very significant fizzy drinks company backing them up. So there's, <laughs> there's a lot of money there. So it's not it's not as if they'll let him go for sort of uh, for peanuts. So it, it would be a very very big transfer fee. And going into United in the situation they are now being in inverted commas Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's man who's meant to come in and fix everything at the age of 19 it's a huge ask for the guy you know you've got to be careful with, with the sort of next career move he makes now I think Will he be looking at Martin Odegaard and just going hmm there's a cautionary tale there a young Norwegian highly rated gets the move to the big club doesn't quite click Maybe a little bit, yeah. I think that that might be that might be something they have in the back of their minds. But of course, I think this is where uh, his father, being who he is, can be useful because he's a guy who does know a little bit about what it takes uh, to play at a very high level. Of course, football has changed a little bit since he was knocking around, but he will have very sound advice in his ear, and I think they'll they'll be uh, they'll be trying to make the the canniest decision, not necessarily the most lucrative one in the immediate short term. When we look at the possibility of a 19-year-old and, and th- that very element of spreading his wings, we've looked at English players that kind of go out uh, abroad and seek new horizons and, and new uh, challenges across uh, European football, Lars. When you look at Erling, when you look at, like you say, about his dad having a knowledge of um, English football and my experience of, of Scandinavian players, they always seemed very suited to what uh, a robust season in English football, be it in the Premier League, be it in the Championship, would offer them. I mean, the, what's the perception of uh, the Premier League uh, with regards to the, the Scandinavian uh, import of players? No, it, it's obviously a huge league, and I think for us, we... I mean, it's, it's basically it's more popular than the Norwegian League is in our country, and I think there's some... Uh, I think people lament a little bit that we don't have as many players in England as we used to. You mentioned the mentality required, for sure. Uh, whatever, you, whatever you say about the players that Norway produce as a country, they, they tend not to worry about being knocked around a little bit. So the physical aspect is completely fine. And also the weather, you know, the, the cold nights in, in Stoke or whatever. I mean, I was, the, where I grew up and where Holland grew up, I mean, it rains every bit as much as, as it does in the north, except the rain is usually coming at you sideways. So this sort of stuff is not alien to us at all. So I think in that sense, I think he'd be a very good match, definitely. What was the relationship between Haaland and Solskjaer like at Mulder? Well, the Haaland is very complimentary about Solskjaer, and it seems to have been, have been very good, because I think it's interesting to, to note that he wasn't, I mean, of course, because of who his father is and because he'd, he'd gotten his first team debut in the second tier in Norway when he was very young, I think there was some excitement. But when he went to Mulder, he wasn't, universally like seen as the next big thing i don't think anyone was really expecting that and it was also at molda primarily where he suddenly became huge i mean when he, he sort of put it on so he put on so much muscle and grew so much so i mean that was a very crucial part of his development the connection with solskjaer is, is definitely a factor that should be borne in mind when we're when we're thinking about his future definitely would uh, the attention perhaps of the Premier League, when you talk about, obviously this is very hypothetical, it's all potentials and uh, a sizable price tag, the, a young man has got to be very level-headed when it comes to dealing with that type of situation. Does he deal with pressure very well? Well, he, he comes across very well. And there's something, if you if you look at what coaches who's worked with him, both from when he was very young to, to now, even Jesse Marsh, who's talking about him now, everyone will remark about the fact that he's really down to earth. He's really hardworking. He's last off the training finish, all, all the field, all this sort of stuff. And he's gotten some attention for his uh, less than enthusiastic post-match interviews, uh, which I guess, I mean, I, I, just to add a little bit of context to there, I mean, the part of Norway where he grew up is a sort of, uh, is a, it's, a, it's a slightly agrarian sort of countryside uh, part of the world, a lot of farmers, uh, a lot of hardy people who are not known for speaking unless they're spoken to. You know, we're, we're kind of quiet, as, uh, myself being a notable exception, obviously. But like, they're not, they're not known to be, they're not known for being big talkers. And I think, you know, I also think if you've got a 19 year old who becomes almost like this global phenomenon overnight, because in the age of social media, that's what happens. The fact that he doesn't seem to enjoy talking to the press and would prefer to just play football, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. No, in, in terms of mentality, he seems very, very grounded indeed. Lars, great to talk to you. Thank you for your time. Lars Sivetson there, who is a Norwegian football expert. The one angle to the potential Erling Haaland to United deal 
involves his dad, mm. who played for Manchester City and he played for Leeds. David Prutton, you're a former Leeds man. Yeah. You know what that rivalry means. Is Alf Inger going to allow his son to sign for Manchester United? You'd like to think that he would park any form of partisan feeling with it because of the wonderful opportunity that it would afford his son. But very well loved by Leeds fans, very well loved by Manchester City fans. So he knows exactly how it feels to be on the receiving end of, of that type of praise. But it would be... The familial ties ties would have to be parked somewhat when it came to that. I mean, if he went there and he was a tremendous success, I don't think for one minute he'd be sat there in his lead shirt or his man's shirt (laughs) cheering on his son. But he'd understand what a wonderful opportunity it it would be. But you know what fans are like, as fickle as they come. (laughs) A couple of tweets amused me earlier on this subject. Of course, social media has gone wild for the youngster today. George Weir's cousin, an amusing Twitter account, tweets a lot about football, said, Haaland looks the real deal. Looks like he looks like he'd suit the Premier League. Sorry, looks like he'd suit United <laughs> style. Speaks good English. Has played under Solskjaer. When you factor all that in, it's inevitable they'll sign 33-year-old Mario Mandzukic on 150k a week instead. <laughs> it's what they'll do. And having obviously followed United closely for the last couple of years, he is completely correct. And Wayne Barton said, Erling Haaland is a real talent. It's just a shame he would fail his medical because of a knee injury picked Aww. up by Roy Keane's tackle in 2001. And Roy, Roy Keane famously ended Elfinger Haaland's career, guys. No! Hang on. He did. No, he didn't. It was the other knee. He got an injury to the other knee, which is what ended Elfinger Haaland's It was Haaland's hit with career. such velocity, though, wasn't it? No, it's it wasn't. To say that both it knees wasn't. went. Urban myth, common misconception. You're both wrong, and you're also both trying to wind me up. It's shameless. It's pathetic. Even if it was the other knee... He only made four appearances in his career after, after that. After well, that. come on. Because yeah, you got an injury to and the other knee. Go all, all of them were for non-league Rosserland at a significantly enough low level that he scored 14 goals in four games from midfield. Well, he's got a goal-scoring record like his son then. He's got both knees intact to do that. Coming up, we've got Europa League kickoffs very, very shortly. We're going to have updates and analysis for you throughout the show. Giving your team the coverage they deserve. Love Sport Radio. You alright, mate? Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah? Mm, really? It's just, there's a massive grizzly bear sitting on you. You sure you're okay? Well, now that you mention it, sometimes we say we're fine when we're not. But with one in four experiencing a mental health problem, if your mate says he's fine, he might not be. Be in your mate's corner and ask twice. Time to change. Hello, I'm Tim from Bolsover. I'm a retired teacher. I was looking for a better electricity deal from my parents when uh, I got an email from a spokesman said it was a fixed deal for two years, which was better for my parents, less for them to worry about. And when I had a look at the the sums, I had to recheck because I couldn't quite believe it. They were going to save over £900 each year over on that deal. Needless to say, we signed up pretty quickly. With a spokesman said dot com. Fighting for you, saving you money. Get ready for Brexit on the 31st of October. This means that travelling to the EU will change. You'll need to check online if your passport is valid for travel to Europe. If you're planning on driving, you'll need to check if you have the right documents to drive and make sure your travel insurance covers all your healthcare needs. To keep your trip on track, check what you need to do at gov.uk slash Brexit. Get ready for Brexit on the 31st of October. You probably think you're pretty good at multitasking behind the wheel. I mean, you have to multitask to drive. So what's wrong with checking your phone? The thing is, your brain simply doesn't work. Even a quick look at a message, a phone with a quick reply, affects your concentration and makes you less able to react to hazards. If you use a mobile phone while driving, you're four times more likely to crash. Think. Put your phone away. Love sport. The streets will never forget is a relatively new footballing phrase. It gets used mostly on Twitter and it's applied to a certain school of footballer who turns up and for a brief spell, for a kind of liminal period, is brilliant. I'm talking Michu at Swansea. I'm talking Amir Zaki at Wigan, (laughs) who inexplicably loved a bicycle kick for three months and then disappeared back to Zamalek. One person who the streets will certainly 
certainly never forget. They're great shouts, Johnny. Absolutely. They're amazing. Amazing. The Wigan Amazaki. one was unbelievable. Yeah, everyone remembers Micho. No one remembers Amizaki. I remember, yeah, you're doing the celebration, David. <laughs> I remember sitting, watching Match of the Day as a kid, watching the rerun at 7.45 in the morning, going, who is Amizaki? Why does he look like a bodybuilder? And how can I get him in my fancy team yeah, now? And how can he score bicycle kicks with such regularity? I also love the, the formative memory of watching Match of the Day with Wigan on it. Yeah, no, genuinely. My, my, my formative Match of the Day is the big hitters. Not, I, no, no, no. I, I have got two formative memories of Match of the Day. One is sitting in Devon. I was on a holiday sitting in Devon watching Amizaki bang in a bicycle kick. And the other one is it must have been 2005 on holiday again in Wales in Wells even sitting and I was I was a nerdy <laughs> not kid way, not the, Genk not, not <laughs> Ghent uh, the day before I'd been bought my first tiny pen knife by my dad and I was sitting on the sofa before anyone was up, else was up whittling a stick like a proper nerd watching Pedro Mendes score absolute bangers for Portsmouth football was better back then wow. anyway the reason why I bring up Amizaki the reason why I bring up players that the streets will never forget is because one of them is Adele Tarrapt. He had that one season at QPR under Neil Warnock where he looked like the Ronaldinho of the championship. He was absolutely unbelievable. And he's back. He starred for Benfica in the Champions League last night versus Red Bull Leipzig despite taking 1,387 days to make his debut. The backstory, by the way, is he signed the contract turned up to meet the president of Benfica, did so, I think, in a gold-plated Ferrari and got out of it in a bright gold-plated jacket and was just told to go home. Uh, he is, <laughs> Sorry, that's ridiculous. Yeah, can, you, can you go <laughs> Can you just take it off, Adel? <laughs> uh, he is that kind of bloke and he is back. How many players do we see who have this kind of prodigious talent and have arrogance to a degree that means they just waste it? Uh, it's it's a fascinating story because I remember speaking to Sean Derry who played with uh, Tarapt and very much of the school of opinion that he could do things with the football that mere mortals couldn't. So you facilitated what he did. I mean, the minute he kind of set foot in the Premier League and realised that it was not just about being able to do what he did, but it was allied to hard work, a cohesive team system and, and a common goal. That's kind of what upended him really. But watching him... Uh, as a neutral in the championship was an absolute joy. Uh, his ability with a football, his ability to be able to do with it what he wanted, the uh, the ability to also tantrum <laughs> and throw strops in equal measure meant that he was he was fascinating to watch. Uh, a fantastically talented player, but uh, all too often we see situations such as this where it falls by the wayside because of the application, and we see footballers who make. Uh, decade-long, 20-year-long careers at the very top end of football by applying themselves properly, working extremely hard and being diligent in what they do. They might come across as monk-like and a little bit boring, but they manage to squeeze every last drop of um, p- p- ability out of their potential and they're to be lauded for that. Uh, Tarabdi is a type of player, it's like the Robin Friday type, obviously that's a couple of generations ago, where you look at it and you go, that's amazing what you're doing, but my God, your approach to it is ridiculous. Ravel Morrison is another, another one. He never had the Tarap style brilliant season, but he was, of course, touted by Sir Alex Ferguson as the most talented youngster essentially to ever come through mm. at Manchester United. And he has that kind of prodigious arrogance that just means it never came to anything. Another is Hachim Mastor, who hit the headlines, I think, eight years ago. He was 13 and he was doing freestyle videos on YouTube and he was signed by AC Milan for half a million quid and was rated as this incredible talent. Age 21, he's just joined his eighth club and it doesn't quite seem to be working for him. Is it too much too soon? Yeah, is it being hyped as a teenager? There was the Freddie Adu situation as well, oh, wasn't there? Word. He was lauded, he was sponsored, he was he was the next ginormous thing in world football, but never came to it. I think we set unrealistic expectations for players such as that. It's great when they come along, we get all excited, but development and the nurturing side of what a young footballer needs to have to get to where he needs to be is so important. If Ravel Morrison is in a position where Sir Alex is saying he's the best that he's seen and Sir Alex can't get hold of you, then... That therein lies the real answer to the question of why did I make it? It's your fault. 
I've got a few others. The streets will never forget. <laughs> You're on fire with these. The combination, the front three. Why do you save, save them, Johnny. Oh, you want to do for, the team for another news, day? <laughs> I, I'm itching. Fine, give us the team news. We're about to kick off in the Europa League, and then I'm gonna fire the streets memories at you. I promise you and our listeners can have more memories from the streets after six. How about that? Done. That's worth that's worth staying tuned for, even if nothing else is, and I promise you it is. Uh, a small bit of history, by the way, being made in the Europa League tonight. Sean Massey Ellis becoming the first English woman to officiate in a men's European fixture when she's assistant referee for PSV Eindhoven's game against LASK. That kicks off at eight, as do Arsenal and Celtic's games, of course. First, though, bit of team news for you from Man United and Wolves, who are kicking off as we speak. Man United, Romero, Jones, Maguire, Rojo, uh, uh, sorry, Wambasaka, McTominay, Mata, Lingard, Williams, Garner and Martial is the team United have gone with, sticking with that three at the back that they used on Sunday. Wolves, of course, as always, using three at the back. Rui Patricio, Bolly, Cody, Kilman, Doherty, Venegra, Sice, Moutinho, Gibbs, White, Catroni and Raul Jimenez. They've made five changes. United made seven changes from their Premier League games at the weekend. Of course, Man United playing away from home tonight. The last time they actually won a game away from home, they've had 11 away games since the last time they won away from home. This happened. Man United might not thank me, but get the contract out, put it on the table, <laughs> yeah. let him sign it, let him write whatever numbers he wants to put on there, given what he's done now since he's come in, and let him sign the contract and go. Oli's with the will, man. He's doing it. He's doing his thing. Man United are back. Played 11, drawn four, lost seven. Sign it, Johnny. Sign it. David Prutton started whacking the table. Sign it. He's put the contract in front of me. I've signed it. Rio Ferdinand. This is love sport. You all right, mate? Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah? Mm, really? It's just, there's a massive grizzly bear sitting on you. You sure you're okay? Well, now that you mention it, sometimes we say we're fine when we're not. But with one in four experiencing a mental health problem, if your mate says he's fine, he might not be. Be in your mate's corner and ask twice. Time to change. Hi, I'm Marilyn from Oxfordshire. My current insurance company quoted £245.08 and pence to reinsure. And a spokesman said, obtain me a price of £173.49 for the same cover. This was a fantastic saving for me. And next time my car insurance comes up for renewal, I will be going through what a spokesman said. No doubt about that. With a spokesman said.com. Fighting for you, saving you money. Get ready for Brexit on the 31st of October. Find out what you need to do to prepare at gov.uk slash Brexit. Before you set off on a long journey, remember to check your vehicle. Are your tires correctly inflated and are the treads deep enough? Have you got enough fuel? Is your oil level right? Checking your vehicle doesn't take long, but can prevent a breakdown or accident and save you money. So, before you set off on a long journey, check your tires, fuel, and oil. Highways England connecting the country. If you see somebody showing any of the signs of a stroke, you don't have to think about it, you just dial 999. Use the FAST test. F, face, has their face fallen on one side? Can they smile? A, arms, can they raise both arms and keep them there? S, speech, is their speech slurred? T, time, time to call 999 if you see any one of these signs. Act fast, make the call, Dial 999. We've got a cracking final hour for you on Posh Boys on Drive. Conor McGregor is returning to MMA. We're going to be talking to a mixed martial arts journalist. He's an expert in the field. Is this the shot in the arm that the UFC needed? We're also talking Europa League. We're just about to kick off across the world. We're just underway. In fact, updates, analysis for you throughout the show and we're also talking about the players the streets will never forget get in touch with yours on whatsapp 0208 70 20 558 i've got a few stored up in the back pocket for guy and david prutton but first of all it's time for all your latest headlines on digital radio online mobile and smart speaker this is love sport news 
From the Sky News Centre at six, the Prime Minister says he'll give MPs more time to debate his Brexit deal if they agree to a general election. He wants the country to go to the polls on December the 12th. Labour's always said it wants the chance to replace the Conservatives in power, but only when the threat of a no-deal Brexit is removed. Boris Johnson says this Parliament is broken. It's refusing to deliver Brexit. It's impossible to deliver legislation. It's time, frankly, that uh, the opposition summoned up the nerve to submit themselves to the judgment of of our collective boss which is the people of of the uk meanwhile mps have approved the pm's plan for government as outlined in the queen's speech earlier this month Police have confirmed all 39 people found dead in a lorry container in Essex were Chinese. The bodies of the 31 men and eight women were discovered in the refrigerated trailer in Greys early yesterday morning. Officers have been given more time to question a 25-year-old man from Northern Ireland on suspicion of murder. Former Labour Home Secretary Lord Blunkett is convinced this was organised criminal activity. I can't see how 39 people could climb into this particular container and seal it because these are sealed uh, across boundary working and not be able to get out. They were clearly loaded in and it was locked. A 21-year-old man has been charged with the murder of two teenagers who were stabbed at a house party in Milton Keynes. Dom Anser and Ben Gillam Rice, both 17, died last Saturday night. Charlie Chandler from Bletchley is also accused of two counts of attempted murder. The owner of Supercuts has collapsed into administration, putting more than 1,000 jobs at risk. The firm is one of Britain's largest chains of hair salons and it has 220 shops. This evening's football is underway with five British uh, teams in the Europa League. Manchester United, Wolves and Rangers are all in action in the early kickoffs. That's the latest. I'm Will Rowe. Love Sport Radio. On digital radio, online, mobile and smart speaker. This is the Posh Boys on Love Sport Drive. Good evening, you're listening to the Posh Boys on Love Sport Drive with me, Johnny Burrow, Guy Watts and David Prutton who is exploding into the Love Sports studio. We are underway in this evening's Europa League action. We are goalless apart from Ghent versus Wolfsburg where those two ill-fated Liverpool fans may have ended up. There's an early goal through the wonderfully named Wout Weghorst and it is Wolfsburg 1 Ghent nil. Your top stories this evening. George Ford has been brought back into the England team for Saturday's Rugby World Cup final against New Zealand. He replaces Henry Slade in England's only change from the quarterfinal win against Australia. And Manchester United fans are urging the club to sign Erling Haaland. But Ole Gunnar Solskjaer sounds keen on Harry Kane. And Conor McGregor is returning to MMA in January. Guy and David, I promised you a few more players the streets will never forget. I'm just going to throw you a handful. That front three, Blackburn Rovers, circa 2007, Morton Gamps Pedersen, Rocky Santa Cruz and David (laughs) Bentley. Swinging crosses in. I used to love watching them. A world-class streets will never forget player, Ben Jarney at Portsmouth. Lethal for about a seventh month period. You're doing I've got the, the celebration. celebration, haven't I? I, I remember the celebrations more. more than the players. His slightly niche, Stelios Yanakopoulos at Bolton. Bolton. Yes, who's now an assistant. Where is an assistant somewhere in English football? Is he? Mm. I'm going to do a bit of digging on that. Mark Viduka, another. Yes. And Sheffy Cucci. Yes. Sarah. Who used to do the... You've got all the celebrations, oh, no, no, no. David Pratt. And if you're not watching us on YouTube, it's Love Sport Radio. You will see all of David's brilliant little imitations. But our top story is, of course, the rugby. We're only just over 36 hours away from England versus New Zealand in the Rugby World Cup semi final. England's biggest game, of course, for 12 years. And 2003 World Cup winner Phil Vickery joined Love Sport Breakfast this morning and he gave us his take on the Eddie Jones mind games that have dominated the build-up to this game. I can remember 
you know, certainly when playing for him and playing against Eddie Jones and some of the things he was saying back then, and it used to really annoy me. And I used to say, God, I'd like stamp on Eddie Jones, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but what would he but say? It, what kind of things would he say? Well, just things like, you know, particularly if I if I go right back to two, 2003, you know, bear in mind I lost. Uh, you know, Lions series to, to Eddie Jones's uh, team in 2001 with the Lions, and then all all that time through there, and Eddie Jones in charge. And I just remember, particularly, it was more in the build up. In the end, you just ignore him because it becomes like it just becomes noise that you just don't take any notice of, and just think, oh god, it's like a, that irritating bumblebee noise in the background. You know, you do, you just ignore it. I remember him saying England can't score tries, England are old. I think it was the orcs, orcs on steroids, Grandad's army, <laughs> all these all these kind of things. I remember going to Melbourne and I scoring them three tries to one and thinking, right, get back in your box, sunshine. Yeah. Dealt with you. <laughs> you know, and and it just I, I used to really enjoy that side of it. And I, I just think it's interesting at a moment in the build up to it. When you think about all great sporting occasions, it's about the game, but it's actually it's about more than that. I think all these kind of things just add to it. David, what have you made of the way that Eddie Jones has gone about things? I think it's been ace. I think it's uh, a nice, refreshing, mischievous way of entering into what is the biggest game for his uh, team against one of the greatest team sides that we've seen in team sport. It gives it a nice, tiny bit of levity going into it. Uh, he no doubt takes it all. So, unbelievably seriously, and he's got a squad capable of, of causing... New Zealand problems and he's he's managed to address each game as it's come up with the relevant uh, selection of the 15 that he's gone with and been able to back up the talk with the walk this now is the greatest test and I'm I'm just intrigued to, to, to see how it informs perhaps what New Zealand approach the game like I mean if, if you look at how they set up post-match if you look at how they lay, lay the gauntlet down that could be a mighty tasty prelude to what could be a fantastic game We've had a tweet into the show on our forgotten streets will never forget players mentioning the Tamori Ketsbaya yes. celebration for Newcastle United. Cloffing off. That one is from Martin listening in South London. Thanks for your message, Martin. Remember, if you want to get in touch with yours or your views on this England team and the decision to bring a certain Mr Ford back into the mix, that number is 0208. 70 20 5 5 8. I'm feeling very, very confident. I think Eddie Jones has played it perfectly. It's not just that entertainment, the mm. perfect bit of wind up. He has actually pitched it right from a competitive point of view. He said, Listen, the pressure isn't on us, mm -hmm. and it isn't, but he's made it very, very clear publicly, and I suspect he'll be making it even more clear behind closed doors that this is a game England can win, and I'm sure he expects them to win. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's no mocking in it. He's not done it in a sense of um, doing it joking for joking's sake he's, he's kind of said things with a wry smile on his face, he understands the huge pressure, the expectation levels, the scrutiny that comes from the media and fans alike on an England side that yes we, sp we speak about the all blacks in glowing terms and, and with due reverence but England have got to go into it knowing what they are capable of and at some stage dominance of the biggest teams does have to be broken and why not begin on Saturday that's a very good point. Phil Vickery also told Patrick Christie's and Martin Allen about his experience of visiting the England camp in the build-up to this tournament. Here's how he described that experience. It was amazing. I felt uplifted and I thought, wow, if these boys can do it on the rugby field, I'll tell you what, it, it, it'll just be tremendous. And, and I know I'm kind of glass half full person and I'm not afraid to be critical. I, I truly believe that these boys can do it. And, you know, do I want to be yeah. for the next four years the only world, rugby World Cup winner again? Mm. No, I do not. Go on, lads. Go and get after it. You can change your life. Without meaning to get ahead of myself or overdo things, it is absolutely coming home. Because if the atmosphere in the camp is so good that you can turn up as a retired ex-player and feel lifted, feel that belief, feel that atmosphere. Imagine what it's like to be one of that playing squad. I absolutely loved hearing that from the Raging Bull. Isn't it funny listening to him speak? He's so softly spoken. Absolutely. And he's sort of such a, an optimistic, happy guy. I know he's obviously done a lot of different TV and radio stuff in his retirement, and I think he's become a really popular figure, but his persona on the mm. pitch, he was that absolute warrior. He was never say die. He was over my dead body, and he was absolutely tough as old boots. What a player he was. Captained us 
of course, to the final in 2007 where we couldn't quite repeat the heroics. But brilliant here. And that bit at the end, that sort of inspirational message, got hairs on the back of my neck going. I'm absolutely buzzing for this game. And I think it's been improved the build-up for what Eddie Jones had said. It may have absolutely minimal effect on the game itself. But I feel like in some small way, even if the New Zealand lot have taken no notice of it, then the England players at least will have been sort of lightened a little bit. Mm. You know, they're not being burdened with you know, tiny little bits here and there about this New Zealand player or that New Zealand player. Eddie Jones isn't being super serious and earnest. He's trying to lighten the mood. And I don't see how that can have a negative effect. It's not like anyone's going to take the semi-final occasion not seriously enough. Well, that's, the, that's the balance in that, isn't it? And that's the mark of a true, um, truly exceptional coach, being able to afford the players that lightness that they can express themselves, but keep them right on the edge that they can perform. And I think doing what he's done in the way that he's done it. I mean, we there, there might be naysayers that come off the back of the result of the weekend and say, well, if England turn around and get the, the pants pulled down by the All Blacks, then it, it's, well, it, it was too light. But anything or decisions that he makes going into this are the right decisions because they're made at that moment in time mm. and he deems them uh, duly correct in, in that situation. And, and he's in a position of power because he's earned the right to be where he has and he can do it how he sees fit. And if you look at our recent record against the All Blacks as well, it's far from impressive. Mm. But you can point to crumbs of comfort, I would say. The most recent meeting being the most relevant. Just a point in it about a year ago, 11 months ago probably, at Twickenham. It was an absolutely fractional offside. If you remember, Courtney Laws charged down a kick. Mm. Sam Underhill ran onto it and touched down for a try. We thought we might have won it. It was overturned. And I think the, the rule actually has been changed since. It's one of those where... The rule that day didn't favour England. It's been changed since. The rule in the Cricket World Cup final did favour England, didn't yeah. favour New Zealand. That's also been changed since. So maybe there's a little bit of justice, a bit of balance there. But that was such a close game. We went 50 nil up as well and gave it away. But that is New Zealand for you. They always come back at you. It happened even in 2012. Mm. We went, I think, 15 nil up. And we went on to win the game, of course. But they got it back to 15-14. And Dan Carter missed a load of kicks. And then we had that incredible 10-15 minutes where Manu Tulangi absolutely tore them apart. And here, I think is the significant thing, the key difference to every other meeting that's happened between England and New Zealand between 2012 and Saturday. Manu Tuolangi is back in the starting 15 and he is playing probably as well as he's played since that day in December, actually, in 2012. And there's a lot of other reasons for encouragement as well, but that alone... I think is enough. Some of those Kiwis are still playing in mm. this team and all of them will have seen that footage. They'll have probably watched it live. They'll have certainly seen it back since. They will know how dangerous Manu Tulangi can be. And I think one thing, if you're going to get a little bit tactical about it, that moving of Owen Farrell to inside centre, bringing George Ford in at 10, moving Manu Tulangi a little bit wider, giving him a little bit more space, I think could be a key difference. That's probably why Eddie Jones has done it and for the kicking game. But just to give Tulangi that little bit more space to work in because when he gets even half a yard... There's probably no one who's more destructive when he's at his full peak. And, you know, I think we've seen just about enough to suggest he's getting back there. Sloven Bratislava have a stadium full of children. They also have the lead. It's Slovan 1, Wolves 0. The goals coming through Spora there. Updates for you throughout that game. We are goalless in most of our other fixtures. Still, still Wolfsburg 1, Ghent 0. Espanyol 1, Ludogorets 0. Carabag won Apoel nil. That is one for the purists. And Saint Etienne won Alexandria one. How many goals in football history do you think have been introduced on the radio or anywhere else as they have a, a stadium full of children and they also have the league? It was quite partridge, that wasn't it? <laughs> so it was a bit, but it was good. I liked it. And you're quite right. That is, well, it certainly was before the game, the story, the talking point. It's crazy. I wonder what kind of atmosphere there is. Of course, 200 Wolves fans there as well, but they were told they couldn't wear any colours because they're in this sort of neutral corporate hospitality bit, which was the only place they were technically allowed to be. Although Bratislava have mm. shipped in, if you like, several thousand I think possibly even up to 20,000 of the sort of youth club Ridiculous. so yeah it is all a little bit ludicrous and yeah well on the rugby I suppose what more is there to say except bring on New Zealand and you know stay with us on Love Sport we've got loads of great coverage of it coming up I think tomorrow morning the breakfast show is going to be joined by Harry Ellis the former scrum half Adam Jones former Lions and Wales prop to talk about that game because Wales and South Africa on Sunday morning is going to be a great game as well possibly a little bit more physical a little bit more attritional than England New Zealand but you just never know and here on Love Sport Drive we're going to be speaking to Lewis Moody tomorrow afternoon the former England captain crazy horse
Mad Dog, I think, is the one you're looking Crazy for. Crazy yours. That's Neil Young's band, as you well know. <laughs> he was part of Neil Young's band as well. Was he? He's it's a talented drama. guy. Lewis never sleeps. What a talented guy, Lewis Moody. Moody. We'll Lewis ask him about Moody that. Never sleep. If you've got a question for Lewis Moody about his time <laughs> with Neil Young's band, get in touch on 0208 70 20 558 or at Love Sport Radio. We might even ask him about the rugby as well, but I can't guarantee it. No, I, get... I want to know about what it was like being on Harvest. Yes, um, you two are turning into each other, right? You've got the same glasses now. I just realised no, that. You're the second person today but, who said that. He's copied mine. But guys I are like a, like a slimmed down post Atkins version of what your spec. Not saying <laughs> you've got massive Elton no, John no, size I, specs, I, I have. but they're a slightly beefier. So the reason why mine are bigger is I bigger have head. such. Thank you, David Pratton. I have such bad eyesight that the lenses are so thick <laughs> they would break. These, genuinely, <laughs> these have been thinned 50%, and I cannot have frames like guys, which is obviously really? my dream, because they can't, <laughs> they cannot bear the load. Yes. Wow. You mm. know who this is really good for? Everyone listening at home who can't yes, see the glasses. Exactly. How bad is your eyesight? Just quickly, Jenna. Uh, minus nine. That is bad. My word. Spicy. That is Spicy. really bad. Don't I'm get me in the lineup. Hear. No. <laughs> Or the line out, indeed, <laughs> which is going to be an important point for England versus New Zealand. We're going to have updates, analysis of the Europa League action, talking more rugby throughout the show. Coming up, we're going to be joined by an MMA expert. Conor McGregor is back. Oh, good. Love sport. Get ready for Brexit on the 31st of October. Brexit will bring changes that affect businesses in many ways particularly if you buy from EU suppliers, sell to EU customers, provide services to EU clients, and receive customer data from other businesses in the EU. Businesses need to prepare. Find out how at gov.uk slash Brexit. Get ready for Brexit on the 31st of October. It's cancer, they said. My first thought, let's just say it wasn't money, but time off work for treatment and trips to the hospital paying the rent and 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 the cost of living doesn't go away just because you're living with cancer and Macmillan can help with that too my advice take their advice soon as i did Macmillan, right there with you call now or search Macmillan money worries get ready for brexit on the 31st of october find out what you need to do to prepare at gov.uk slash brexit Whoa! Look how much saturated fat is in these chocolate biscuits. It's surprising how much is in our food and drinks. For us kids, eating too much saturated fat can lead to harmful fat building up inside, which we can't see, increasing the risk of heart disease or stroke when we get older. So be food smart. Download the free Change for Life food scanner app and start making healthier choices today. Last time I was in the UK, I met National Treasure Mary Berry's grandmother, Elderberry. This is Love Sport. It took 10 seconds to show his talk. Wasn't cheap as he connected with the left and for Aldo to sleep. There's only one Conor McGregor, and there's the fight Rivera. And he's gonna knock out Floyd Mayweather, so Floyd, watch out. We've had a distinctly Irish theme to today's show, be it R Guy Watts' fantastic Roy Keane accent, all that, I have to say, fantastically catchy Conor McGregor tune. The reason why you're hearing it is, of course, The Notorious is back, or rather he will be on the 18th of January. He's announced his MMA comeback. Will the sport welcome him back with open arms? Jim M Edwards is an MMA expert and writer for Fighters Only magazine. Good evening, Jim. What's your take on this? Is it good to have Connor back in the sport? Uh, yeah, good evening, guys. Um, yeah, I think there's uh, two ways to answer that. I think it's always good uh, to have Connor around the sport because when he's at his best, uh, when he's at his best, he brings a lot of people watching it. He brings a lot of very, very interesting fight nights and uh, previously a lot of amazing performances in the octagon. But what's followed recently over the last few years, as we all know, is some uh, pretty disgraceful behaviour outside. Uh, of the sport and I just hope that wouldn't follow him back with this return potentially happening in January. Well this is the thing in his time away from MMA there have been various unsavoury out of the ring incidents one of course involving an older gentleman in a pub and some rather unsavoury CCTV footage. From a PR point of view MMA is a sport that sometimes needs a bit of help. 
is Conor McGregor going to help that image? Um, previously, I would have said yes. Like You look at the rise that he had, what, two, three years ago now, and it did bring the sport to a new level. But you, like you rightly say there, there have been some disgraceful instances over the last few years, and some, some of them which um, you know seem to have gone uh, below the surface following his announcements today that there have uh, been some reports in the uh, New York uh, Times out in America um, about some other incidents that have happened allegedly in Ireland recently. Um, that if they if they do uh, come to the light more, I, I should say, um, you know, it's it's not good news for having Conor McGregor in the press at the moment. And um, yeah, no, it, it's very hard to say because if some of this is true and some of it does get proven, then yeah, it, he's not going to be a good person to have around the sport. I, don't, I really can't say he will be. Jim, does it does it appear to you that he's a man that would particularly care about this type of thing, the outward perception? I mean, he's. He's built, I mean, it's bravado, but it's bravado that's been backed up with results over the course of his career. And he, he quite obviously has been a very successful man out of being involved in the sport. Is, 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 I mean, w- would this PR side of it bug him at all or would he just get on with it? I don't know what it is. It's very hard. To, you know, it's very hard to see what is actually driving Connor back to the sport these days. He's got more money than he could ever imagine. Um, you can't imagine, you can't believe that he's run out of that already. Mm. So what is driving him back? It's Unless he's gone full Mike Tyson with it all. <laughs> yeah, which I don't, I don't see him buying mm. any Tigers at the moment. <laughs> but, um, um, the, you know, who knows? Who knows? Maybe he does want to come back. He's, got, he's, he's been talking today about he wants these three fights. But is this all uh, a distraction to get away from some of the stuff that's in the press at the moment? We just don't know. All I know is that when Conor's fighting, Conor McGregor's at his best. So it would be it would be good, I, I believe, for him to get back involved in the sport. It's twelve weeks till his mooted comeback date. Is that long enough for him to train, to get fit, to get back to peak performance? He claims that he's in incredibly good shape. Obviously, and he claims he, that. Yeah, he does claim that. I mean, like he's never been one to like blow up like some other fighters do out, outside of their fight camp. So. You know, he, he is saying that he, he was going to return early this year, but broke his left hand. Um, and who knows, maybe he did get up to a reasonable level of fitness and was expected to fight late this year. But, you know, who knows? He didn't look too great the last time he, he came, got in the octagon. That was uh, after a two-year break. This is, um, you know, if he got fights in January, it's going to be two fights in, what, four years, which you know, it's just it's not good for fighters. We've seen in history that, uh, the ones that keep on keep on getting in there, keep on getting the ring time, the time in the octagon, are, are the ones that prosper. In terms of where he'll come back and fight, when we're talking about weight category, he's tried a few in his time. He's had varying degrees of success against varying opponents across them. Where is he coming back? It it does look like he's going to be coming back at lightweight. So that's 155 pounds, which was he was once a champion of. He's, he's gone up between featherweight, lightweight, and then welterweight, which is the heaviest he's ever fought. It looks like he'll come back at 155. He's then mooting a, a, a fight with Nate Diaz or Jorge Masvidal at uh, welterweight. And then it looks like he wants to go back down and fight Habib Namagamadoff at lightweight. So, you know, that, that's one thing you've got to say about Conor. He doesn't seem to be afraid at what weight he fights at, but it does look like it's going to be lightweight. Well, that initial fight against Khabib Namagamadoff was certainly controversial. He regardless of what went on in the ring, it was the fighting afterwards that brought all of the negative headlines. There are certainly schools to settle there. Is a rematch something that Connor is after? Is it something that Khabib would accept? Uh, well, I think Connor definitely wants it. Connor wants redemption, but he's not. The, the first fight wasn't close. Like like you say there, the, the headline stealing afterwards was all about what happened afterwards. But actually, if you go back and look at the fight, it was not a close fight. Habib says he, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't need the money. He doesn't need um, doesn't need the nonsense that comes with a Conor McGregor fight. So, you know, I think Conor's desperately chasing it. I think that's why he was out in Moscow today at that press conference, just trying to bait him, trying to tempt him into a fight on home soil um, uh, against against McGregor in Moscow. But you know, it's uh, Conor will need to win those two fights to get Habib again to have any chance of getting that fight again. I truly believe he'll have to win those first two back. Jim, the most fundamental question about Connor's comeback is why? Why now? What's changed? Why does he suddenly want to get back into a ring? I think he's probably getting bored. I think he's, um, over the last few 
uh, months at least. The UFC really does seem to have moved on. We're getting we're getting new stars like uh, Israel Adesanya, who's, who's the new middleweight champion. We're seeing Nate Diaz and Jorge Masvidal headlining a fight card in New York in what next week. And Conor McGregor is just somewhat falling into the background. All the nonsense that's happening outside of the ring, he's becoming what well, unbelievably you could almost say, the forgotten man of MMA. Like, no one perceives him as really a fighter anymore. And that isn't originally what he stood for. What he stood for was a man that was on a mission to become uh, the most successful UFC fighter of all time. And what's happened is he's become regarded as almost a joke, really. He, He never defended the UFC title. He then went and had a boxing match with Floyd Mayweather, which was lucrative, yet uh, somewhat of a disaster when it actually happened. His his legacy at the moment isn't what it should be. Mm, Well, isn't it nice to have him back? Jim, great to speak to you. Thank you for your time. Jim Edwards there, who's an MMA expert and writer for Fighters Only magazine. Johnny, what is your opinion? What what does it make you feel, MMA? What's, What's your take on that particular sport? I think it is understandable why people like it. I personally find it compelling as a sport but distressing to watch Mm. because it is not very many degrees removed from a beating yeah beating the life out of each other in a bar let's be Mm. quite honest which seems to be why conor mcgregor sometimes leans towards the other scenario as well the only rule is there are no rules yeah that sort of one of the rules i think uh, (laughs) it's uh, have you been watching fight club again guy we've talked about this uh, sorry Sorry. Immediately chuck him uh, out of it. Dump it. Rubbish. Dump it. Uh, I think... <laughs> Just ruin it. The, the two rules are no, no eye, fish no hooking, no eye gouging. gouging, and no testicular action. Aren't those the two? <laughs> Excuse me. I think we better move on to a bit of a Europa League update before Johnny gets too carried away talking about <laughs> MMA. Uh, yeah, score updates for you. Those two English teams in action. Man United currently 0-0 and Wolves 1-0 down in Bratislava. A little bit more info and detail on those games for you. Uh, Br- Slovan Bratislava took the lead on 11 minutes through Andras Spora. Uh, Slovan had only five goals in 12 Europe. Europa League games before this season they had six in two before tonight though and now they have seven and uh, some people are saying they're observing if you like they're watching with the sound turned right up a higher pitch noise coming from the stands as you might expect given there are 20,000 children in there mm. to circumvent the stadium ban like uh, a school sports day yeah a bit like a school, school sports day but with a slightly higher quality of sport on display <laughs> than mine which has strong memories of the sack race yes not won by Jose Mourinho on that occasion and an egg and spoon race so there we go did you I, win? Uh, no, no. <laughs> never won anything obviously uh, Man United 0-0 too some... deep into that game <laughs> it's alright mate it's fine <laughs> uh, not now um, <laughs> toilet roll's been thrown onto the pitch in Man United's game in Belgrade I don't know if that is symbolic from a fan who's disgruntled <laughs> or if they He's came channeled all that way to do that <laughs> over prepared or what I, I don't know but toilet roll was thrown onto it it is 0-0 after half an hour or so Man United was be- unbeaten in 13 Europa League games going back three years to November 2016, but Parsan are unbeaten at home in 11 games in Europe. Did you know that the team two, two teams met in the semi-finals of the 1965-66 European Cup? Obs. And Parsan Belgrade won it, of course. What scoreline, David, on aggregate? 3-2. 2-1. 2-1, correct. Oh, yeah. oh, you two ganging up on me. A real football expert. Yeah. Yes, Scott Bertone's <laughs> had a good chance from a Juan Mata free kick, but headed it straight at the keeper, unfortunately, for United. They have had 73% possession, though, in the first 25 minutes. So United on top, but failing to make their dominance count as it stands. Interestingly, signings from four different Man United managers are on show tonight, but none of them are Jose Mourinho signings. Do United need a clear out with that in mind? Well, I think the squad needs additions. I think it needs a clear out as well. Yeah, but the point is that it's difficult to have a clear out when no one wants your players. It's like <laughs> taking your stuff down a car boot sale and standing there for four hours and going away, taking the same lot home. Who wants Phil Jones or Marcus Rojo? We couldn't give Marcus Rojo away in the summer. Likewise, probably with Phil Jones. I don't think a lot of people are particularly keen on someone like Nemanja Matic at the age of 31 and slower than a tree in Willie Morgan's garden, as he's told us here on Love Sport. So it's a bit of a... Yeah, it's a difficult one when you've got a load of undesirable goods. It is, and it's not only the, the actual play in, playing side of it that you're categorising these players, but the wages that they'll be getting of at course. Manchester United gets bumped up through the ceiling and then the drop down, be it from 150 grand a week to 100 grand a week, having to slum it on that type of pittance. <laughs>
um, you can understand from a player's point of view that's that's why the fingers point oh they're just sat there taking the money it's a lot of money to just say alright I'll go somewhere to play football yeah exactly and you can't kind of completely blame a player for doing it if you haven't been oh, in that situation fault. yourself it's fault. it is completely the club's fault I mean why they need to give David De Gea for example 375 grand a week as we've said many times there weren't teams queuing up for David De Gea mm. and there they are giving him the biggest contract ever given to a goalkeeper when he's just gone through the worst six months of his career it's I the mean, most, it's the most backward facing game of poker ever isn't it <laughs> you know he's got nothing at all and you go oh, oh all in yeah perfect just in case <laughs> oh damn he had nothing all along Sergio Romero of course playing tonight but David De Gea still very much the number one the Paz Ampel grade fans sound like a load of charmers by the way if you didn't know much about them before they uh, call themselves the Grobari which is actually uh, Belgr- uh, Serbian for grave diggers charming and uh, they have one English language banner that says pray for an exorcism Right. Charmers. Quite, quite nice, I think, in Belgrade for any Man United fans who have made the trip. Yeah. one. That's one... just the children, by the way, in Belgrade as well. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, no, no, it's not really. Don't worry. They are the ultras. <laughs> I do find that kind of ultra ring, if you like, quite quite bizarre. Don't make that face. I've, I've coined a term. Yeah, fine, go on. We've seen it with the Curva Nord at Inter Milan addressing a letter to Romelu Lukaku attempting to explain racism to a black man. Utterly ridiculous. I'm all for passionate football support. Mm. I really am. And I'm all for taking it, not to the nth degree, but to as far as we can go within the realms of lawfulness and civility. Reading between the lines, an exorcism is not a particularly charming thing to call for. Should we be allowing banners of that kind in Stadia? What, the delving and dealing pure fantasy? Well, yeah, quite. But is it fantasy? When you're talking about an exorcism, you're not talking about getting rid of ghosts, are you? Let's be yeah, honest. But, but it's not a real thing, so... Okay. I th- the point I'm making is I think the exorcism, they're not talking about spirits. They're probably talking about people they're not keen on. Right, okay. And therefore... It's it's an unpleasant thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, it's like saying, if you, there was a banner saying, we don't let you go home, to an away set of supporters, that's not overly know. offensive, is it? I think it might be a bit more extreme than that. Coming up, we're going to find out what delights Love Sport Radio have got for you from Seven. This is Love Sport. Think the energy price cap will save you money? Think again. You could be saving a lot more on cheaper energy tariffs. Price comparison site a spokesman said will show you just how much money you could be saving against your current tariff. Don't throw away your hard-earned money to the energy companies. Check out a spokesman said.com and you could switch to cheaper bills in minutes. The spokesman said.com fighting for you, saving you money. The Novotel London Blackfriars, the official hotel partner of Love Sport. Located just minutes away from the city and London's famous South Bank, you can kick back and taste the flavours of the world at the Jamboree Bar and Grill and enjoy all the sights of London in style. The Novotel London Blackfriars. You all right, mate? Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah? Mm, Really? It's just there's a massive grizzly bear sitting on you. You sure you're okay? Well, now that you mention it... Sometimes we say we're fine when we're not, but with one in four experiencing a mental health problem, if your mate says he's fine, he might not be. Be in your mate's corner and ask twice. Time to change. Hello, my name's Paula. I'm from the Shropshire area and I'm a business development manager. I use a spokesman said for my car insurance where I've saved over £500 and also on travel insurance as well. Um, So in total, uh, me and my family have saved about £600. I would definitely use it again and I would definitely recommend it. With a spokesman said.com, fighting for you, saving you money. Get ready for Brexit on the 31st of October. This means that travelling to the EU will change. You'll need to check online if your passport is valid for travel to Europe. If you're planning on driving, you'll need to check if you have the right documents to drive and make sure your travel insurance covers all your healthcare needs. To keep your trip on track, check what you need to do at gov.uk slash Brexit. Get ready for Brexit on the 31st of October. There are many things a mother can pass on to her baby. Her smile, her eye colour, and her immunity to whooping cough. Whooping cough is a very dangerous illness for young babies, and at the moment it's spreading fast. A simple vaccination during your pregnancy 
can help to protect your baby in their first weeks. Please speak to your GP, nurse, or healthcare professional and pass on your immunity. Love sports. It's the Posh Boys on Love Sport Drive. That's me, Johnny Burrow, Guy Watts, and David Prutton, who's just pulled out a really quite impressive Liam Gallagher impression. We're not going to treat <laughs> you to that, unfortunately. Wow. But Guy Watts is going to treat you to all the latest sporting headlines and weather. I said maybe. <laughs> I don't really want to know. Liam Williams has been ruled out of Wales' Rugby World Cup semi-final against South Africa on Sunday. The Lions fullback suffered an ankle injury in training yesterday. Uh, Lee Halfpenny is now likely to replace him. He's got 84 caps, of course, and has played for the Lions himself. Not the worst replacement in the world. The evening's football is underway with three British sides on the road in the Europa League. Manchester United have handed a first start to 18-year-old James Garner for their game at Partizan Belgrade. Wolves are playing Slovan Bratislava in front of a stadium full of school kids who were given free uh, free tickets so that the Slovakian club could avoid playing the game behind closed doors. Rangers are taking on Portuguese giants Porto. Currently, Rangers and Man United's games are goalless, but Wolves are trading 1-0 in Slovakia. Later on, Arsenal entertain Vitoria and Celtic welcome Lazio to Glasgow. And Watford boss Kike Sanchez-Flores says Danny Welbeck will be out for months rather than weeks. The striker pulled up early in their Premier League game with Tottenham, clutching the back of his leg. Johnny's got Arsenal team news for you, for you in just a moment. But first, your weather tonight, northern and western parts of the UK will have some showers with more persistent rain in the southwest later. Mainly dry and clear elsewhere, uh, windy in the far north, cold and frosty as well up there. In the north on Friday, persistent and often heavy rain pushing north across a lot of England and Wales, possibly affecting parts of southern Scotland and Northern Ireland as well, looking at highs of 16 degrees or so. In the UK tomorrow, Johnny, back to you with Arsenal team news. Yeah, we've got the team news coming through now. A quick note on a former Arsenal player. Terrible news for Danny Welbeck. The poor boy mm. has absolutely no luck whatsoever. The Arsenal 11 for tonight looks very promising, though. Emiliano Martinez in net. A back four of Bayerin, Mustafi, Holding and Tierney. A midfield three of Torreira, Willock and Maitland-Niles. Two of the three, of course, Arsenal youth products. And a front three of Emil Smith-Rowe. Back from injury, the danger man in the Europa League, at least Gabriel Martinelli. And it's a first return from injury for Alexander Lacazette. Great to see him back in the side from an Arsenal point of view. But it's a frustrating Arsenal team as well from an Arsenal fan's point of view because he's playing Bayer in and Tierney in this game. But not on Monday against Sheffield United. But not on Monday against Sheffield United, exactly. And you just think, Unai, where is the logic? Is that leaning towards getting them back up to full match fitness, you feel? Possibly, but if they're fit enough to start today, they must have been in the frame for Monday night. Yes. We saw Tierney on the bench. To me it makes more sense to privilege a tough Premier League fixture than a relatively straightforward Europa League outfit. And I just cannot understand where Unai Emery is coming from. There's nothing about that statement, Johnny, that I can disagree with. I think you're absolutely right. The finger that was pointed at Arsenal on Monday, which was uh, vehemently uh, responded to by Granit Xhaka about the team being seen and perceived in a certain way, was so stereotypically Arsenal, what Arsenal have become, soft away from home, um, a team that is fighting for uh, Premier League survival first and foremost, Sheffield United knew exactly how to go about it. Yes, huge slice of luck with regard to a potential penalty appeal with uh, Socrates in the first half, but they did the homework, they applied themselves, they worked harder than the opposition, they were more tenacious than the opposition, they came away with the world deserved three points, and in a game such as this, um, it doesn't do Unai Emery any favours when the fans are questioning or a portion of the fans are questioning what they're seeing uh, from a team selection from a performance point of view and also with regard to the output of the side in both the league and in Europe and, and where they think they're going to end up. I, I think there's a presumption that their football will uh, will out and they'll end up uh, in a position where they can pat themselves on the back. But I, I just I can't say it. it's tough. It goes back to the what we, what we spoke about in the opening 15 minutes of the show earlier on. Chelsea have become a, a quite a likeable team. Arsenal have gone from being cosmopolitan powerhouses that were so easy on the eye yet so brutal to play against to now being a team that there's a collective shrug of the shoulders of, well, that's what Arsenal do. And just as Spurs were deemed Spursy, and that was seen as a put-down, I, I was going to say Arsenal could seem quite arsy, but that doesn't fit. Does <laughs> well, in a sense, <laughs> as an Arsenal fan, I do not see the point of Unai Emery. No. I genuinely don't. I'm not saying he's not a good manager. He clearly is. Mm. He's got the record and he's got the pedigree. 
But it is team selections like tonight in relation to Mondays where you think, what's your plan, mate? What is your plan? What is your vision for this team? There is no coherence from game to game in who he's picking or why. There is no... I can't see what the end goal is. Oli Gunnar Solskjaer talks about a three-year plan. And OK, it's not clicking at the moment, but credit where it's due. When I watch United play week on week, I see the rationale, I see the logic, and I can at least imagine what the end goal is. I do not know what Unai Emery is trying to do with this Arsenal team. And most concerningly, I don't think he does either. So what is the point in him being there? That's a very good argument to have. I think the fact that Arson left after, after such a long period of time. Then you bring a manager in um, with uh, experience of the likes of Valencia, Sevilla, um, Paris Saint-Germain, meant probably that you're looking at a manager that would hopefully be able to handle a statue of a big club. It's certainly a, a huge club in English football. Uh, you look at what Chelsea have done in Europe, you look at Man United, what they've done in Europe, what Liverpool have done in Europe. So the argument there is that their, their reach... Um, stretches a little bit further than Arsenal's probably does. But from Arsenal's point of view of where they wanted to go next after Arsene Wenger, we're now in a position where the game on Monday is an example of people going, yes, there's been a change of manager, yes, there's been a change of personnel, but it's still, in essence, doing the same thing that it did at the very end of Arsene Wenger being there. And that's even more frustrating. It's almost like they've wasted time in the interim. Yeah, they have wasted time, but they've done more than that. They've also wasted the relationship they had and the legacy of Arsene Wenger. Mm. Because if you look at the record that Arsene Wenger had in the last 47 games at Arsenal Mm. in relation to Unai's first 47, they're pretty much identical, except Wenger's won a few more, he scored a few more and conceded a few less. He did better. Mm. And this was when Arsene Wenger had supposedly completely lost the plot. And was getting dogs, wasn't he? And was getting dogs Mm. abused. And Speaking as an Arsenal fan who always liked Arsene Wenger, who never called for his head, this all feels like such a shame because we've done all of that. We have lambasted a man who gave these arrogant, self-righteous fans everything that they now feel entitled to. And for what? Mm. For a bloke to come in to do a sort of bad Arsene Wenger tribute hat. It's It's like a poor pastiche, isn't it, with players that you probably care a little bit less about. Um, which again is a dam- damning reflection on where they find themselves, uh, and the fact that uh, under Arsene's reign, the the um, the mere sight of an FA Cup win was seen as Ugh, yeah, but it's only the FA Cup, well rubbish. And then you look at the abject surrender of what the Europa League final was against Chelsea. That was shocking to see, and uh, not only because of what it showed. Um, the distance travelled on the pit or, uh, between Arsene Wenger and Unai Emery wasn't very far, but the distance travelled for the fans actually turned up to see a team phone in a display was thousands of miles, and it just got to show disparity between where the club is at and where the fans are at. There's been a goal in Partizan Belgrade versus Manchester United, but which way has it gone, Guy Watts? <laughs> it's gone Man United's way. Hey. Johnny Anthony Martial has scored from the spot. Brandon Williams, the youngster, who's looked pretty fearless, I have to say, just 19 years old. He burst into the box, was caught by Nemanja Militic. Definite penalty. No VAR, of course, in Europa League. When the referee blows his whistle, it really does mean penalty. And Anthony Martial steps up. He sends him the wrong way. A very decent penalty, calm and composed, as you would expect from the man who seems to have almost no emotion at all. Man United 1, Partizan Belgrade 0 in Serbia. Of course, Wolves are trailing, though. They're 1-0 down to Slovan Bratislava. That's a very good... Was that Martial that you made that point about? Yeah. <laughs> That's a very good point. Well, I've no, never no noticed emotion. that before, but now you say <laughs> but, it. I, and I can picture the exact face that you're talking about, which is the one that he makes all the time. <laughs> yeah, it's his one expression. It's, it's almost blank. I mean, it's it's not blank. That's unfair. I think it's more uninterested than blank, isn't it? It's sort of, is that all you've got to the world yeah, the whole I, time? I That's think it. his ex-partner would suggest that was the view he took of his relationship at points as well, yeah, if very we're being possibly. honest. You remember he scored that goal against Liverpool on his debut, aged 18, I think, possibly 19. Was it right in the dying seconds as dying well? Dying seconds. Yeah. I mean, Weaving down the left-hand side of the pitch. It was a brilliant goal. Absolutely brilliant. That was the moment, I think, United fans all thought we found someone special. I think why, to this day, he retains, not just for that goal, but some of the things he did, even in that first season, a little bit more credit than he would for you know what he's done since, which hasn't been so good. But he barely... He, the whole of Manchester was going <laughs> wild. Old Trafford going nuts. Everyone at home. Martin Tyler was as well. Yeah, Martin, Martin Tyler, Tyler was the going more mad than anybody else. He still hasn't kind of quite calmed down. 
down from that, some people say. It was even bigger than Aguero. And yet, Anthony Martial was sort of looking like, yeah, scored a goal, guys. <laughs> what, I loved, Chill out. what I loved from Martin Tyler in that game is it was the same game where Christian Benteke scored an absolutely filthy bicycle yeah. kick. Yes. And his response to that goal was, it's a good strike from Benteke. And then Martial does that. He went ballistic. Not just he's a Man United fan. Not, not for no, a no, second. No. Um, quick, sorry. I was just going to do a quick around Europe. Of course, half-time whistles starting to go in the early kickoffs. You've had AZ Alkmaar, who are in Man United's group, of course, as well. They've doubled their lead against Astana. Rangers have equalised through Alfredo Morelos, who we talked about a lot earlier, of course. That's away at Porto. That would be a very, very good result for Rangers if they could come away from there with something. Braga have just taken the lead away at Besiktas. That's through forward Ricardo Horta. They're in Wolves' group, of course, as well. So that's uh, a bit of a roundup of what's going on in Europe. Johnny's just giving you your answer. Arsenal team news. They kick off at eight, as do Celtic. Of course, we'll have Charlie Hawkins in next, won't we, to chat a bit about the fan shows. An actor, a journalist, and a comedian walk into a bar, and they're all whining about Donald Trump. Love Sport Radio, the station giving fans a voice. You all right, mate? Yeah, I'm fine. Yeah? Mm, really? It's just, there's a massive grizzly bear sitting on you. You sure you're okay? Well, now that you mention it, Sometimes we say we're fine when we're not, but with one in four experiencing a mental health problem, if your mate says he's fine, he might not be. Be in your mate's corner and ask twice. Time to change. You're in leakage, you're in leakage. You're in leakage, you're in leakage. You're in leakage. You're in leakage, you're in leakage. Henna, men. Cage. Pants and pads. You're discreet, me. masculine, You're secure right. absorption zone. Buy online or in shops. You're Ten a man. Keep control. You're in? No. Stop paying too much for your energy bills. Brian saved money on his at a spokesman said.com. Can you? I'm Brian from Swaddling Coat, South Derbyshire. And I saved about £400 on my energy bill with a spokesman set. The iSpokesman said website was very easy to use. And the money I saved, I put towards a holiday. Compare home energy quotes from the UK's biggest suppliers in just a matter of minutes. With a spokesman said.com. Fighting for you. Saving you money. Get ready for Brexit on the 31st of October. Find out what you need to do to prepare at gov.uk slash Brexit. <coughs> Oh, it's okay. <laughs> Let's face it, when your kids are ill, you do anything to help them feel better. But remember, antibiotics aren't always needed. You might not realise it, but taking antibiotics when you don't need them puts you and your family at risk of a longer and more severe illness. Help keep your family well. Always take your doctor's advice on antibiotics. Search NHS Antibiotics. <laughs> All better. This is love sport. David Prutton is buzzing because Charlie Hawkins is in the building. He's going to be carrying you forward from seven o'clock, both for the love sport fan shows and, of course, with updates from across tonight's Europa League action. Charlie, what are you offering up to the broadcasting gods this evening? Finally, a positive Spurs show because they won oh, Tuesday 5-0. The change. confidence is back. I'm not sure. Do you believe that actually because Vertonghen has already said the confidence is free flowing in the team now. It is back. We are back to 100%. It's ama amazing what one result does, doesn't it? It's it's frightening really. Just goes, out, goes to show how simple footballers are. Well, this is it. Yeah, because I'm not sure if I believe it. I mean, we expected them to win that game. We know their home form's okay. It's the away form. Haven't won away in the league since January. Now they go to Liverpool away than Everton away. I'm, I'm not sure if the, the positive theme, Johnny, will continue. Well, that'll be good. That will be good. <laughs> Has it actually turned the mood at the club? Do we think it can be a catalyst for a genuine improvement in form? Well, that'll be the test, won't it, at the weekend. It's a hell of a game to play off the back of uh, a decent result, good, a good amount of goals scored. So, um, it's it's a it's a funny situation they found themselves in. Tricky for the manager, but if he's got any uh, designs on being classed as one of the very best in the world, then you've got to come through periods such as this. You've got to find a different way to um, make the wheel turn, and we'll soon see whether it's it's a it's a blip on a bleak landscape or it's, it's the beginning of something pretty decent. Yeah, I completely agree. And I tell you, one way to make the headlines go away: you haven't won away in the league since January. Go and beat Liverpool, who are top of the league. Go and win at Anfield. All the problems, all the stories, the behind the scenes, and go away mm -hmm. Spurs are back in the hunt 
And after that, 9 till 10, the Charlton fan show. <laughs> Disappointing defeat. Disappointing defeat, but they're still riding high. They smashed Derby on the weekend 3-0. Uh -huh. Connor Gallagher looks absolutely amazing. We had Macaulay Bon on the show three weeks back. He scored in every game since. Is there a correlation? Of course, I've put in a word, so there was some <laughs> magic there. But, you know, they're on a really good run, and they're really disappointed about last night. They went 1-0 up against City. They did lose the game 2-1. They scored in the 98th minute Bristol Ridiculous. City. Six minutes of time added on. Went down to 10 men as well, weren't they, Bristol City? They went down to 10 men, and that was a... Yeah, it was... A lot of handbags in the game. There was a lot of handbags after the game. I think Cholton, when you go anytime you go 1-0 up in a football game, not to come away with a point against a good Bristol City side, I think they're going to really be feeling the hurt from that one for maybe a little while. Especially after, the, as you say, wonderful result and a well-earned result. It wasn't a fluky 3-0, was it, against Derby? They played well. They showed them exactly how championship football can be played and maybe that was a kick at the backside that Derby needed after they went on to win last night yeah completely from 10 o'clock as ever it is the David Pratt and Derby we've got <laughs> Southampton from 10 o'clock yeah we have and and this one actually we talk about Spurs being negative I'm sensing from doing the Southampton fan show every week the mood is really it's changing now. Yes, yeah, really mm. shifting to, you know, it's early on. We've played seven, eight games. You know, we'll start to pick up a few points. And they did get a brilliant point on the weekend because VAR was right. And hopefully that can kickstart it. But the form, David, at St. Mary's at home has been absolutely shocking. They're in action tomorrow night against Leicester City. And the word from them is that they fear they are now in. Whether it's October, they fear they're in a relegation well, battle. Well, year on year, I heard Jason Dodd's comments on this. That year mm. on year, they are going to be there. That's the first point call consolidation so the chat a couple of weeks ago when they were coming up against Bournemouth of two teams uh, maybe making a dent in the top seven or eight was is ridiculous uh, they've got a really tough game against Leicester they have flattered to deceive earlier on at home they're now just at this moment in time not entertaining at home so th something's got to change tomorrow but I mean it's one other uh, of a team to play who are flying high can they go second is it Leicester if they win tomorrow night before yeah. the weekend's fixtures so it just goes to show that it'll be it'll be no mean feat if they manage to do if they manage to get something from that game yeah I think the doubt starts to creep in though especially at home playing Friday night they only pl you mentioned they only played a couple of weeks ago on a, a Friday night game against Bournemouth they got played absolutely yeah, off the park 3-1 no there yeah mm. so if they don't get in tomorrow now they've got time to linger over this game then they go back to back against Man City both games are away as well and then from half past 10, it's free-falling Nottingham Forest. <laughs> Two losses on the spin for Sabri Lamucci. Are the wheels coming off? No, it's not free falling. It's the it's the championship. It's anyone's. Let's not forget uh, Leeds drew this week. West Brom drew. They were two nil up, uh, two nil down against Barnsley. Bottom of the table, Barnsley. West Brom are at the top. This is anyone's league. Swansea lost at home three nil to mm. Brentford. I, I mean, I hate to repeat myself every week when we're talking about the championship fan shows, but this is anyone's league in the championship. No one's really staking a claim. We're talking about your West Brom, Swansea, Leeds, Forest. Well, yet they're not there. And Cholton won on the weekend. I just don't know who the next contender is to emerge from the pack. I wouldn't be that worried if, if I was Forest. Again, last night's game, they did go 2-0 down. And then Hull went down to 10 men. So you could have argued that they had enough time to at least uh, um, salvage a point. They Huge couldn't do. shout for a penalty as well, wasn't there? Sammy Obi getting dragged to the ground. Massive. But David, they had so many chances did, to score. Same and, as uh, Sunday. Yeah. Played. This is the problem, isn't it? I think they're creating the chances, but they haven't got that clinical, clinical, you know, uh, goal scorer in front mm. of goal, especially from the mid midfield. Ben Watson's uh, helping out a little bit, but they need more than that. They do. If there's any uh, inclination that they are going to make a dent at the very top of the league come the end of the season, then they do need something needs to change. Lewis Graben didn't start the weekend. Very surprised. I don't mm. know why. Started last night. Um, and he's a player that you can normally hang your hat on to get a goal, but it was Matty Cash, wasn't it, marauding from right back that managed to, to score the goal. So I think they're, they're probably, and this is me not dialing down expectations before, is they're happy to be in the conversation with the teams that could make the top six. I think they would be pleasantly surprised that they actually are because of, look at the squad compared to other squads in the division, such a huge kind of fulcrum of British players that they've got. Uh, and they all seem to be singing to the same tune of what Lamouche is setting but I mean a couple of defeats isn't the worst thing in the world but it, it maybe a bit of a of a redress in the sights that they've got well Charlie we're all going to be singing to your tune from seven o'clock looking forward to those fan shows we'll be tuning in on our way home as we always do David Prutton, it's a birthday or oh, a lovely high five. Decent connection, six <laughs> out of ten connection. Not a, not a classic palm on palm. There's more fingers than anything. Not, not a world class palm on palm. There's time. There's time to develop, but it's a birthday today. It's a very significant birthday. A certain Mr. Wayne Rooney.
34 today. Really? What are your finest memories of Waza? Of Waza. Uh, the overhead kick yep. in the derby. The goal, the volley against Newcastle where he's arguing with the referee. And he was about to be subbed off with and a it, strained groin. Or... And it bounced out and he just smashed it into the top corner. Um, the first goal against Arsenal? Yes. That's a filter. Uh, over, was it Seaman? Was a goal, wasn't it? Yeah. A filter. A filter. Technical term. Wow, Seaman as well. Just made it up. <laughs> a filter over Seaman. Blimey, steady on, fellas. It's only five to seven. Uh, yeah, well, I don't want to keep going on about it, but Johnny, the time you weren't here, we sat here. <laughs> Remember again that right, time you were here? I'm going home. You've got two minutes left. Do it yourselves. <laughs> no, Johnny, this is good. I promise you. I sat where you're sitting, and it took until something like half past six for it to emerge that it was David Prutton's birthday. That's weird. I hate people who do this. Oh, David. I'm just so not fussed about it. I'm just no, not going to no, mention I'm it. No, I'm not having this. You have to. You have a duty when you enter any room to go, lads, it's my birthday. Get, Get on it with out the, there. Everyone's Get going, on with happy the... Happy birthday, mate. Yes. Thank you very much. Let's crack and on. And obviously, when it's a footballer or a sports person whose birthday is, you do, yeah, as yeah. we just done with Wayne Rooney, your favourite memory. So we did favourite memory of David Prutton. That and we moved what, on five seconds, seconds later. <laughs> oh, yeah, then we, we did the news instead. Yeah, we did we the same Brett's school of comedy. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I think we did go for Brett's over favourite memories of David Prutton that day. There was the red card there was. against, uh, well, loads of them. Yes. Do you, you have a favourite, favourite red, red card? card? Uh, there was one against Sheffield United when I was at Forest that I got sent off quite early on in the game. And a teammate of mine got sent off in the first half also. So he came jogging in. It was like, we had to get our story straight for when the manager came in. I went straight in with, I had to smash him, Gaffer, because it was either him or me. And he sat me down and said, that's utterly ridiculous. Your mum has broken the lad's leg. All right, I'll show up. And then went for my mate who had a similar kind of... Um, who was the manager at the time? It was Paul Hart. Okay. And it was Jack Lester that came. I, I remember being sat in the dressing room and then heard some studs coming down the corridor. I think it's that's a bit early for our town. He comes jogging in and went, me too. <laughs> you were, Paul Hart's quite scary as well. Oh, um, he, he's... He was uh, he was uh, the cornerstone of what my football career came to be because I met him at the right time and he was wonderful with a, a group of players that he managed to get through and become professionals. But terrifying and empathetic in equal measures. That's you weren't watching the game in the changing room. You had no idea that someone else just got sent off. No, but you can't. This was Nottingham Forest was around the turn of the millennium. We didn't even we didn't have a TV in there. You just sit there, kind of ghetto blast, he- head in hands, feeling annoyed with yourself. Sometimes it depends. Sometimes you had a more emotional reaction to others. Other times there was a slightly comical part of what had happened and gone down. But obviously, as soon as the the manager comes in, you've got to stony face, take whatever's going to get thrown your way, which is normally a barrel barrel load of uh, abuse. Well, it's a serious business. It hasn't been too serious <laughs> this afternoon. A pleasure as ever to spend four hours in your electric company. David Prutton, thank you. Guy Watts, thank you. Stay with us on Love Sport Radio. It's a Spurs fan show from seven. And the Posh Boys are back from three tomorrow with you and Thomas. Love Sport. Get ready for Brexit on the 31st of October. Brexit will bring changes that affect businesses in many ways particularly if you buy from EU suppliers, sell to EU customers, provide services to EU clients, and receive customer data from other businesses in the EU. Businesses need to prepare. Find out how at gov.uk slash Brexit. Get ready for Brexit on the 31st of October. It's cancer, they said. My first thought? Let's just say it wasn't money. But time off work for treatment and trips to the hospital... Paying the mortgage. And, and, and. The cost of living doesn't go away just because you're living with cancer. And Macmillan can help with that too. My advice? Take their advice. Soon as. I did. Macmillan. Right there with you. Call now or search Macmillan Money Worries. Before you set off on a long journey, remember to check your vehicle. Are your tyres correctly inflated? And are the treads deep enough? Have you got enough fuel? Is your oil level right? Checking your vehicle doesn't take long, but can prevent a breakdown or accident and save you money. So, before you set off on a long journey, check your tyres, fuel and oil. Highways England, connecting the country. If you fall asleep at the wheel, you'll put your life in danger and the lives of others as well. Before you feel tired, pull off the road into a services or other safe area, drink some strong coffee, and take a quick nap while the caffeine kicks in. If you're having a nap, 
hope you've left your lights on, sir. Alright, cheers. Sink. Don't drive tired. Coming up next is the Spurs Fan Show, and I'll be joined by the last word on Spurs. And over the last few weeks, you may have thought that 